Royal Secrets, The Hidden Kingdom Romances, Book One. Written by Cami Chekets. Narrated by Andrea Coomer. Chapter One. Julia Adams stepped out into the lamplit street in front of the quaint cottage she was staying in and started into a jog. She could hear the waves past the thick hedge on her right. Hopefully, she could pop through the tropical wall and out onto the beach soon. It was 4 a.m. and still pitch black outside, but her internal clock was all messed up. She had spent over 24 hours in airplanes or airports, the last four in a puddle jumper with only her and the pilot, a handsome man named Trek who had an easy smile. After an effective argument on her part, he'd confessed the connections to the hidden island of Magna's royal family. The confession had made Julia even more excited to meet the elusive and supposedly beautiful people. Trek kept her entertained with stories of his and the second royal son's exploits. It sounded like Prince Bodhi Magnum had quite the inventive mind. At least the stories had kept her distracted as they flew over teal-colored ocean and she prayed the rattling, bouncing airplane would make it. She landed after dark. A beautiful young lady, Zara Lancelot, apparently the royal family's assistant, had been waiting for her. She had taken Julia straight to the cottage that was only a few minutes from the castle and the other royal residences. Julia had seen the towering castle lights, the steeples of a church, and some town lights, but it had been too late for a tour. She couldn't wait to witness the exquisite kingdom with her own eyes. Prince Bodhi Magnum had contacted her brother's marketing agency and asked for a top executive to help him create and market trips to the island of Magna, known to the world as the Hidden Kingdom because of how private and secluded it was. The prince already had ideas, such as a medieval jousting tournament and fair, beach and mountain exploration, and the charm of an entire country set in the past. Julia had begged until Justin had finally acquiesced and given her the job. Now she was here, and ready to explore despite the early hour. A run on the beach and a long shower, and she'd be ready to evaluate and advise Prince Bodhi. It was so magical here. She'd caught glimpses of the towering, well-lit castle and the old-fashioned lamps lighting the streets as the rickety plane had landed. Those same lamps now lit her way, but she really wanted to be on that beach. She could hear the waves rolling in now. Any minute now, she'd find an opening in the hedge. Would the sand be soft or hard-packed? A few pictures she'd found online that had leaked from the island showed lush mountain ranges, a gorgeous royal city, and farms and ranches scattered over the rest of the island. Julia increased her pace as the pounding of the waves on the sand grew louder and her excitement mounted. She finally found a break in the hedgerow and darted through it onto the dark beach. She was blinded for a second by the lack of lamplight on this side of the hedge. She ran smack into a wall, a moving wall, a wall of flesh and muscle. Oof! She gasped as she rebounded toward the ground. A hard body fell with her onto the sand. Warm, strong arms wrapped around her as the person rolled quickly and took the brunt of the impact. It was a matter of seconds before they settled in the sand. Julia was stunned, but she dimly realized she was cocooned in a man's arms. Her heart raced and her stomach gave a little lurch. Something about this man holding her was both stimulating and comforting. 
Are you all right? A cultured, smooth voice asked. Um, I think so. Did I take you out? The man chuckled easily. Julia's eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight, and she was gifted with the sight of a handsome face. All manly lines, with thick, dark brows and penetrating dark eyes. I think I may have taken you out. I saw a shadow dart out of the hedge, but I reacted too slowly. Forgive me. Sure. Julia tried to move, but he held her so tightly that she couldn't squirm free. Part of her didn't want to be free, but she didn't know this man and she shouldn't want to languish in his arms. Um, excuse me. Oh, forgive me again. He released his hold on her and jumped to his feet, bending to help her up. His hands remained on her elbows, tracing warmth through her flesh. He stared at her. You're an outsider? She backed up a step and his hands fell away. Losing his warm touch was regrettable, but she wondered about his tone. Did he not like outsiders? Was he going to take her up to the volcano and sacrifice her for not fitting in? Nobody knew much about Magna, but it was rumored that the Hidden Kingdom had some archaic traditions. She'd heard that the island's inhabitants were graced with olive skin and dark hair and eyes. Her red hair and blue eyes would definitely stand out. How'd you guess? She forced a bright tone and prayed he wasn't the druid guardian of the beach, intent on keeping outsiders from invading his peaceful island. She needed to stop reading fantasy books. A smile crinkled his cheeks, creating nice laugh lines around his eyes and mouth. I've never seen a redhead anywhere but on the television screen. Shelter life, eh? She tossed her long red ponytail. As a child, she'd hated the attention she received because of her coloring, but she didn't mind it now. It helped that her hair had darkened to a deep auburn over the years. What do you think? His eyes trailed over her and warmed her all the way through. It's beautiful, he murmured. May I? May you what? Touch your hair. She blinked at him. I don't think we're that friendly, she said. Though a large part of her longed to give him permission to touch her hair, her hand, or maybe wrap her up in his arms again. Her eyes had fully adjusted now and she liked the lean lines of his arms revealed in his short-sleeved shirt. He chuckled and said, Forgive me. What brings you to Magna, Miss Red? She arched an eyebrow. Something in his eyes said he knew exactly who she was and why she was here, but he obviously wanted to tease her. You've never met an outside before, eh? Not one as beautiful as you. She wanted to accept his compliment, but his nickname from before still stung. Well, here's a tip. Us outsiders don't like being made fun of for the color of our hair. He gave her an alluring smirk that made her lean closer without intending to. Even though we are not that friendly, I should explain that I wasn't making fun of you, but giving a compliment. You are undoubtedly the most beautiful and exotic woman I've ever seen. Her dark red hair garnered attention in America, but nobody had ever said she was beautiful and exotic. She wanted to giggle like a teenager, but instead she said, Nope, sorry. We are not friendly enough for you to give me an empty compliment. She flipped her hair over her shoulder and jogged around him and along the sandy beach. It was soft sand and slow going. 
he caught up with her easily. I hope I have the chance to become friendly with you on your visit to our beautiful island. She couldn't place his smooth accent, probably because she'd never heard it before. But she loved the way he talked. Is this your personal island? She asked, trying to discern his expression in the dim light. But it was harder now that they were moving. He smiled, but his answer gave nothing away. All magnites feel this is their personal island. We're very proud of our beautiful country and our heritage. I see. And what are you doing jogging so early in the morning? Patrolling for red-headed intruders. She stared at him, hit a rock with her foot. And would have gone down if he hadn't reached out to steady her. His touch brought fire to her arm, and she wasn't sure she was ready to be attracted to some local who was either teasing her or was a military sentinel of some sort. Gently tugging her arm free, she walked instead of trying to run in the thick sand. He slowed to keep pace with her. "You're teasing me." She decided, "You don't actually patrol for intruders." I am teasing you," he admitted. "We have military boats who patrol for intruders. The closest island is a hundred and eighty-two miles away, so it's rare we get curious teenagers coming by." Why are magnites so private? She asked. Some lights appeared to their left on the beach. Another small cottage with warm light spilling from the windows. Magna used to be one of the wealthiest nations in the world because of the gold mined for hundreds of years from our mountains. In years past, we had to fight hard to protect our wealth and our people's independence and privacy. The gold has been gone for over twenty years now. We are still a fiercely proud people. But we lack the currency or military power to back it up. We have very little to trade because of our isolation and lack of shipping ability. But we are mostly self-sufficient due to our mild climate and hard-working people. That might be why I'm here, she mused. She'd had no idea Magna might be in financial trouble. Prince Bodhi asked me to come. Her voice trailed off as he glanced sharply at her, and she realized the prince might not appreciate her spilling her purpose or ideas to some handsome guy on the beach. Prince Bodhi asked you to come, he prompted. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say. He gave her a light smile. We are not that friendly, eh? She laughed. Grateful, he seemed so easygoing. She probably should have been more leery on the beach alone in the pre-dawn hours, but this well-built man seemed protective, intriguing, and well-mannered. No, we are not. They walked in silence for a few steps, and she saw some faint pinpricks of light up on a mountain peak. She couldn't wait for the sun to rise. Maybe she could get a tour of the island before her real work began. Do you know Prince Bodhi? Very well. His voice was confident. He didn't seem intimidated by the prince at all. Was he military? Truly patrolling for intruders? Maybe he reported straight to the prince and would inform him that his new marketing associate was loose-lipped. What's he like? Trek had given her all kinds of stories and insight, but he was the prince's closest friend, in his words, so his opinion might be skewed. She'd like to hear from another local what the second royal son was like. He's incredible, kind, hardworking, smart, charming, handsome. He glanced askance at her. His eyes dancing with humor. 
Are you sure you didn't just describe yourself? She deadpanned. He roared at that. I suppose all those characteristics could apply to me as well. He sobered. Truthfully, Bodie's a good man and a good friend. I think you'll enjoy working with him on whatever you're doing. Thank you. I'd better get my run in and get ready for the day. Is this where you're intoning I should run back the other direction? She didn't want him to, but it wasn't smart to encourage him. He was attractive and appealing, but she wasn't here to meet a man. She was here to work, and maybe help this country more than she'd imagined. She loved the idea of rescuing them from financial doom. Julia Adams riding up on her white steed, saving the kingdom and the handsome prince. She smiled to herself. Just being on this incredible island made her imagine she was in a fairy tale. Does that smile mean you don't want me to run away? I like to run alone, she insisted. Though truthfully, she would like more time with this handsome, intriguing man. The island was small enough that she was sure to see him again. I know when it's time to make an exit. He saluted her and turned the other direction. Goodbye, Miss Red. It was a pleasure meeting your beautiful self this beautiful morning. She turned and faced him instead of jogging away as she should. The pleasure was all mine, O、oh、Druid Guardian of the Beach, or what should I call you? Druid Guardian of the Beach is fine, but my friends call me P B. Peanut butter? He chuckled. Yes, ma'am. Do you like peanut butter? It depends if it's creamy or chunky. His smile deepened those laugh lines that she liked. Definitely creamy. I'm smooth and charming and definitely creamy. Her stomach somersaulted again. She wished the sun was up so she could see exactly how deep brown those eyes were. Too bad, I prefer chunky. She whirled and ran down the beach as his laughter floated in the air behind her. She smiled to herself. She wouldn't soon forget their conversations. What a warm and intriguing welcome to the country of Magna. She hoped she'd see P. B. again. Chapter Two. Prince Bodie Magnum paced in one of the castle's smaller meeting rooms. It was seven fifty-nine a.m., and his meeting with Miss Julia Adams was scheduled for eight. The redhead he'd run into on the beach would be in for a surprise when she met him again. Miss Red, or rather Adams. Had seemed excited for their meeting. He prayed she was the start to an answer to their financial woes, the start to allowing tourists onto their island and changing their way of life. His father and uncle Zoltan wouldn't like it, and some of the islanders might resist, especially the extremists who lived in the mountain villages. He shuddered to think how they'd react. His cousin Kingston, who ran the military, wouldn't appreciate Bodie starting an uprising, but most of the islanders were reasonable and wanted progress. They knew the island had to go forward and stop living in the past. They also needed medicine, vaccines, eyeglasses, and many technological advances they couldn't import without hard currency. Not to mention the fact that their educational system was falling behind. His brother Quinn supported his ideas. That was enough for Bodie to take the plunge. His mind drifted back to the redhead he'd collided with on his early morning run. The woman had been beautiful and soft yet strong when he held her in his arms. He liked her teasing, slightly sarcastic personality. He could spend a lot more time teasing with her. 
he'd never felt such an instant connection and attraction to a woman. He was slated to marry Dr. Grace Johansson, a family friend and the island's doctor who had recently returned from medical school in America. Arranged marriages had been retired as an archaic tradition almost 50 years ago, but the royal family still had certain expectations to meet. They were expected to marry someone who was well-educated and definitely not an outsider. Bodhi liked Grace. They were good friends. But he'd never felt fire course through his abdomen from simply touching her or the insatiable desire to be around her and see what she would say next. He needed to stop worrying about his romantic notions toward the intriguing redhead and focus on why Quinn had given him approval to invite Miss Adams to the island without their father or uncle's approval. The kingdom was in trouble. The world was shrinking and expanding at the same time, and Magna was falling further behind. The door swung open. Bodhi started forward with a grin on his face, hand outstretched, ready to meet Miss Red and tease with her again. Would she be upset that he hadn't owned up to who he was this morning? Hey, bro. Quinn strode into the room. What's with the excited grin and the outstretched hand? I have a meeting here this morning. You need to leave. Ooh, a meeting, Quinn teased, knowing exactly who Bodhi was meeting with. Sometimes his brother acted like he was 18 instead of 30, a child rather than the man next in line for the throne. Must be really important. Are you meeting the beautiful Dr. Johansson? Maybe she could give you some tips on increasing your strength so you can actually beat me next time we joust. Bodhi rolled his eyes. Quinn had never beaten him in the joust, and neither of them had ever beaten their younger brother Alaric or cousin Kingston, their military leaders. Luckily, all of them could beat Darian, Kingston's younger brother, the hilarious punk. They were as close to their cousins as their own brothers and sisters, everyone doting on his youngest sister Belle and Kingston's youngest sister Constance. Everyone bowed to his sister Adelaide, next in age to him and bossy as any sister should be. And everyone was secretly leery of Leia, Constance's twin and the sharpest-tongued girl on any island. She's here, then? Quinn dropped his voice and the teasing. Yes, and she's... incredible. Quinn's dark eyes sparkled with interest. This could be what we're hoping for. Bodhi nodded. He didn't need to say more. They loved and trusted their family members and everyone in the castle, but the walls had ears, and some would oppose their forward-thinking ideas. Better to see if Bodhi's idea was even feasible before they stirred the hornet's nest. Bodhi felt strongly enough about it that he'd asked Quinn for some of the precious dollars he'd saved working nights as a waiter while he was at Cambridge. Dollars and a job the king and Uncle Zoltan didn't know about. Prince Bodhi! Zara's voice came from the open doorway and from behind Quinn. Oh, excuse me, your highness. I didn't know you were here. Zara's naturally tanned skin seemed to get darker. Even as the royal family's assistant who was around Quinn every day, she always got a little awkward and unsteady when she spoke to him. Most women did. Quinn was not only next in line for the throne, but was supposedly devastatingly handsome. I was just leaving. Quinn gave Zara a wicked grin and stood back, ushering her into the room. Oh, well, hello. Quinn's voice got all deep and husky, but for the first time in his life, he sounded befuddled. Bodhi knew immediately that his Miss Red was in the doorway. He sprang forward, seeing the gorgeous Julia Adams in the full light of day, and understanding exactly why Quinn was awed. 
The marketing expert had been stunning in the pre-dawn light, wearing a t-shirt and shorts. Her hair pulled back. Now she wore a fitted button-down shirt and tight skirt, with her dark reddish-brown hair framing an even more exquisite face. Her blue eyes and appealing lips were the focus for Bodhi. She was breathtaking. He couldn't let his too handsome, charming brother push his way into Miss Red's affections. Neither of them had any right to even look at an outsider as a viable dating option. But Julia Adams was far too attractive and fun to tease with. Miss Adams, he said, embarrassed that his voice had also gone deep and husky. This is my brother Quinn, the Crown Prince. He was just leaving. He took liberties he shouldn't, wrapping his arm around Julia's waist and ushering her through the door. Heat and happiness filled him. He had to release her to shove at Quinn, pushing him toward the door. Quinn held his hands up, not fighting him, but his dark eyes were filled with challenge. The high-dollar tourism packages featuring the medieval reenactment and fair was Bodie's idea, and Quinn didn't have the time to worry about the details. But Quinn was financing Julia being here, and it was obvious he was intrigued by Miss Red as well. I believe, as Crown Prince, I have the right to be in the meeting. We'll fill you in later on what we decide. Bodie gave him a final shove and slammed the door behind him. Turning, he straightened his suit coat sleeves, pasting on his best smile for the woman he hadn't been able to get out of his mind since early that morning. His grin became genuine as he looked over her fine-boned features. Her gorgeous deep red hair was incredible, thick and long, but it was the challenge sparkling in her blue eyes. And the smirk on her pretty lips that really tugged him in. It's wonderful to see you again. <clears throat> A throw cleared before Julia could answer. Zara didn't even try to hide her smile. I'm assuming you don't need me for this meeting if even the crown prince isn't invited. Oh, thank you, Zara. No, we'll be fine. Zara laughed. Miss Julia Adams. Allow me to introduce Prince Bodhi Magnum. Bodhi put out his hand. She looked at his hand, looked at him, and then shook her head. P. B. Eh? He grinned, hoping she wasn't too upset at him. She put her hand in his, and the world became bright again. He saw things in full color and saw exactly how vibrant reddish brown hair could be. And what it could do to his senses, he didn't even notice Zara walk past until the door opened and shut behind her. "Hello, Miss Red," he said huskily. She pulled her hand from his and walked on her high heels to a table in the middle of the room. It was then he noticed how nicely fitted her skirt was, and how those high heels made her calves defined, lean, and long. The room seemed to tilt. Women on Magna dressed a little more conservatively, not particularly because of law, tradition, or because they wanted to, but because the island lacked the funds to import fabric from Spain, the closest mainland port. Turning, she pinned him with a glare that could have frozen ice. Dang, it was appealing. So Prince Bodhi has been described as. And I quote: "Incredible, kind, hardworking, smart, charming, and handsome." She arched an imperious eyebrow. It appears you think very highly of yourself. He felt a twinge of chagrin. I wanted you to look forward to your meeting with the prince. He spread his hands wide. Are any of those things not true? I have no idea if you're kind or hardworking. You could be smart, as you hired me to set up and market your tour packages, but I'd say definitely no on the charming, and the handsome. Hmm. She looked him up and down. 
I guess some might find you handsome, if they're into the tall, dark, and exotic thing. He chuckled. She wouldn't be easy to woo like the girls who wanted him simply because he was a prince. Well, thank you for the vote of confidence, Miss Red. I'd appreciate you calling me Miss Adams, P.B. He smirked. You can call me anything you want to, Miss Adams. She didn't respond to his line, setting her pink bag on the table and pulling out a laptop computer. Bodhi was instantly enthralled. He almost forgot his attraction to the computer's owner as he sprang across the room. Pressing his arm against hers, he was reminded of the attraction in full force as her hand brushed his and a sweet scent of coconut drifted from her. She startled. Excited? I've never seen a laptop in real life before. Her eyes widened, but then she teased. Just like a redhead? He stared at her, his mouth going dry at the spark of intelligence in those blue eyes and the way they captivated him. The redhead is much more enchanting than the laptop. Pink tinged her cheeks. She looked down at the computer and murmured, No compliments, please. We are not that friendly. He laughed. He couldn't help it. No woman teased him like this besides his sister Adelaide. And with his sister, it was obviously much different. She glanced up at him again. Do you not have computers? We do, but they're sadly outdated and the internet here is something awful. He felt a rush of shame. He'd easily volunteered to her this morning that their veins of gold had dried up twenty years ago. But in the light of day, it was harder to admit to this beautiful and accomplished woman just how deeply in trouble their nation was. It felt like a personal defect on his part. Oh, slow internet might make things a little more difficult, but we'll make it work. I guess a hotspot in using the data on my phone won't help much if you don't have cell towers? Sadly, no. But we do have a booster in the castle library, so we can work in there tomorrow. He pulled out a chair. Please sit. I can hardly wait to hear your ideas. Thank you. She sat, and he sat next to her. Their shoulders brushed as she clicked on something on the laptop. Bodhi leaned in close, brimming with excitement to see what a laptop computer could do. Simply being close to her lit a fire in him. He needed to tamp down these feelings. She was only here to help him put together and market tourism packages, and then she'd be gone. Back to America and whatever life she had there. Do you have a boyfriend? He asked, then immediately realized that was too personal. She was here to work with him and hopefully he and Quinn could convince their father King Kendrick and their uncle Grand Duke Zoltan to go for their tourism ideas. Everyone in the family was brainstorming ways to increase industry and help their people. Tourism should be an easy sell, but the Hidden Kingdom had enjoyed privacy and had been kept unspoiled from the outside world for many years. Tourism was a swear word in some circles. She looked at him with that perfect eyebrow arched. I don't think that has anything to do with our meeting today. She was right, and he'd already upset her by not telling her who he was this morning. And he was supposed to propose to Grace sometime in the future. He'd better focus on Julia's marketing plan and developing his ideas with her. He needed to think of the people of Magna and what was best for them. His personal desire to get to know one beautiful redhead shouldn't factor into the equation. But it did. Chapter 3 Julia finished her presentation to Prince Bodhi. PB indeed. She was hardly able to think straight or talk knowledgeably with how handsome and incredible he was. 
She had to keep reminding herself she was a professional, and the twinkle in his dark eyes should not distract her. The problem was, every bit of him distracted her. He was a hundred percent man all the way through, but he had a boyish innocence and excitement about him that appealed to her like no other man had done. His dark eyes were shadowed by dark lashes and brows, and he looked exactly how she'd imagined a royal prince would look. Handsome, charming, slightly intimidating, but kind and understanding as well. Her friends would all go crazy over him and his brother, Crown Prince Quinn Magnum. Wowzers! These were men. Bodhi had loved all of her ideas, from the Renaissance Fair, which he said they already did each Saturday, but they called it Market Day, to the reenactments of jousting, sword fighting, shooting arrows at targets, and racing on horses. He explained that the Magnite military still used horses, since vehicles couldn't reach many remote mountain locations. They regularly did all those activities as training, and on certain days throughout the year, those who were trained could participate, one of those days being this Saturday. Bodhi wasn't sure how his cousin, General Kingston Magnum, would respond to making the activities safe and enacting them with tourists. She sensed as they talked that not everyone in the royal family would be on board with bringing outsiders to their very private island. I can sell package deals that include staying at the castle, the fairs, tours of the island, watching the nightly activities, and paying extra to participate. If you can get the approval from the king, the duke, the general, and the rest of the royal family, she explained. If he didn't get the approval, her stay here might be short-lived. But the travel will be rough. I have contacts with United, and we could set up the flights to get them to Spain, but that four-hour puddle jumper plane isn't going to fly with the high-dollar clientele we need to cater to. The women would like smiley, friendly trek, but he wouldn't be enough of a draw for them to forget about their discomfort and to stop worrying for their lives. Bodhi nodded, his mouth pulling into a frown. We don't have the means. The words seemed to pain him, even though he'd admitted to her first thing this morning that their gold had run out. As you can imagine, upgrading the transportation to get them from Spain is a major undertaking. Boats would take too long, so air travel is the only way. And our runways can't handle anything bigger than Trek's plane. I could talk to my father, but any level of tourism is already going to be a stretch for all of them. If I try to take any of the little money left in the country's banks, money that is used to import essential medicines and goods, they'll really fight me. Okay. She hadn't realized how many barriers she would be up against. She had assumed Prince Bodhi had the approval of the rest of the royal family before he'd contacted her brother's agency. It wasn't just setting everything up with the fair, the medieval experience, the tours, and making a section of the castle into an all-inclusive resort. From what she understood, she, or rather Prince Bodhi, would be fighting against the other members of the royal family to even make this happen. Maybe even against the rest of his people. Who knew if they even wanted advancements? If they could barely pay for essential medicines, maybe they didn't have a choice. She was tempted to call him out about not informing her what she'd be up against, but she didn't know him well enough, and she really wanted to make this happen. She focused on the positive. Let me talk with my contacts at United. If I can book the trips and fill up the flights, it would be worth it for them to get a smaller plane to fly here. Then we'd only be dealing with updating the airstrip. 
if we have vehicles waiting to bring them to the castle, they won't care. There's no Uber. Actually, they'll be thrilled to not deal with security checks and baggage claim. Security checks, Uber? He asked. She laughed. Uber's like a taxi. Security checks happen at all airports. At his almost wistful look, she asked, "Have you never flown into an actual airport? Never left the island?" He shook his head. Quinn left for four years to attend Cambridge University, and Kingston left for three to learn and train with the British and American military forces. And my friend Grace just returned from medical school at Texas Tech. But the rest of us are educated here, very well, I might add. He flashed her a charming grin that made her stomach do an unexpected happy dance. Who was his friend Grace? Our society has preferred to stay closed off to the world for many years. It will be an uphill battle to change that. I can see that. I didn't realize when I accepted this position that it would be quite this big of a fight. She hoped her voice wasn't too snippety, but this was kind of a big deal. It would be plenty of work to set up everything, arrange travel and accommodations, and advertise in the right places to get the ideal visitors here. Fighting against the royal family wasn't on the table when she took the job. I'm sorry. He picked at the edge of a paper, not meeting her gaze. I didn't disclose that the rest of the royal family, apart from Quinn, knew nothing of my plans and might not support them. I was. He focused his gaze on her, afraid you wouldn't come. Despite the fact some don't want change, we need it. We need tourism, an infusion to our economy, and the ability to upgrade everything from our computers to our military equipment to medical technology and supplies. We need your help, Julia. Please. It was the first time he'd said her name, and there was an allure to that she couldn't ignore. She also couldn't ignore his plea. This hidden kingdom needed her. She stared into his dark eyes. She saw sincerity and hope for his people there. This was an incredibly unique opportunity for her. If he could talk his family into allowing her to proceed, she would do the most incredible job she was capable of. I'm in. If you are, I'm definitely in. And tomorrow, when I meet with the royal family, I'll sell them all on the plan. He sounded confident, but she could see in his eyes it would be a fight. He stuck his hand out. Shake on it. She placed her hand in his, feeling the rightness of his touch. Her throat went dry and her pulse raced. She could admit she was excited, for the project. Not for the handsome prince. That's what she told herself, anyway. Rationally, she had to remember she couldn't fall for some man who'd never left his beautiful island, and probably never would. Well, I think it's time. His eyebrows arched, and he leaned closer. Time for. Julia's heart thundered. She hadn't meant to make the suggestion some open-ended flirtation, but the warm look in his dark eyes made her want to tell him it was time to see if he kissed as good as he looked. Her breath shortened as she imagined kissing this impressive man. She could swear he was inching closer by the millisecond. Time for you to show me the castle, your tournament facilities, wherever you hold market, that beautiful church, the mountains and the beach in the daylight, your entire island, really," she said breathlessly. The moment stretched between them, and his dark eyes sparkled as if he knew exactly where her errant thoughts had gone. Of course," he said graciously.
What would you like to see first? The beaches, the mountains, the arena for jousting, sword fighting, and shooting, the castle, the church, or the beautiful town? She laughed unsteadily and stood, shutting her laptop and sliding it into her bag. Would the slower than 1990s internet give them bad reviews when they got the people here? She'd worry about that another day. Today, she would tour an island only a handful of outsiders had the privilege of seeing, and with a handsome man as her tour guide. I want to see all of it. He jumped up, rubbing his hands together. All right, let's do it. She slung her bag over her shoulder, but he reached for it. His hand caused fire to burn through her as he pulled the bag off, his palm brushing her shoulder. Allow me, please. Julia swallowed. She had to look away from his dark gaze or risk throwing herself at him and reenacting their crash on the beach this morning. Thank you. She'd always loved a gentleman. But hadn't met one to rival Bodhi. He swung the bag over his own shoulder. The pale pink laptop bag looked out of place and hilarious on his big muscular shoulder. She let herself appreciate the full effect of this handsome man in a suit holding her bag, and then she burst out with a laugh. That looks fabulous on you. He grinned. I'm masculine enough to wear pink. That you are. She shouldn't have admitted to that. She rushed toward the door, but he beat her to opening it. He swung it wide and held it for her. Thank you, she said, thinking she might be saying that a lot. Of course. They walked through the wide hallways of the castle. The walls and floor were smooth, sparkly gray granite with tall, open windows every few feet to allow the bright sunshine and tropical ocean breeze to filter in. She pulled out her cell phone and started snapping pictures. There are a lot more windows in your home than the castles I've toured before, she said. His home, Bodhi was a prince. Sheesh! That was attractive. She never met royalty before, and he was making royalty seem even better than the hot guy in the Disney Prince of Persia movie. Come to think of it, Bodhi had similar dark, soulful, expressive eyes like Prince Dastan had. Maybe that was why she couldn't keep her head on straight. She'd fantasized about eyes like Prince Dastan's for a while after seeing the movie, and here she was gazing into them. Are there? He gazed at her with interest. Wow! If somebody would have told her yesterday, she'd lose her sense of reality over a pair of dark eyes. She would have scoffed at them. She swallowed. But couldn't clear her dry throat and focused on the windows. Yes, most old world castles had the thick stone walls like this, but only slits for windows, large enough to shoot an arrow out of, but not let the enemy shoot you. What year was the castle built? Fifteen thirty, he said proudly. It's been updated and expanded many times, but the large windows have always been part of the castle and added to any expansion. Originally, there was no glass, but they needed the windows to allow the ocean breeze to cool the castle. He smirked at her, and any battles our country has fought took place in the water. Very few enemies have made it to our shore. Well. That's a very good thing, indeed. He winked, and she caught herself from fanning her face. As they walked, he explained the details of each room they passed while she took pictures and ooed and awed. She'd seen some of the beauty and old-world grandeur of the castle as Zara had walked her in this morning, but she liked seeing it through Bodhi's eyes. He told her about the antique faces, 
paintings, and wall hangings as they passed each one. He told her that the marble had been imported from Spain, back when Magna was one of the richest kingdoms in the world. She didn't want to suggest it, but the royal family could sell these priceless antiques and solve their money troubles for a while. It wasn't a permanent solution, though. She hated to think of an unappreciative outsider spoiling this magical place. But tourism was an extremely viable boost to any economy, and they could charge top dollar to bring people here. Bodhi introduced her to everyone they saw, staff, family, or friend, as if they were all his best friends. They were gracious, but most looked at her red hair with barely concealed shock. He walked her past the family's living quarters, but didn't show her around, so she assumed they were either off limits or he wanted to minimize who she met until he talked with his family about her purpose here. Do you mind if I change out of my suit? He asked. If we're going to tour the city and the rest of the island, it will get very warm. Of course, I want you to be comfortable. Thank you. He gave her a charming smile and another too appealing wink, and then disappeared through the massive double doors that led to the family suites. She couldn't believe how immense this castle was. Besides the customary ballroom, dining room, library, conference rooms, kitchens, etc., there were suites upon suites that they weren't even using. Perfect for her clients to stay in. As she waited, she tried to pull up her email on her phone, but the 2G service was too slow to get anything to load. That would be a problem for tourists, unless she could spin the vacation as getting away from all things modern. Hmm, that might be the ticket. The door opened and she glanced up. Bodhi had changed into a white cotton short sleeve button down and khaki shorts. Her breath rushed out. With his dark good looks, she may prefer this outfit to even him in a suit. Ready? He smiled at her. Yes, sir. P. B. His grin lit up his face, and he stepped closer. Her breath rushed out as he rested a hand on the wall behind her and leaned in. She'd never thought of herself as overly romantic or fanciful, but every girl dreamed about a handsome prince, and this particular prince put them all to shame. Her senses went into hyperdrive as his dark eyes focused on her, as if she was the most beautiful woman in the world. The door opened again, and a handsome man who shared Bodhi and Quinn's darker coloring, but was a little shorter and thicker than Bodhi, strode out. He was very strong-looking, and had the tough appearance of a dedicated military man. Alaric, Bodhi sounded happy to see him. He stepped away from her, and she caught a full breath. Good morning, brother. Alaric said, hugging him briefly. He shot Julia a questioning look. Allow me to introduce Miss Julia Adams from America, my favorite brother, Alaric, second in command of our military and the youngest commander in the history of our country. Bodhi's chest expanded with obvious pride as he introduced his brother. Alaric smiled, but his dark eyes were wary. He shook her hand and stepped back, clasping his hands tightly behind him. Pleased to meet you. What brings you to our island, Miss Adams? Bodhi cleared his throat. We'll be discussing that in our economics meeting tomorrow morning. Alaric's dark gaze pierced through her. Nothing like the warm looks she'd received from his brother all day. He folded his arms across his broad chest. Should she comment on how intimidating he looked? He was probably doing it on purpose. Maybe they taught that in military school. 
truly? he asked quietly. His dark eyes darted to his brother. I pray this idea is one that goes well for you, brother. Me too. Bodhi put a hand on Julia's lower back to escort her away. Nice to meet you, Julia murmured. You also, Bodhi? They both turned back. Be careful. That red hair is a dead giveaway she's an outsider. Some will not appreciate her being here. Julia took his words like a bee sting. They pricked, but she wasn't afraid. What could possibly be scary in this scenic beauty and with this strong man by her side? I'll protect her, Bodhi said, much more serious than she'd seen him. Alaric nodded, but didn't move. Julia felt his eyes on her as Bodhi led her away. I know red hair is unique, but has anyone on the island ever seen blonde hair? She asked. Was it really as bad to be an outsider as Alaric had implied? She couldn't be in danger. She'd been on Miami Beach after dark with drug peddlers and wannabe gangsters and handled herself okay. She couldn't imagine what Bodhi would need to protect her from. Moments ago, this place had seemed so picture perfect, like a fairy tale. But something about the interaction with Alaric had her on high alert. He'd been leery of her, and the warning to his brother scared her. Yes. Bodhi smiled, seemingly unconcerned about the danger. Some of our ancestors are from Norway, so we have blonde children born occasionally. The darker Spanish genes must be stronger. Most of us are darker skinned and have dark hair and eyes. My cousin Constance has blonde hair and blue eyes. Leia thinks her blue eyes make her superior to everyone. She's a sassy pants. In the royal families, only my oldest cousin Kingston shares her blue eyes, but his hair and skin are darker like mine. They finished their tour of the beautiful castle with the wing where they could house guests. Julia took more pictures there. Luckily, everything was modernized, beautiful, and well kept. Apparently, they'd updated the castle with all the modern conveniences before the gold veins ran out. It was sad to see such a proud, independent, and private people having to consider catering to a tourist crowd to infuse money back in their coffers. She swore to herself she would make certain the guests were all screened to ensure they treated the island with respect and weren't obnoxious tourists. She frowned. Could she screen for that? Probably. And having parameters would make tourists even more hungry to come here. They walked out the rear doors of the castle and into a flowering garden. Magnolia and gardenia trees greeted her, along with pink and orange flowering bushes she didn't recognize and luxurious flowers in full bloom. Pink, white, yellow, orange, and red flowers surrounding her everywhere she went. She inhaled and smiled, loving the smell of gardenia. The mountains to the east towered in green, shimmery splendor as if she were in New Zealand. If she looked to the south, she could see the church spires and knew from her brief glance on the way to the castle with Zara this morning that the town looked like something out of the Alps, with quaint shops and homes, the church and the mountains towering above. It was even better because it was tropical and warm and had an ocean and beach to boast about. Will your family be all right having guests invade their home? Bodhi shrugged. The excitement he'd shown as he shared his incredible castle home with her seemed to dim. I don't know. If there was another path, I'm sure they would take it. Maybe there is another option, but none of us have come up with it yet. She placed a hand on his arm. He startled and looked down at her hand and then into her eyes. 
his dark gaze was far too beguiling. Instead of letting herself move closer like she wanted to, she said, "We can establish perimeters and guidelines so they never invade your private space. It'll just feel like some friends coming to visit." He smiled. "I hope so. Me too." I heard about the red-headed beauty, but I had to see it for myself. A female voice pulled them apart. Julia turned to face an exquisitely beautiful brunette. The sparkle in her dark eyes was almost identical to Bodie's. Bodie wrapped his arm around the young woman's shoulder. Miss Julia Adams, allow me to present my youngest sister, Princess Belle. Bell jabbed her elbow into his side. So formal, big brother. Bodie responded by tickling her. She dodged away from him. They both turned to Julia with broad smiles. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Adams. Bell said. Julia, please. It's wonderful to meet you. Bell looked back and forth between the two of them for a second. Smiling sweetly with an obvious question in her eyes, "What brings you to Magna, Julia?" Julia turned to Bodhi. She wasn't sure who he wanted in on their plans, especially since he wouldn't have the approval until tomorrow morning. He hadn't told Alaric much at all. It's a secret, little sister. Bodhi put his finger to his lips and winked. I'll tell you tomorrow. Bell's eyes got wider still, and then she simultaneously jumped in the air and clapped her hands. You're getting married tomorrow! Yay! I'm so happy. I knew you didn't love Grace. I just knew it. And now you're going to marry Julia, the most beautiful outsider I've ever seen. Did you two meet at an online dating site? I hope you love it here, Julia, and I hope you and I can be the best sisters ever. Julia was stunned. Married to Prince Bodhi, she glanced at him. He was quite the catch. The fact that he was a prince was incredible, but knowing Bodhi personally made him even more appealing. His personality, great smile, those soulful eyes. His drive and his desire to help his people, the very idea of marrying him shot heat through her. But she wasn't looking to get married any time soon, and especially not to a man who had never left his island and probably never would. She was an American and planned to travel and explore the world before she settled down. And who the heck was Grace? The same grace he'd said was his friend. Bodie had frozen at the first of Bell's heartfelt speech, but now he sprang into action and put a hand on her shoulder. Bell, calm down, please. Julia and I are not getting married. He cast an anxious glance at Julia, maybe hoping she wasn't offended. Or was he hoping she wasn't getting any ideas? Julia is here for some work opportunities. Oh, Bell's brow furrowed. Well, that's disappointing. Are you still marrying Grace? I love her, truly I do. But you two don't fit together. Your eyes don't sparkle when you're around Grace like they were doing when you introduced Julia. She put a hand over her mouth. I'd better stop talking. It was nice to meet you. She darted off through the lush garden, turning back to call. Are we on for riding this afternoon? I might have to miss out. Bodie waved her off, and a door slammed in the distance. He pushed a hand through his hair and turned to Julia. I'm sorry. She's a bit impetuous. She's adorable, Julia said. I didn't take offense. Oh, good. He still looked uncomfortable. Who's Grace? She asked before she could stop herself.
Boney's eyes widened, and he studied the begonias at her feet. Our family doctor. Are you supposed to marry her? She asked, suddenly miserable without any reason to be. She hardly knew Bodie, and though he was ultra appealing, she'd already decided pursuing a relationship with him was not in the cards for her. It was her choice, not his. He shrugged and met her gaze. Our parents would both approve heartily, but we aren't officially engaged. Her heart leapt, despite her rational side saying it didn't matter. Are you unofficially engaged? He looked miserable as he admitted, sort of. Oh, Julia deflated again. It didn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Bodhi was attractive, smart, charismatic, interesting, but they were from different worlds. She was sure Dr. Grace was amazing, and exactly who Bodhi should be unofficially engaged to. Bodhi's gaze met hers, and something flashed in their dark depths, something appealing and incredible, and she wanted to bask in his deep brown eyes and edge closer and. Let's get on with the tour, shall we? She asked crisply, professionally, detachedly. Was that even a word? She didn't know, but her sharp tone was exactly how she should be acting right now. Her brother and dad would be proud. When the warmth in Bodie's eyes dimmed, she should have been relieved. Somehow, she was even more miserable. Chapter Four. Bodhi had always loved his little sister, but right now he was cussing her for bringing up Grace. Of all the things he didn't want Julia to know about, his semi-forced, unofficial engagement to Grace was one of them. They walked through the narrow streets of the kingdom's only city, adjacent to the castle. Julia exclaimed over everything. From the picturesque church and graveyard to the wrought iron second-story balconies bursting with flowers, to the cobblestone streets, to the variety of shops, he liked seeing his home through her eyes and would have thoroughly enjoyed the tour. But Julia was keeping her distance from him since she'd heard about Grace. She hadn't rubbed shoulders with him once. The other problem was all the attention her red hair and fitted, attractive clothing brought. Children gaped at her, murmuring about her red hair and her beauty, and adults kept taking second, third, or fourth glances. At first, she snapped pictures, but she quickly put her phone away and murmured, "I'll take more when they're comfortable with me." He cringed, but didn't know what to say. At least everyone was kind. Each shop they visited, the store owners and employees were friendly, though they didn't stop staring at her. The baker Oliver offered her a chocolate croissant and mango guava juice, and was ecstatic when she gushed happily over how delicious everything was. Bodie sipped the delicious fruity juice and enjoyed watching her eat the pastry. They left the bakery and walked along the river that danced through town from the mountain peaks to its destination, the ocean. As they approached the cottage where she was staying with the beach beyond, they took one of the many arched bridges to cross over the river. It's delightful here, she said. I love it. Bodie felt a burst of pride. He loved it here, but that wasn't saying much. He'd never seen anywhere else. She looked around. Do you think the people will calm down when more tourists come? I hope the tourists won't feel awkward and like a novelty. He should have hushed her, but he didn't want to be rude. A teenager on a bicycle overheard her and almost crashed into the river in surprise. Tourists? The boy asked his friend. Are tourists red hairs? Nah, tourists are loud Americans. 
not pretty ladies. Julia glanced around, her mouth forming an O. Sorry, she whispered. They don't even know what tourists are. Bodhi's jaw felt tight. He rubbed at it. He was fighting such an uphill battle. At any moment, the war machinery and horses from the opposing side would come crashing down that hill and take him out. Would you like to change out of your fancy clothes before we go on a drive through the country and the mountains? I asked our chef to have a picnic ready. I can go pick that up and return for you with my truck. On Magna, there were a few cars in various stages of disrepair. There were also military vehicles, most in better condition than the cars, but Bodhi had one of the few trucks on the island. His red Ford F-150 had been purchased and shipped here over ten years ago as his 18th birthday present. Thanks to Alaric not only being a military genius, but a genius with all things motorized, it still ran great. Oh, sure. Thank you. They walked silently to her cottage. See you soon, he managed as he swung open the door and waited for her to walk inside. As he walked back to the castle, he wondered why he felt so despondent and down. He hadn't been shot down for his ideas yet. That would come tomorrow morning. No. He needed to think positive if he had any hope of winning his dad and uncle over, not to mention the rest of the family. His worry over this venture succeeding was only part of it. He really wanted to win over Miss Julia Adams. That was wrong of him. His family assumed he would marry Grace, and Grace probably did as well. But he wasn't under any contract to do so. Though they were good friends, he expected she didn't feel many romantic illusions toward him either. Grace was too practical and smart to worry much about romance and for most of their adult lives she'd been focused on her schooling, and he'd been focused on trying to help his people. If Grace had felt the excitement around another man that he felt around Julia, she'd call off any hopeful plans their parents had made immediately. He sighed. It wasn't as if Julia was staying in Magna anyway. She'd be gone much sooner than he wanted to think about. He needed to focus on breaking his country into tourism and into the 21st century. That was more than enough to worry about. But as he strode through the picturesque streets that he'd always been so proud to live in, he could only picture blue eyes, red hair, and the most alluring smile he'd ever seen. Chapter 5 Julia changed into a pale blue t-shirt and a black cotton skirt. She laced up some comfortable shoes. Hopefully, they'd at least take some short hikes through those towering, gorgeous mountains. The perfect backdrop to the castle, church, and old-fashioned town. She was from Miami, Florida, which was also lush and beautiful, but it didn't have mountains like this. Why did she feel so discouraged? There were a lot of obstacles to them setting up and starting the medieval activities and scheduling tourists' visits. A lot more obstacles than she'd expected, but she shouldn't feel beaten. They hadn't even started yet. Part of her was frustrated with Bodhi for bringing her here before he even got permission to pursue their ideas and all of her was frustrated with Bodhi for being unofficially engaged. Ugh, what did that mean anyway? She stared out the large kitchen windows at the rear of the cottage. There was a small green yard with trees and a thick hedge, and the beach and ocean were beyond that. In the dark this morning, she had gone out the front door and hadn't found a break in that hedge for a short distance. Now, she could easily see there was a small opening in her own little yard. She'd use it tomorrow morning. 
maybe they could rent these cottages as another option to staying in the castle. She'd personally prefer a beach cottage to a castle suite. She paced to the kitchen and opened the fridge. She wasn't really hungry as she'd had that delicious croissant that melted in her mouth, and the fresh mango guava juice. But she was bored and frustrated. Two things that always called for chocolate. She hadn't taken the time to peruse the kitchen or fridge last night, or this morning after her long run. She'd barely had time to shower and work on her presentation before her meeting with Prince Bodhi. The fridge was well stocked with fresh fruits, vegetables, cheeses, and cold cuts, milk, and a couple flavors of juice in carafes. All the food was wrapped, but she didn't see any labels, brand names, or FDA approval, as if everything had come straight from the farm. Wow! Glancing at the counter, she saw a box of baked treats and a loaf of homemade bread. So quaint! It added to the charm of this place. A rap on her door had her closing the fridge, ignoring the chocolate chip cookies she could see in the box, and jogging through the kitchen to the front door. She swung it wide and barely withheld a swoony sigh. Bodhi appealed to her like no other man had done, and he was off limits for a whole slew of reasons. Dang him! He smiled and gestured to an older red Ford truck blocking the narrow road. A car, two horses, and a horse-drawn carriage waited to pass, while some bikers dodged around. Everybody craned their necks, their eyes wide with surprise when they saw her. It was just like when they'd toured the village and she'd heard whispers of red hair over and over again. She'd caught so many stares that she'd wanted to get sassy and ask them to take a picture. It would last longer. She'd stopped taking her own snapshots because she didn't want to stand out even more. They probably had no digital cameras here. Who knew? It was such an odd mix. Magna had some modern amenities, but many things were old-fashioned and hadn't been upgraded. I'm stopping traffic. He smiled, but it was tight. Was he growing concerned about all the attention? Should she hide her hair, dye it? She scoffed at herself. She wasn't dyeing her hair. Let's go then. She smiled brightly. Her desire for him and trying to hide it. Was still more prevalent in her mind than the awkwardness of being on display as the only redhead and modern woman these people had ever seen. Bodhi put his hand on her lower back to escort her. Curse the heat that flared through her body. He was only being a gentleman, and she, or her body, was making more of the gesture than he intended. Grace, bah. The woman was probably all things perfect and wonderful, and a doctor to boot. His kingly parents were probably so proud of his great marital match. Ugh. He opened the truck door for her. It was clean and in good repair. A picnic basket rested on the middle seat, a barrier between them. That was good. It smelled like it was filled with fried chicken. Fresh bread and who knew what other delightful foods. The smells made her stomach lift with anticipation and her mouth water. She loved all the fresh food here, especially if she didn't have to cook it. She'd focus on the beauty of this place and the delicious food and push away her attraction to Prince Bodhi. P.B. Smooth and creamy, eh? She'd show him smooth and creamy, if only both words didn't fit him. Bodhi hurried around, climbed in, fired the motor, and pulled into the street. He waved to the other travelers as he edged around them, having to go onto the grass to avoid some of them. She didn't recognize the vehicle; it had a European look. 
she couldn't even guess what car company had made it. Am I the spectacle, or is it your big old truck? She asked. He chuckled, shifting into a higher gear as they cleared the congestion. It's the truck. People in Magna see gorgeous redheads every other day. Really? Sure, in their dreams. He tossed her an appealing wink and sped up as the road widened. They were parallel to the beach. Some nice homes cropped up occasionally, but they were mostly graced by a view of the sand, palm trees, lush undergrowth, and water. Julia appreciated the compliment, but she didn't let herself respond. She looked out the window at the coastline. The beach boasted beautiful tan sand, and she knew from slowly jogging through it this morning that it was deep and soft. Tourists would go crazy over this unspoiled paradise. She glanced the other direction where fields spread out, and then butted against towering green mountains, mountains that glistened and shimmered in the sunlight, like a setting from Lord of the Rings. It's beautiful here, she breathed. Thank you. Sometimes I take it for granted. It's all I've known. You shouldn't. There are places in the world dry and ugly as a barren wasteland. Yikes. Are you trying to terrify me into being grateful? Whatever it takes. He laughed. The island is a lot bigger than I thought it would be she remarked, her gaze drawn back to the ocean as the waves rolled onto the sand. Didn't I send you the size of the island in the info packet? Yes, you did. 22 miles east to west and 53 miles north to south. It all seems so much larger and intimidating than that. Also, much more breathtaking than I could have imagined. Is some of the island uninhabitable? Some, but not as much as you'd think. The palace and city are on the west side, the farmlands spread out to the south and north of the city, and the mountain regions are east of the palace, but in the center of the island. Not many people live on the far east side. The wind is stronger there, and there is a possibility of hurricanes, but some have established homesteads there. They are tough and hardy people. But people can traverse those mountains? She looked up at the towering peaks, for the most part, moving slowly on the dirt roads or paths. Do people live in the mountains? There are two different groups who live and thrive in the mountains. One group is made up of religious zealots. They live in a beautiful sheltered mountain valley where they farm and forage. Their convent has been standing for hundreds of years. They abhor outside influence and want to stay locked in the 10th century. Her eyebrows rose, but she didn't comment. Already, Magna was years behind the modern world, in her opinion, but still too progressive for the zealots. Can we see the convent? He shook his head. I'm sorry, but I wouldn't dare get you close. If they glimpsed a red-headed beauty, they may forget their peaceful vows, storm the castle, and demand you be sacrificed to the volcano. You're teasing. He smiled, but his dark eyes were serious as he glanced at her. Mostly teasing. Please tell me the other group is more friendly. Sadly, no. At least the zealots choose peace. He shook his head and his grip on the steering wheel tightened. The other group calls themselves the dissenters. They are spread throughout the mountains. Most don't even seem to like each other, but they unite any time they think the royal family is in the wrong. Luckily, they typically keep to themselves. We only see them occasionally in town to trade for supplies. The dissenters? That doesn't sound very friendly at all. He chuckled. They aren't all bad. 
I have a few friends from school who are part of the dissenters. They were hosted by city families during the weekdays while they attended school, and then they'd head home on the weekends. Hard-working people up there. They have to be to thrive since they don't have flat lands to grow crops. They live mostly as hunter-gatherers. He turned off the road heading south and toward the east. I thought we'd drive up into the mountains to my favorite waterfall for our picnic. Then I can take you on the road that circles most of the island this afternoon. It's a slow but beautiful drive. Okay. As long as the dissenters, or the zealots, don't see me and sacrifice the redhead in the volcano. Sheesh. Maybe his brother Alaric's chilling warning had been underplaying how dangerous it was for her here. He laughed easily, reached over and gently squeezed her leg, making warmth course through her. That won't happen. They don't do sacrifice? You were just teasing? I didn't say that. He looked at her with a twinkle in his eye as they bounced over a pothole in the road. No volcanoes? We've got a great volcano. A redhead would be just the thing to keep it from exploding and ensure prosperity and peace for the kingdom. Ha! <laughs> she tried to laugh, but her gut was strangely churning. So why am I safe then? He surprised her by wrapping his warm hand around hers. You're with me. No dissenter or zealot would dare mess with the fearsome Prince Bodhi. She laughed again. She should tell them that they weren't friendly enough to hold hands, but she felt comforted and didn't want him to stop. Fearsome, eh? Oh, yeah. She looked him over. He was strong, but not really the fearsome type. Too kind and happy. They were characteristics she loved, but not necessarily great military characteristics. Silence lingered in the truck as they turned east and cruised through fields toward the towering mountain range. Bodhi rubbed his thumb along the back of her hand and she shivered from the warm, tingling sensation. Grace? Who was Grace? He seemed to realize what he was doing and maybe remember he was sort of engaged because he released her hand and gripped the steering wheel with both palms. Clearing his throat, he said, Truthfully, it's my brother Alaric and cousin Kingston who are fearsome. All of us were trained to fight in the old ways and modern, but those two thrived on it. They're our military leaders. He'd told her that already, but he seemed suddenly nervous, so she didn't want to remind him. Alaric seemed like a military type. He liked that you thought so. So, if Alaric and Kingston are the military type, what type are you? He relaxed and released his hold on the steering wheel with his right hand, resting his hand on the cushion between them, next to the picnic basket reminding her of how it had felt to have him hold her hand. I like business, industry, thinking up ideas, and acting on them. And that's why you brought me here. He glanced at her. That's right. They bounced over a rut in the road and he looked forward again. Do you think you'll get the approval in the morning to bring tourists here? His jaw tightened. I don't know. You think they'd realize that we have no choice but to move forward, progress, and financially sustain ourselves in new ways. But the old mentality is deep in many of our people, especially my Uncle Zoltan. It'll be a battle for sure. And if you lose the battle, I go home? He looked at her and swallowed. I guess so. Julia hoped she read the disappointment in his eyes correctly. He didn't want her to go home, but he was engaged to the fabulous Grace, so there was that. Zoltan? He just sounds like a bad guy. Bodhi laughed, 
shaking his head. He's a great guy. Zoltan means life or ruler, depending on which origination you take it from. But he's definitely a good guy. He just wants what's best for all of our people. I'll take your word for it. He still sounds like the evil Zoltan. Bodhi smiled at her, shaking his head. When you meet him, you'll see. He always has a smile on his face and is everyone's friend. His wife, my aunt Natalia, is almost as sweet and loving as my own mama. Julia smiled at him, thinking about her own parents. They were kind, supportive, and amazing. They'd both been proud and excited for her to have this opportunity, and she'd overheard her dad thanking Justin for giving Julia the chance to thrive. She'd miss them over the next few weeks or months as she set up and started these fairs, but she knew she had their support. Maybe she'd pay for them to come be her first clients here. With the prices she was planning to set for the packages, she might have to get Justin to pitch in. They drove in silence, bouncing up the dirt road that led them into switchbacks going up the mountainside. The trees around them thickened. Bodhi took a trail to the right, and they dodged through trees and up a slight incline on a trail that looked like it was made for goats, not a big pickup truck. Bodhi finally slammed the truck into park and grinned at her. "You'll be glad you changed out of those high heels, though they were very pretty." Shoes. He hurried around to get her door. He waited for her to get out, then leaned back in and picked up the old school picnic basket. "Do you want to eat first or hike to the waterfall?" "Hmm." She pursed her lips. I can hardly wait to see the waterfall, but that chicken smells delicious, and I wouldn't want it to get cold. Great answer. He gestured to a fallen log not far away, a perfect bench for our picnic. She walked with him to the log, sitting on the scratchy surface as he opened the basket and set it at their feet. He handed her a plate and waited while she filled it with fried chicken. A hunk of crusty bread, fruit salad, and potato salad. She rested it on her knees and lifted the fried chicken first. It was still warm. She tore off a bit with her teeth and savored the spicy crust and warm, tender meat. Mmm, she murmured, chewing slowly and looking out at a world of green. The mountain falling away to her left gave her a view clear down to the fields and ocean beyond. To her right was a barrier of thick green trees that would be hard to penetrate. This is living. Bodhi grinned and filled up his own plate. Simple pleasures, right? They are the best. She tried the potato salad next. It was creamy. With some zest from the green onions and a slight mustard flavor, almost as good as the chicken. Can we include a picnic in the mountains and waterfall tour as an option on the package? He nodded. I don't see why not. As long as the zealots or dissenters don't catch wind of it. She was testing him. How much of a problem would those groups be? We don't see them very often. He said, but his eyes darkened, and she wondered if he was a bit concerned. The problem might be vehicles to get the people up here, she mused. If Kingston won't let us take some military vehicles, we could rig a tent over the back of my truck and seats. She laughed. Definitely wouldn't be OSHA approved, but it's part of the charm of this place, right? Everything isn't all regulated. I don't know what OSHA is, but no, nobody regulates us. Do you have enough chefs at the palace to prepare the food we'll need for our guests? He shrugged. I think we'll have to hire more, but that's a good problem to have. Our people are industrious. 
but once the mines close down, there haven't been as many job opportunities as any of us would like. We can also give the option to them staying at the palace, but not an all-inclusive option with our chefs fixing them every meal. Then they would frequent the stores and restaurants in town more. Julia liked that he was thinking that way, trying to give as much opportunity to his people as possible. I like that. I was also wondering if some of your people might want to rent their homes, or even make their homes into a bed and breakfast of sorts if they have the space and want the income. Yes, I like that idea a lot. They continued to eat the delicious picnic while they discussed their ideas and potential problems and solutions. The birds twittered around them, and Julia loved the fresh air, gorgeous scenery, and being with Bodhi. Why did he need to be engaged? Why couldn't she focus on the job she'd been brought here for instead of worrying about him so much? They cleaned up the picnic and stored it back in the truck. Then started on their hike. The path was well worn with the decent incline. They weren't in any hurry as Julia took in the beauty around them and exclaimed over the wildflowers, the butterflies, and the dancing creek that appeared on their right before too long. The creek grew louder as they hiked. She'd bet it was less than a mile. And around fifteen minutes' travel time, when she glimpsed the waterfall spilling down hundreds of feet from a sharp cliff on their right, oh my! She cried out, clapping her hands together. This is better than Kauai. He smiled, spreading his arms wide. There are other waterfalls just as beautiful, but this is the closest one. Julia looked around. The waterfall pool was small, and then the water slid down the creek path. The waterfall itself was towering majesty, a gray, jagged cliff swathed with green moss. The trail they were on wound into the trees to the left. Most people will love the shorter hike, but we could give the option of longer hikes. We'll have die-hard hikers who want to see waterfalls and do hikes that no one has been privileged to do. She clapped her hands in excitement. This would be almost as big of a draw as the medieval reenactment and fair, and would draw a different crowd. This entire experience would be so easy to market. Her brain was spinning with ideas. She'd have to call Justin as soon as she got back to her cottage, and have him start talking with the travel agencies and airlines and fleshing out the details. Pulling out her phone, she took numerous pictures of the waterfall from different angles, and then of the woods around them. She had quite a few of the castle from this morning, but she'd need to get more pictures of the town too. She hadn't felt comfortable doing that this morning with so many people gawking at her. Hopefully, they'd relax about the redhead once they grew more comfortable with her. Bodhi waited patiently for her to take pictures. He seemed proud of his beautiful spot and grateful she was so excited about it. Can we hike to the top? She asked. He nodded. Yes, but no diving. We've had teenagers die in that attempt. Her mouth widened in horror as she looked between the towering waterfall and the small pool at the bottom that couldn't be more than a few feet deep. No, she gasped. Teenagers were suicidal enough to try that jump. His eyes were dark and serious. Yes, two have died. We have no idea how many have tried. But I've heard rumors of some living. My brothers, cousins, and I were threatened with death by dismemberment if we attempted it and lived. She swallowed hard, afraid he was completely serious. That's awful. It is. The good news is one of the waterfalls that's about a three-mile hike from here is only sixty feet high and has a deep pool at the bottom to swim or jump into. 
60 feet is still an insane jump. He shrugged, unconcerned. He was this crazy, attractive mixture of handsome prince, tough adventurer, smart businessman, and kind gentleman. She wished she wasn't so drawn to him, but she didn't know how to shut it off. Lead the way to the top, she said. I need more pictures. He laughed, his dark eyes twinkling. You and your pictures. They hiked to the top, a more strenuous and precarious hike than getting here had been. Julia took multiple pictures of the view down the waterfall. When she finished, Bodhi turned to walk back, but she touched his arm. Can we hike to the other waterfall and swim in it? He looked her over. Sure, but we won't have time to drive around the island today. The hike's only a few miles, but from this direction it's steep. It'll be slow going. There are other routes we could take to drive to it. I'd rather hike if that's okay with you. We can go on our drive around the island tomorrow. He looked into her eyes and nodded. Tomorrow. Julia smiled. She liked the idea of tomorrow with him. She liked being with him. She could almost forget all the obstacles between them as she gazed into his dark eyes and thought about a lot of tomorrows. Chapter 6 Julia could hardly believe how incredible the scenery was and how stoked she was feeling about this project now. She could just picture the exclusive package deals to tour this gorgeous, hidden kingdom. People would be clamoring to pay top dollar to come. She wasn't even worried about the flight from Spain to here now. United Airlines would be lucky to get the job. She or Justin could easily convince other airlines to bid for the job after she sold them on how incredible it all was. Bodhi led the way along a rutted, steep, sometimes muddy path. He held on to her hand and assisted her numerous times. The towering trees around them whispered of possibilities and cooled them with their shade, a slight breeze twisting the thick leaves. They didn't talk much as they hiked. Julia was grateful that Bodhi was letting her enjoy and savor this incredible place. She'd adored the castle and the quaint town with the church, but this marvel of nature called to her. It was prettier than anything she'd seen, with vines dripping from the trees and wildflowers abounding. They left the stream that fed the tall waterfall, but soon crossed another stream that rushed with fresh water. Bodhi claimed it was clean and she could drink it. It seemed risky, but she was hot and thirsty. She scooped up some water. It was delicious. She drank her fill and then dumped some over her head and down her shirt. She caught Bodhi staring with those dark eyes she couldn't get enough of. He looked away quickly. Was he attracted to her, or was he committed to his doctor? She didn't know, and it was making her frustrated. As they resumed their hike, it continued to be slow going as he'd promised. The sun went from peeking through the towering trees straight above to hiding behind the branches and sinking to the west. If they didn't get there soon, they might have to turn around so they weren't hiking out in the dark. Bodhi lifted her over a fallen log. She murmured her thanks, lost for a moment in his dark gaze savoring the feel of his warm palms encompassing her waist. He looked over her, his gaze slow and lingering, and she felt a tremor race through her. She leaned in closer. Instead of crossing the distance, he paused, his dark eyes filled with indecision. He broke away and stared at the trees behind her. We're getting close. She was jolted back to reality a reality where her handsome, kind prince wasn't hers at all. In fact, 
He was engaged to an accomplished doctor who was probably breathtakingly beautiful and kind. This fairy tale really stunk, for Julia at least. Oh, that's good. She managed, being close, close to the waterfall, not close to each other. That wasn't good at all. Indecision flashed across his face as if he felt conflicted and maybe wanted to be her handsome prince, but he only said, "Yeah, it is good." He turned and started up the trail. "I can't wait to swim in the waterfall pool," she said instead of begging him to turn around, stare into her eyes again, and this time lean in instead of breaking away. He smiled over his shoulder at her. I wouldn't have pegged you as the adventurous sort when I saw you all dressed up in your tight skirt and heels this morning. Her eyebrows lifted. It wasn't that tight of a skirt. In her world, most women wore pencil skirts. What about when I ran into you on the beach earlier this morning? Ah, yes. At the moment you tackled me. I would have believed you were adventurous. Thanks, PB," she teased. The chance at romance may have passed, but at least they could still chat easily and tease. He grinned as he looked over his shoulder at her. "Are we that friendly yet?" She laughed at the reminder. Did he want to be that friendly? If he didn't have a sort of fiance, she would love to be friendly with him. Take me swimming in a waterfall, and you'll see. Friendly, she threw back. He stopped walking and turned to face her, his eyes widening. Julia pressed her lips together, realizing how forward that had sounded. I mean, well, I didn't mean. His eyes trailed over her face and came to rest on her lips. The moment stilled and stretched between them. Would he kiss her? He turned abruptly and said, "It's close now." Julia swallowed her disappointment and kept pace with him. The crashing of water announced the waterfall was close. Even the idea of swimming in a gorgeous spot of nature couldn't distract her from wishing he'd kiss her. Then she called herself and him some semi-awful names. If he was engaged, they shouldn't even be flirting. His cute little sister had claimed he didn't have a spark with Grace, but what did that matter? That didn't give Julia the right to fling herself into his appealing arms, or him the right to make her want to drag him to a stop and kiss him. The hike seemed to stretch forever as her anticipation of seeing the falls grew. But it wasn't enough to push away the misery of not getting a kiss from Bodhi. Finally, they skirted around some thick trees, and a large pool of water appeared, with a wide spray of water cascading down the green wall above it. It definitely wasn't as towering and majestic as the first fall, but it was still gorgeous, and that large pool looked clear and inviting. Yes, Julia cheered. We're swimming in a waterfall today. Bodhi grinned and started unbuttoning his shirt. Let's do it. Julia's mouth flopped open like a dead fish. She stared in shock and appreciation and a desire she'd never felt in her life as he quickly shed his shirt. The muscles in his arms, shoulders, chest, and abs were long, lean, and quite perfect in her opinion. He looked at her, and his eyes widened as he realized she was staring open-mouthed at him. But then tenderness and desire filled his own eyes. The moment stretched slow and breathtaking and beautiful between them. Julia had no clue how to react to the beauty and appeal of this man, her own charming prince. No, 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 not her charming prince. Somebody else's. Her only defense was to focus on the job. She yanked out her phone and exclaimed, "Pictures!" 
I need pictures first. Can I get some of you in them? He looked like he wanted to say no, but she promised, I won't use them for marketing. I'd just like to have some of you. She should not have admitted to that. The depth of his gaze said he knew exactly how drawn she was to him. Okay, he conceded. He didn't pose, but simply stood and smiled as she took a bunch of pictures of his shirtless glory. And then she angled the phone to take numerous pictures of the waterfall and surrounding area while he removed his shoes and socks. She had to snap a few more of him bending over to unlace his shoes. The strong muscles of his back and shoulders were simply too impressive to ignore. When she had many more pictures than she probably needed, but not nearly as many as she wanted, she untied her own shoelaces and peeled her socks off. She debated taking off her t-shirt, but she'd rather have it plastered to her than be in only her bra and skirt. Bodhi waited for her. She stepped over uneven rocks, wincing when her tender feet got poked. He extended his hand and the muscles in his arms flexed. If you don't mind, I can carry you in so you don't hurt your feet. Mine are tough. Julia swallowed hard. Every part of him was tough. She noticed how well his clothes fit him earlier, but she'd had no idea at the time the kind of impressive musculature that lay under that shirt. Could she handle him carrying her, or would she embarrass herself and try to kiss him? Okay, she managed. He walked toward her. His dark eyes seared through her as he moved purposefully confidently, and irresistibly. When he reached her, he studied her with that incredible dark gaze for a few seconds. Her throat was dry and her heart raced. His lips curled in an appealing smile, and then he placed one hand around her waist and bent, sweeping her legs off the ground. Easily lifting her against his chest, he paused as if letting her savor the moment. Or maybe he was as affected holding her close as she was being cradled against his strong chest. Fire and sparks and joy shot through her, and she had no problem wrapping her arms around his neck and pulling herself even closer. Engaged? What a joke. This man wasn't engaged. He was meant to be Julia's, despite the obstacles between them. His cheek creased in a soft smile, and she imagined he'd lean down and capture her lips with his own any second. Instead, he pivoted and carried her into the water. Disappointment coursed through her, but at least she was still in his arms. As the water reached her legs, the chill of it surprised her. She shivered. I thought a tropical waterfall would be warmer. He chuckled. The water comes from the mountains, not a stagnant pool. He pressed on, and soon the water covered her lower body and his. It wasn't freezing cold, and it was a warm day, maybe 80. But still, she shivered. She thought he might release her now that they were in the pool. But instead, he whispered, Hold your breath. She obeyed, and he plunged them under the water. The cold surrounded her as surely as his arms, and she had to remind herself to hold her breath instead of gasping in surprise. He brought her back up out of the water. Droplets ran down his handsome face, and he seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. That'll wake you up. For sure. They stared at each other. She wanted to lean up and kiss him, but instead she pushed from his arms and swam toward the waterfall. The movement warmed her chilled arms and legs. The pool got deeper the closer she got to the falls. Bodhi was close by her side as she swam under the waterfall. The water pounded on her head and neck. 
If she could get the right angle, it would be a terrific massage. Swimming through, she blinked open her eyes and looked at the magical world around her. Green moss climbed the cliff behind her, and the sheet of uneven water fell in front of her. Bodhi popped up next to her, pushing his wet hair back and blinking those beautiful dark eyes. What do you think? He called to be heard over the pounding water. Beautiful! She hollered back. His gaze trailed over her face, and he said almost too quietly for her to hear, "My thoughts exactly." Julia treaded water, feeling frozen and alive at the same time. All thoughts of the project she was working on and worries over obstacles between her and Bodhi disappeared. As he treaded water with just one arm and wrapped his other arm around her waist, pulling her in tight to his finely formed chest, his head bent toward hers. Julia closed her eyes, anticipating the thrill of his lips claiming her own. The secluded alcove behind the waterfall was the perfect place for their first kiss. Distant pops sounded. Was she imagining it? Maybe fireworks were going off somewhere to celebrate this moment. She waited, and waited, and finally opened her eyes. Bodhi wasn't staring at her, but at the wall of water. Everything okay? She asked, disappointed that he could be distracted from their almost kiss. He leaned close to her ear and said, "Stay here." Then he released her and swam with sure strokes through the wall of water. Julia watched him go. Terror filled her as surely as the desire to kiss him had moments before. What was going on? Who or what was out there that she needed to stay hidden from? Dissenters, zealots, wild animals? Her heart pounded out of control as she slowly treaded water and hoped to keep herself hidden. She couldn't see well through the water. She studied it anyway, praying Bodhi was okay and would be coming for her soon. A shadow approached. She shrank back against the cliff behind her. There was nowhere to escape. Bodhi swam through the wall of water. He extended his hand to her. We need to go. She didn't question him, but put her hand in his. His comfort and strength made her feel like everything would be okay, even though she had no idea what the danger was. She let him tug her through the water. She blinked to clear her vision and swung her gaze around what she thought was a peaceful clearing. No man with a spear or vicious wolf appeared to rip them apart. Bodhi released her hand, and they both swam quickly toward the shore. When her feet touched the rocky bottom, she pushed hard through the water, but couldn't move fast enough. Bodhi swept her up into his arms and carried her toward their shoes. "What is it?" she whispered against his neck. "Are we in danger?" "I don't know where they are." I heard gunshots when we were under the falls, but I can't see anyone. Gunshots? She squeaked out. She was from Miami. Gunshots meant very, very bad things. The water in her clothes froze against her suddenly chilled skin, and she buried her head in his chest. Bodhi had said he could protect her, but she hadn't realized he might have to step up and prove it. She hadn't noticed any guns on him. How could he protect her if somebody came out of those woods and started shooting? She imagined his beautiful chest and back riddled with bullets as he sacrificed himself to protect her. It'll be okay. Bodhi's voice was soothing and calm. The people who live up here hunt for their food. I'm sure that's what the shooting was. But without weapons of my own, I'm not willing to risk your safety. Her heart thumped quicker. She couldn't calm down, knowing there were gun-wielding dissenters close by. 
They reached their shoes. Bodhi let her feet slide to the ground, but he kept his arm around her. I'll keep you safe, he said softly, the look in his eyes meaningful and deep. Julia felt comfort wrap around her like a blanket, but all she could concentrate on was those deep, lovely eyes of his. She forgot the danger, arched up onto tiptoes, and wrapped her arms around his neck. Bo? A deep voice came from the trees. Bodhi whipped in front of her and held her back with one arm. Show yourself, he demanded. A strong-looking man with long, dark hair and handsome but severe facial features stepped out of the trees. He held a serious-looking gun in his hands. The muscles in his arms and chest were taut and on display, as he was wearing only tan pants and work boots. A shark's tooth necklace hung between his pec muscles. Samson. Bodhi relaxed his stance, but still held Julia behind him. She clutched his arm and stared at the stranger over his shoulder. Samson definitely fit his name. He looked like the wild, long-haired tough man from the Bible. This guy was definitely a dissenter. Would he resent Julia as an outsider? or give her a chance to prove she had good intentions before he threw her in the volcano. Where was the volcano, anyway? It appeared he and Bodhi at least knew each other, but why was his grip on the gun so tight? How are you, old friend? Samson asked, striding toward them and shifting the gun to his left hand, extending his right. Good, thanks. Bodhi shook the man's hand and gently brought Julia around to his side. Samson's eyes flickered over her wet clothing and her face, but his gaze lingered on her hair. His expression grew fierce, and he gave Bodhi a challenging smile. You looked like you were a lot better than good a few moments ago. Bodhi's smile was tight as well. Thanks a lot for interrupting. Samson laughed, but there wasn't much humor in it. I was shocked to see my old friend with an outsider in his arms. Julia Adams, this is Samson Cohen, an old schoolmate of mine. Bodhi said the words easily, but something was off. He wasn't necessarily afraid of this man, but he was upset or angry at him for some reason. Julia stuck out her hand. Nice to meet you. Samson looked at her hand, then at her. A few long seconds ticked by before he almost crushed her hand with his strong grip, and then pulled back quickly as if she were an electric fence. Where are you from, Julia? She edged closer to Bodhi, but tilted her chin proudly. She wouldn't cower to this man. He didn't strike her as a bully, but he was definitely tough and had the military vibe as strong as Bodhi's brother Alaric had. America, she said. Miami, Florida, to be exact. Samson stroked his short beard thoughtfully. Are you dating an outsider? He asked Bodhi directly. Yes, Bodhi said, surprising her. Was he being serious, or was he trying to protect her from the dissenters knowing her purpose here? Half an hour ago, she'd been higher than a kite on her plans for this place. Meeting Samson had put more than a damper on that excitement, not to mention ruining what would have been a fabulous kiss with Bodhi. Samson's eyebrows lifted, but he didn't comment. What are you doing with an automatic weapon? Bodhi went on the offensive. Hunting. Samson stood straight and proud as if he had nothing to hide. Only the military is supposed to have the Browning machine gun. Last I checked, you resigned from Kingston's command. Samson's lips pulled up into a smirk. Does he miss me? I'm sure he does. Bodhi said dryly. 
Where do you get the gun? You think I'm going to rat out my source? He shook his head. You're a good man, Bodhi, but far too naive sometimes. His eyes traveled to Julia, as evidenced by the company you keep. Bodhi tensed, and Julia's stomach rolled over. What kind of an insult was that? Samson didn't give either of them a chance to reply. He hefted the gun in a sort of salute. You'd best get on back to your protected castle, my friend. Many of my friends wouldn't take as kindly as I do to seeing an outsider with you. He gave Julia one more challenging stare, then whirled and strode away, disappearing quickly in the greenery. Julia shivered and leaned into Bodhi. What kind of threat was that? Get your shoes and socks on quickly, he responded. Julia's body chilled. It was obviously a serious threat. Her gaze darted around, but she couldn't see Samson or anyone else through the thick forest. Bodhi obviously saw something, or knew Samson and his men well. He was concerned, which in turn made her terrified. Chapter Seven. Julia's hands wouldn't stop trembling. She had a frustrating tug of war with her socks, not wanting to slide onto her wet feet. She jammed her feet into her running shoes and quickly tied them. Bodhi was already standing and held out his hand to her. He helped her up and turned, peering into the thick wall of green. Will he follow us? She asked. Her eyes darting to the trees, Bodhi held on to her hand and started jogging toward the path. If he wanted to hurt you, he would have already attempted it, and I would have stopped him. His protectiveness of her warmed her heart, but didn't calm the bunched muscles in her neck. He's got an illegal gun, Bodhi continued. And as long as I've known him, he's had a huge chip on his shoulder. But he and I have also been friends for a long time. They had to slow to a fast walk as they slid down some loose shale on the uneven trail. You don't think he'll hurt me then? He respects me enough that I don't think he'll come after us. His warning was regarding his other mates. They don't know me like he does, and won't be so understanding of one of the royal family being with an outsider. Julia hurried to keep pace with him, her heart racing out of control and her fingers cold and clammy. She checked over her shoulder every other minute, but it was impossible to see anything through the thick greenery. Anxious long minutes, or maybe hours, passed. They had to be getting close to the truck, but she wasn't sure. Fear made her muscles tense, and their speed made the rock-strewn, muddy trail even more treacherous. To make matters worse, the sky seemed to be darkening around them. I didn't think it was that late, she murmured. The time went fast, he said. He seemed calm and in control. But the way he hurried down the rutted, slick trail told her they were in real danger. Julia's feet rotated faster than they should. She didn't want to slow him down. Her feet suddenly slid out from under her. She hit the trail with an oomph. Her hand ripped from Bodie's grip as she tumbled in the mud and skidded toward the ledge on the right. She screamed in horror. Bodhi's hand darted out. He grasped her arm and dragged her to a stop. Her shoulder pinched painfully, but at least she hadn't fallen off the ledge and down into the trees and nothingness. Looking back, she saw Bodhi had a grip on a solid tree trunk with his other arm. He curled his right arm and pulled her closer to him. Julia reached her other arm around and clasped his arm with both of her hands, 
scrambling with her knees and toes to gain traction and get back on the trail. Bodhi helped her to her feet and put his arm around her, securing her to him. Are you okay? he asked, his voice breathless and full of concern. Yes, thank you. She wanted to gush about how he was her princely hero and give him a kiss of gratitude, but he glanced over her shoulder, his face pulled tight, and he released his grip on her waist and took her hand again. They hurried down the trail. She looked back but couldn't see anything, or anybody. What had Bodhi seen? A stream appeared on her left. She remembered it from their hike earlier this afternoon. The stream fed the first waterfall. Yes, they were getting closer. The trail got more defined and there weren't quite as many roots or large rocks to stumble on. Are you okay to run? Bodhi asked. The worry in his voice made the skin on the back of her neck tingle. She still hadn't heard or seen anyone, but she could just feel it. Someone was stalking them. Sure. He released her hand and they took off at a fast pace. Julia forced herself not to look over her shoulder and risk tripping on the steep decline. She didn't want to see some nefarious mean men after them anyway, but maybe her imagination was worse than the actual people. Yet Samson had been pretty fierce, and he was Bodhi's friend. What would the other men in his tribe or clan or whatever be like? What would they do to her? Why had she come to this crazy island? The roar of the first waterfall was a welcome sound. They jogged and slid down the trail, and ten minutes later, their picnic spot and Bodhi's glorious truck came into view. She could have kissed the faded red paint of his truck's hood. She looked around the trees but didn't see anyone. Why did it feel like the trees were alive with people bent on hurting her? Bodhi raced to the passenger side, ushered her in, and slammed the door. She'd never been so happy to have a door close behind her. She hurried to buckle up, hoping he'd drive away fast. He ran around, slid in himself, and locked the doors. The truck fired and he backed up and spun around. The evening was deepening around them, and his truck lights automatically turned on. As he spun, the lights illuminated shadows stepping out of the trees. Julia screamed. Ten, no, twenty men stood against the tree line. None of them wore anything but jeans or shorts. They were all strong, big, and intimidating as all get-out. Most held weapons of some sort. Julia ducked her head under the dash. It's okay. Bodhi said, his voice reassuring. But how could he protect her if these men advanced on them? Bodhi gunned the engine and they shot off along the trail. Julia couldn't stop herself from peeking out of the side window, pressing her face into the glass, staring at the men lining the streets. Several of the men raised their guns to them, waving their weapons mockingly as they drove past but at least they weren't storming the truck. The last man she saw was Bodhi's friend Samson. He gave her a tilt of his chin and then turned and strode back into the trees. They bounced over the trail. Julia's heart pounded and she couldn't catch a full breath. Were they safe? Would they get away? Bodhi clung to the steering wheel with both hands. Julia clutched the door handle closed her eyes, and prayed desperately that more men wouldn't pop out and block their path, or those men wouldn't shoot them from behind. Had they all had the automatic guns Bodhi had been upset about, or only Samson? Please protect us, she prayed. 
A few minutes of tense silence passed as Bodhi navigated the switchbacks. The air in the truck felt thick, and Bodhi's body was clenched tight as if he were furious. She finally felt safe enough to straighten and lean back against the seat cushion instead of cowering under the dash. Bodhi turned onto the smoother dirt road, and she could see down into the farmlands and the ocean beyond. Maybe they'd make it back. Are you okay? He asked. She nodded, unable to form coherent words yet. They had no right to scare you like that. He glanced at her. Rest assured that Kingston, Alaric, and I will pay the dissenters a visit tomorrow and they'll know exactly how wrong their actions were. If I would have been alone, I would have... His voice trailed off, and he stared at her in concern. All that matters is that you're all right. Thank you, she managed to get out, wringing her hands together, unable to calm down even as they put more distance between themselves and the terrifying men in those picturesque mountains. Will you get my cell phone out of the glove box, please? He asked. Sure. Most people she knew carried their cell phones everywhere with them. She opened the glove box with fumbling fingers and found an antiquated Android phone. She handed it over. Thank you. He slowed down and pressed on the phone and then on a recent number. Alaric, he greeted his brother. I need to meet with you. I'll be back to the castle in less than an hour. He paused. I also need you to up your patrols and have them watch for dissenters. He glanced at Julia. I'll explain when I see you. I also need one of your best men outside of Julia's cottage tonight. Another pause. Thank you. He handed her back the phone, and then his grip on the steering wheel relaxed a fraction. He lifted his right arm and gestured to her. Come here. Julia didn't need to be asked twice. She stowed the phone in the glove box, undid her seatbelt, slid over, and leaned against his shoulder. He wrapped his hand around her upper arm. With trembling fingers, she did up the middle seatbelt. It's okay, he soothed. They were just trying to intimidate you. They won't come after us. They wouldn't dare mess with Kingston, Alaric, or any of our military. I'm sorry I exposed you to that. I have never seen any of them act like that before. Do they just hate outsiders? He swallowed and then muttered. Yes, but there's something else going on. Samson shouldn't have had that gun. I need to talk to Alaric. We'll pay Samson a visit he isn't going to like. She shuddered. He hugged her closer and his warmth and strength seeped into her. She felt like she knew and trusted him better than any man she'd ever been around, besides her own dad and brother. What kind of mess was she in? Suddenly, bringing tourists to this island didn't feel very smart. More like a Jurassic Park experience. The ride seemed to fly by as she was comforted by Bodhi's arm around her, until her mind replayed each terrifying moment. How would she sleep tonight? Would Bodhi think she was the biggest wimp ever if she asked to fly home tomorrow? Night was deepening as the lights of the castle, church, and town came into view. The glow of civilization brought some comfort. Those men wouldn't dare pursue her into town, would they? Her eyes darted around, waiting for Samson to jump out of the shadows and haul her up to the volcano. Bodhi parked in front of her cottage and hurried around to escort her out of the truck. He walked her to her door and waited while she unlocked the front door. Do you mind if I walk through your cottage? He asked. 
her worries ramped up again. Those men couldn't have beaten them here. Did he think they had contacts in town who had broken into her cottage and were waiting to attack her? Or maybe the way the dissenters had acted had flipped him out as well, and he thought people from town who'd seen the redhead earlier were waiting to jab her with knives. I'd appreciate it, she managed. He escorted her into the small living room, then checked in the kitchen, two bedrooms, and bathroom. When he came back, he nodded. All clear. I knew it would be. They wouldn't come here. Julia stared at him. If he knew it would be clear, why had he checked? I wanted to reassure you so you can rest. He answered the question himself. Don't worry. I'll have Alaric alert the guards, and they will patrol around the city, and one will be stationed outside your cottage. Her eyes widened. He wanted her not to worry, but guards patrolling and stationed to watch over her sounded like he was worried. Would those men truly despise an outsider enough to not only try to scare her, but actually come after her? You'll be okay? He asked. She nodded. What else was she supposed to do? She was more than tempted to call her brother and have him arrange travel to get her out of here. Bodhi stepped in and wrapped his arms around her. Being in his arms made her fears settle, and she shoved the worries over those men being a danger to the back of her mind. She wrapped her arms around his strong back and held on, just now realizing he'd never put his shirt back on. Bodhi? He glanced down at her. Yes? Did you mean what you said to Samson about me being your girlfriend? That should have been the least of either of their concerns. Her question was not only ill-timed, but sounded immature and silly. She needed to know where they stood, if he was truly committed to Grace, or if they had a chance to develop something. He would have kissed her at that waterfall if not for Samson's interruption. She waited for his answer with bated breath. If he was interested in her, She'd brave dissenters and whatever else this island might throw at her for the chance to get to know him better. Bodhi studied her and his face softened in a smile. He gently trailed his fingers over her cheek. I need to talk to Grace and explain to her that I've met someone who has flipped my world upside down. That is, if you don't feel like running screaming from Magna, Julia melted under his touch and the warmth of his dark gaze. He did feel for her like she did for him. The only problem was, and she couldn't admit it to him, but she was more tempted to run screaming from this scenic, picturesque, interesting, absolutely terrifying place. Chapter 8 Bodhi's head spun and anger made his shoulders tight. He stewed about everything from how invested and protective he already felt of Julia to how ticked he was at Samson and his friends. How dare they try to scare Julia like that? He doubted they would come into town to threaten or hurt her, but he wasn't taking any risks with her safety. He could hardly wait to gather some troops and go have a talk with those men. He wanted them to know, in no uncertain terms, that they couldn't bully or intimidate people, especially Julia. The bigoted jerks. They only saw her as an outsider because of her red hair. Julia was so much more than a redhead from America, or even the solution to helping his kingdom financially. She was a bright light he hadn't known he needed in his life. Had he brought her into a battle that could endanger her? He wished he could have stayed with her, 
but he needed to find Alaric and figure out what was going on with the dissenters. The group had always been comprised of families who wanted to feel rebellious, but his father had never given them any reason to launch a rebellion. They were welcome anywhere in Magna, and the military and royal family never tried to push anything on anyone. Something was upsetting them, though, and he and his family needed to get to the bottom of it. He hoped Julia being here wasn't the catalyst that would make everything explode. He'd waited until the guard had shown up to watch over Julia, explained to the man how important his job was, then rushed to the castle. Now he hurried through his family's suites and rapped on Alaric's door. Alaric swung it wide and gestured him inside. Once they reached the age of 18, each of the royal family members had their own suite with a small living room and kitchen area, and a larger bedroom and bathroom. If they got married, they could have the option of staying in their suite or finding their own residence in town or in the country. None of his siblings or cousins were anywhere close to marriage, so it worked out well being in close quarters with the option to shut the family out when needed. What's going on? Alaric demanded before the door was even closed. Samson and a bunch of his idiotic buddies acting up. They shadowed Julia and I down from the waterfall. Bodhi paced in front of his brother. I don't think she realized they were there. You know how good Samson is at tracking. When I spun the truck around, they all stepped out of the trees. It terrified her. If I was alone, I would have thrashed each one of them, but I couldn't risk one of them hurting her. His anger made his words tumble over each other. Samson had an M2 Browning. Where would he get one of those? The other men had pistols or rifles, which most people in Magna had. Alaric's eyes widened. I have no idea. I'll check with Kingston and our arms manager. Any loss of weapons should have been reported. Did you speak to them? Only to Samson. Alaric's jaw tightened. Kingston had been livid after Samson, one of his most trusted men and fiercest fighters, withdrew from the army six years ago. Only Alaric, Samson, and Kingston knew the reason. Some mused it had to do with a woman. Addie claimed it had to do with their sweet cousin Constance. Bodhi hadn't felt right asking about it. Every time Samson was brought up, both Alaric and Kingston got suspiciously quiet and their jaws and fists got tight. He was obviously upset about Julia being on the island. He told me I was naive and to get back to my sheltered castle said others wouldn't be so understanding about an outsider. Alaric gestured him to the couch. Bodhi felt too stirred up and angry to sit, but he heaved himself down. Alaric sank down in a chair across from him and leaned forward, bracing his elbows on his thighs. I will deal with Samson, figure out where he got the weapon from and remove their source and the weapon. He frowned. It had better only be the one weapon. I want to come with you to deal with Samson. He had no right to terrify her like that. Have you had word that the dissenters are stirring up contention? No, but they're always on the edge. Especially Samson. Especially after Kingston... He let his words trail off pushed out a heavy breath, and leaned back against the chair. Honestly, Bodhi, what did you think would happen? You brought a redhead to Magna. Bodhi straightened, anger flashing through him. I didn't think my own brother would be prejudiced against her. I have no issue with outsiders, or redheads, but you know there are many on the island who don't feel the same. Some. Bodhi corrected. Only the dissenters, the zealots, and some older people set in their ways. 
Most of our people want to move into the 21st century. They want reliable internet, new clothing and vehicles, job opportunities, medicine and vaccines, and other life-saving devices. I know you want to update weapons, machinery, vehicles, air and water support. Alaric nodded. He couldn't disagree with any of that. We have to make money to do any of that. That's why Julia is here. Tourism? Alaric guessed. Yes. You're going to have a battle on your hands. Bodhi knew that. Will you be on my side? There was a struggle going on in Alaric's eyes, but finally he tilted his head regally. Yes, but only because I know it's the only option at this time. Alaric excelled at fighting. The joust, the sword, archery, hand-to-hand -hand combat, he shone at all of it. They'd all teased him he should have been born a thousand years ago. He didn't like change or seek out anyone beyond his military brothers and his own family. Thank you. I suppose Miss Adams and her plans are the subject of the economics meeting in the morning? Alaric asked. Yes. Why did you bring her here before gaining approval? Quinn and I brought her here first so she could evaluate and see if our ideas had merit before we caused a stir, and so Uncle Zoltan couldn't shoot the idea down before it began. He smiled fractionally. We contacted her brother's marketing agency in Miami, Florida, and requested his best person for the job. He sent Julia. Julia. She was incredible, and he felt another protective surge for her. If only she could still be cradled in his arms. Julia being here was the right thing to do, for his country and possibly for the two of them. They would move forward with their plans despite the upset over Samson and his men this afternoon. Alaric would deal with Samson and his crew, even though Bodhi would prefer to do it himself, and he and Julia could spend every minute together working on the tourism plans and, if he was very lucky, falling in love. So you didn't ask for a redhead to come and stir up the entire island? That was simply who the man sent? Alaric asked, raising an eyebrow. Yes, but I'm glad she has red hair, and even happier it's Julia. It's time to challenge old prejudices and step into progress to help our people find new ways to succeed. Julia is incredible, smart, and has great ideas. She can help us make the break into tourism, and we have a lot of unique aspects here that will allow us to succeed. From there, maybe we can expand to other industries. He'd heard many people in the world worked at home from their own computers. It was unfathomable, but would open so many doors for his people. Alaric considered all of this. How did you pay for her to come? Bodhi hated that it always came back to money, or their lack of it. Quinn saved most of the money he made working nights as a waiter during his university time. Alaric smiled. Sly dog. I didn't know he made money during those years. Father would blow a gasket. Bodhi smiled too. Their father believed in hard work, and they'd often worked in the fields or the shops as children and youth to teach them to work hard, but his son waiting tables in a London pub simply to save money? He wouldn't like that. Mostly because of the sting to his pride. Their family and country had lived frugally since the gold veins stopped appearing in the mines, but they were dangerously close to depleting their stores completely. You think Miss Adams's ideas will work, and our kingdom and people can start progressing again? Bodhi nodded seriously. Alaric stood and offered his hand. Then I'll be behind you. Bodhi shook his hand. 
You just want new guns, and a tank," he added with a laugh. They walked to the door, and I think you just want a certain redhead around. Watch it. But Bodie couldn't be too upset. His brother was right. He wanted to spend more time with Julia, a lot more. He wanted to hold her in his arms without worrying about Grace or being interrupted. He pulled the door open, his hand still on the doorknob, when Alaric asked in a very serious tone, "Have you spoken to Grace?" Bodhi glanced at his brother, seeing the hint of a challenge in his dark gaze. "No, but I will. Even though our parents want us wed." I don't think either of us has romantic feelings toward the other. The smile that crossed Alaric's face was brighter than any smile he'd ever seen from his serious, competitive, tough brother. Did he have feelings toward Grace? Before Bodie could ask or tease, Alaric slapped him on the shoulder. "Thank you for coming to me." I've added patrols and will have at least one guard watching Miss Adams's cottage until Kingston and I can find Sampson and get to the bottom of his threats and the gun. After our meeting in the morning, Bodie reminded him, "Yes, I wish I could come with you to confront them. I can't remember the last time I was so angry." Samson threatening Julia and scaring her like that was uncalled for and petty. He's always had this odd chip on his shoulder, but I wouldn't have thought he'd treat anyone like he did Julia today. Samson is passionate and volatile, to say the least, and you know what happens when a woman is involved. Julia, no, the deal with, never mind, what woman? Bodie had never asked, but he never had an opening this good. Alaric shook his head, his eyes now wary. He obviously had a secret, and it was a burden. That's between Samson and Kingston. Bodie's own eyes widened. He thought highly of his cousin Kingston, and they'd all grown up as close friends. Of course, they'd all dated different girls and women. But he'd never seen his oldest cousin act interested in any particular woman. Obviously, Samson and Kingston had fought over a woman, but why weren't either of them with her now? His parents and aunt and uncle were always bemoaning that none of them were married yet. But with the kingdom in more financial trouble with each passing year, the focus hadn't been on romance or love. Alaric tilted his chin up and smirked. Leave the fighting to the real men. You focus on your ideas and making money. Bodhi shoved him, getting in a quick jab to his brother's abdomen. Alaric spun and had him in a headlock before he knew what happened. Bodhi struggled, but Alaric humiliatingly rubbed his knuckles across his head, more irritating than painful. He jabbed his elbow back into Alaric's gut, dropped to his knees, and scrambled away from him. Standing, Bodhi taunted, "Military expert and big brother can still get away." Alaric rushed him and shoved him out the door. Bodhi stumbled but kept his footing, turning to face Alaric and see if he wanted more. "Come back when you're ready for a real fight," Alaric goaded. But he was smiling. He always enjoyed a brotherly brawl. Bodie put his hands up. An hour ago, he would have been happy to fight anyone, even his brother, who always beat him. But his anger had diffused now that Julia was safe, and he knew Alaric was on his side. How about a joust, archery competition, or sword fight Saturday at the town party? He challenged. He'd lose, but he wanted Julia to see some of the activities in person, if she was still here on Saturday. He prayed she would be. You truly are a humble one. I'd never want my girl to see me lose. 
If only you had a girl, Bodie grinned. But you're right. I'll go challenge Darian instead. You and Kingston can battle it out. Alaric laughed and raised a hand. Good night, brother. Bodie tilted his chin and walked away. He felt much better about everything, and his mind was spinning about how he could spend more time with Julia. He was tempted to go back to her cottage right now, but she'd had a long day, and he thought it best to let her rest. He wouldn't rush her, but he'd never been so interested in a woman. He'd find Grace and make a clean break. Soon, he and Julia would have more time together. Chapter Nine. Julia spent one of the most miserable nights of her life questioning why she'd ever thought coming here was a good idea. Every time she fell asleep, she awoke with nightmares of the dissenters arriving to storm the town. Samson in the lead. They'd kidnap her, carry her up the mountainside, and sacrifice her to the volcano. She lay awake after each round of nightmares. Panicking at the slightest noise and clinging to her phone until she realized there was no 911 service, she wished Bodie would come back. But at least she spotted the guard outside every time she moved the curtains to check. She debated calling Justin, but she didn't want to fail him on this job, and she didn't want to worry him either. He was a protective older brother and wouldn't take kindly to her being threatened. The sun peeked through the curtains, and she put a hand over her eyes, not certain she wanted to face this day. Yesterday had been a roller coaster of excitement and visions of success, and then slamming down to an awful reality of the terror of Samson and those other men who obviously didn't want her here. She couldn't help but remember walking through town and the murmurs of red hair. Some people in town had been leery and avoided her. She tried to focus on the kind, welcoming people. Bodhi at the top of that list. Should she stay here and fight to get to know him better, replace his doctor as his girlfriend, and make these ideas a success, or should she run for the closest boat or airplane and escape this stuck-in-the-past, somewhat disturbing island? She prayed to know what she should do. A loud rap on her front door interrupted her prayer. Was this her answer? Rushing to the door, she swung it wide. Bodie stood on the step, wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and running shoes. He had a broad, welcoming smile on his lips, but his expression turned to surprise as his eyes traveled over her tank top and pajama shorts. She tugged at the hem of her shorts. They didn't cover much of her legs, but she had been sleeping for heaven's sake. What are you doing? I uh. He passed a hand over his face. I wondered if you wanted to jog this morning. I came to run with you so you'd know you were safe. She folded her arms under her chest, and his eyes snapped to her face. Go jog. You want to pretend as if the dissenters aren't going to come after me, and nothing awful happened yesterday? He swallowed. My brother Alaric and cousin Kingston will take care of Samson and the dissenters. You are safe here, Julia, and I really, really hope you'll stay. He stared at her, awaiting her answer as if she held the keys to the universe. She blinked at him. She thought about her prayer. She thought about the time with him yesterday. She'd enjoyed each experience, except the interactions with Samson and crew. Yet even then, Bodie had put her first, getting her to safety when he'd admitted to her he would have rather stayed and faced those men. She wanted more time with him too. She wanted to help him and his people have a viable income with tourism in a unique and incredible way. Julia had always loved a challenge. A smile stole over her lips, and she nodded. Let's go running. Turning, she sashayed toward the bedroom. Does that mean you'll stay? He asked. She glanced back over her shoulder. We'll see. 
His answering smile was confident and radiant. He knew he had her. She didn't mind. She hurried to get dressed and drank some delicious water right from the tap. She'd never known tap water could taste so good. Bodhi had stayed outside and was talking with the guard when she left the cottage. His eyes took her in and his smile grew until it seemed to beam brighter than the sun. He wanted her here. Even if the rest of Magna hated redheads, she would stay to bask in that smile, to simply be with Bodhi. Thank you, Bodhi told the guard. The man inclined his chin to her and strode off toward the towering castle. Julia forced herself to stop staring at Bodhi and look over the beautiful town, castle, and church gleaming in the morning sun. The towering mountains in the near distance provided a gorgeous backdrop to it all. She sighed. It's so beautiful here. You're so beautiful, Bodhi said. She looked back at him. He was beautiful, but she wasn't about to say that. I don't think we are that friendly. His eyebrows lifted. Too early to give you gushing compliments about your beauty, your intellect, the light that shines from you, your incredible appeal? She bit her lip to hide a smile. Far too early. Okay, he chuckled. I'll take it slow. What did that mean to him? Did Julia really want him to take it slow? She was still confused and a bit frustrated about the events of yesterday. She was in no position to be flirting with and encouraging this man, a prince to boot, but it was hard to stop. She needed to focus on her job here. She wasn't staying, and even if they fell in love, she doubted that Bodhi would relocate to Florida. Pushing away the worries, she walked around the side of the house and to the beach. Bodhi fell into step beside her. They moved into a slow jog, neither of them in a hurry this morning. The sun sparkled off the water and she blinked at the brightness. The tang of salt and the warmth of humidity in the air were as familiar as her home beach in Miami, but the similarities stopped there. There were so many things she didn't understand about this place, and she needed to get a handle on them if she was to achieve success with this venture. Can you tell me the history of your island and people? He gave her an approving look. Of course. The Spanish settled the island around 1000 AD. She hardly noticed the time as they jogged miles down the beach. Bodhi told her stories of a people discovering gold and fighting for their independence, eventually making a treaty with Spain to pay the larger country for their freedom and military support. But how do you protect yourselves now? She asked as they hit a rocky cliff outcropping and in silent agreement turned and jogged back toward her cottage. We had to admit to Spain twenty years ago, when the gold veins disappeared completely, that we couldn't afford to pay for their protection any longer. They graciously agreed to be our allies, and I suppose that's discouraged other countries from invading us. Perhaps the world is more civilized now, or it's possible there's no reason to attack us now that we have no gold. He seemed embarrassed to admit that to her. It's been hard on your family? She guessed. Staring at the long line of coast and ocean in front of them, he nodded. I was young. Not even ten when my father and Uncle Zoltan finally gave up and seized all mining operations. All the people who worked in the mines were suddenly jobless. An entire country reliant on gold and living a high lifestyle suddenly had to tighten their financial belt. The stress was high, and sometimes it feels like it hasn't lessened. They carefully guarded the gold in their stores and have lived much more frugally than anyone would have liked the past twenty years. Even still, the gold stores are almost depleted, and you can see how we've gradually slipped behind the times and stopped progressing at all. Even more worrisome is the lack of money for medicine shipments. 
Can you imagine a child with diabetes who can't receive their insulin? Julia's stomach pitched. That would be a death sentence, and that was only one medication. What about blood pressure or heart medication or other kinds of illnesses that required equipment or drugs? They jogged quietly for a few minutes. Then she said, "I pray I can help your country." I do think tourism is a practical and smart option for all your needs. He glanced askance at her. I'm glad you're here. Julia smiled. They jogged in silence, but she didn't mind it. She liked being with Bodie. She liked him a whole lot. They reached the gap in the undergrowth by her cottage and shimmied through, and then jogged around front. She pulled the key out of her shorts pocket and opened the door. Good luck at your meeting this morning. She felt a sudden rush of nerves. If his meeting didn't go well, if the rest of his family didn't think their idea had merit, she could be heading home. It stung to think of never seeing Bodhi or this magical, unstable place again. Thank you. I will come to you as soon as I know the results. That means a lot. Thank you. I'll be praying for you. That means a lot. Thank you. He mimicked her words, but it wasn't done sarcastically. He clearly meant it. He brushed his fingers tenderly down her cheek. Her skin tingled in response, and she leaned closer to him. Bodhi cupped her cheek with his palm, and his dark eyes deepened. He edged in closer, and she didn't even care that she was sweaty from their run, and her hair was in a haphazard ponytail. She wanted to kiss Bodhi more than she wanted a long drink of cold water from the tap. Bodhi's eyes suddenly clouded, and he eased back. His hand fell away from her face. I need to speak to Grace before I. He cleared his throat. Obviously uncomfortable that he'd interrupted their moment, she stepped back. Her smile wavered, and her body felt rejected and trembly without him close. But she was impressed by him. I think that's very important, and I appreciate the sense of honor you have. Her words were too stiff, but she meant them. He nodded, and then a hint of humor touched his gaze. Some day soon, you and I will be that friendly. She laughed too, feeling even more unsteady from her visions of being that friendly with him. For your sake, I hope so. He chuckled and turned to go. I'll come by as soon as I can. She waved from the doorway and watched him jog along the street and toward the bridge that led to town and then to the castle. Was she really falling for a handsome prince? Who could blame her? A man stepped onto the street, and she startled, pulling back toward the doorframe. The man saluted her, and she recognized the black uniform of the soldier she'd seen last night. "I'm here to watch over you, ma'am," he said kindly. "Thank you," she managed. She lifted a hand in farewell, and then hurried into the cottage. Shutting the door, locking it, and then putting the old-style chain across the door, the guard was a reminder that not all was safe in this kingdom. She wanted to help Magna, and she wanted more time with Bodhi, but she still felt uneasy. She hurried to the shower. She'd get ready, eat something, and start working online, despite the slow internet. To flesh out her marketing plans and decide which travel sites and agencies would get the privilege of booking their first tours, she'd wait to call Justin until Bodie came back with his family's decision. Please let them approve tourism, she prayed. She knew she could help them. She simply had to be brave enough to proceed, even if some not only disliked the red-headed outsider, but might want to cause her harm. The guard outside showed her that Bodhi and his brother believed she might be in danger. At least they would fight to protect her. That was some comfort. Chapter Ten. Bodhi looked to Quinn as the family settled around the massive mahogany table in the main conference room. 
his stomach churned, and he wished he hadn't eaten that omelet after running. Talk settled down more quickly than normal, and their father, King Kendrick, gestured to Quinn. You called this meeting, son. Would you like to conduct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Quinn gestured to his youngest sister. Bell is going to offer the prayer. Everyone bowed their heads. It was one of the many things Bodhi loved about his family. A meeting, planning session, or dinner never started without a prayer. Good-natured Bell, only twenty-two, was the most spiritual of any of them. She offered a sweet invocation, grateful for peace, love in the kingdom, and the many blessings they did have, including clean water and fresh food. She asked they could have clear and open minds for this economic meeting, and proceed in whatever way was best for the people of Magna. Thank you, Quinn said after they all echoed Bell's Amen. Bodhi and I are working together on a venture, but we need approval from all of you before we proceed. Bodhi, can you please tell everyone about Miss Adams and why we have brought her to Magna? You brought an outsider to Magna? Duke Zoltan raised his eyebrows. The redhead I've been hearing rumors about? Yes, sir, Bodhi nodded. He told Julia how friendly his uncle was, but he didn't look too friendly at the moment. Why would you do that? The people won't like it. Bodhi stood. With all respect, Uncle Zoltan, it's time we let go of old prejudices and let the old ways go. The gold reserves are almost gone, and we can't just let our country stagnate and die. We have to move forward and create opportunity for success, to import the essential items we need and have the ability to upgrade everything, from our weapons to our vehicles to our homes. Zoltan leaned back, shock filling his eyes at Bodhi's boldness. What are you proposing, son? His dad asked when Zoltan didn't speak. Bodhi decided to hit it head on. Tourism. He dared to utter the word that many considered a curse word, and predictably an explosion occurred. Bodhi waited, still standing as the indignant voices undulated and grew, Adelaide's ringing out louder than most. Of course Quinn is supporting this, their sister said. He's been belly aching about how behind we are and how we need new blood coming to Magna since he returned from the university. Leia agreed, as if Magna and all of us aren't good enough for him. Quinn raised his shoulders. They were all used to Adelaide's opinions and Leia's snippiness and didn't let either rile them. It's not about that, Quinn insisted. It's about medicine, opportunity, and our people finding success. Not for me. Darian interjected. It's about new women. You're a pig, Leia threw at him. There were other arguments brewing, and Bodhi wondered how long they'd discuss before settling. It was quicker than he'd planned on. Maybe ten minutes, and then the rumbling decreased and finally died. The silence became almost deafening as everyone turned to him again. He looked around the table. Grateful no one was screaming for a vote yet. At the moment, he might only have Quinn, Alaric, and the hilarious Darian in his corner. Darian would only want tourism because he was always bemoaning he needed more women to add to his dating pool. Bodhi leaned forward, planting his hands on the table and looking around the room. We've explored every option to create jobs and strengthen our economy. Shipping is too expensive and slow for any kind of produce to be sold. We use all of what we grow to feed our own people anyway, because of outdated farm equipment and the inability to import much beyond the essentials. They all knew this but it was important everyone be concentrated on their lack of opportunity and their need for growth. 
The sad truth is, there is nothing unique about what we make or grow, except for our country itself. Magna is unique. They call us the Hidden Kingdom. We want to stay hidden, Kingston grumbled. Leia and Adelaide nodded their agreement. Bodhi understood why Kingston wouldn't want to deal with the headache and dangers of tourists, as he was the general of the military and police, and keeping the dissenters happy was always rough. He chose to ignore them for a moment and press his advantage. We have much to offer tourists, people who would be willing to pay top dollar to come to our beautiful island, explore its unique, untouched beauty. Take part in or watch jousting, sword fighting, archery, shop in our quaint shops and our Saturday outdoor market, attend our picturesque church on Sunday, and stay in a castle. What? Stay in our home? His mother exploded. More unsure murmurs sounded around the table. Mother, Quinn started before Bodhi could. The castle is massive and opulent. We have entire wings that aren't even being used. Only because none of you will get married and make us grandbabies, Aunt Natalia said. Exactly, the Queen agreed. Bodhi and Quinn exchanged a look. Here they went. Bodhi felt an odd pang for Julia. Maybe the family wouldn't have liked it. And maybe it would have been overwhelming for her, but he wished she was standing by his side, helping him explain, sharing her enthusiasm and ideas. She was a bright spot in any room, and he missed her right now. Before the discussion gets going in different directions, Bodhi said, "Let me say that bringing in tourism dollars will allow us to stretch the remaining gold even further." Ensuring none of our children, sick or elderly, go without essential medicines and vaccines, he paused, and everyone looked a little ashamed. Nobody wanted a child to die without insulin, an elderly person not to get their blood pressure medication, or polio or whooping cough to flare up because they couldn't afford vaccines. We also need to update computers, internet. Farming equipment, military equipment, we will be able to give our people opportunities to work or sell their non-perishable products online and ship by slow boat, as well as the money that will come immediately to the shops from the tourists. You all know we have incredible singers, artists, and writers who could be successful if they had the opportunity to get their books. Songs, paintings, sculptures, jewelry, or photography online or in front of tourists. Everyone was quiet for a blessed moment as they considered his words. Bodhi looked around the room. There are so many possibilities if we can just start earning the money and opening up our country to outsiders. There are dangers as well, the king said quietly. I know, but I believe Kingston and Alaric can keep a few tourists under control. We can't protect our people from the modern world forever. It may set off the dissenters and the zealots, Kingston pointed out. Alaric and Bodhi exchanged a look. Had he and Kingston already talked? Most likely. Should they share Samson and his men's antics right now? Probably not. It could, Bodhi agreed. But I feel it's a risk we have to take. None of us want to see our great country decline to third world standards, and if we don't act, it's a possibility. I, for one, like toothpaste and other items we can only import. Surprisingly, no one argued. Though he heard a few huffed breaths and even some soft laughter at his toothpaste comment, I haven't been able to come up with any other financial solution. Bodhi continued, "If any of you have one, I'd love to hear it. But today we are voting on this issue, 
so either Miss Adams can go home. That thought stabbed at his heart. He didn't want to lose her. Or she can start booking tourists on trips to our island. He sat down and let the discussion begin. Sometimes it was organized. Sometimes it was muttering. Sometimes it was shouting. As an hour wore on, with a lot of talk but no solutions or viable ideas besides his own, he wondered what Julia was doing. He could picture her beautiful blue eyes and that thick, dark red hair. He closed his eyes briefly and said a prayer: "Please, if it be Thy will, let this work. Let Julia stay. Let the family and our people accept this." And let us help our country thrive again, Bodie. Quinn's voice interrupted his prayer. He looked up and realized everyone was staring at him, sleeping. Darian joked, praying. Bodie admitted. Bell sat to his left. She put her hand over his. This means a lot to you, she said quietly. I don't see another solution. Bodie said, "I want our people to experience success again. I'm tired of the hopelessness creeping in. Some of our people have died because we don't have the medical advancements and medicines they need. Almost as bad, their dreams are dying, or maybe they don't even know what to dream about beyond the life they know. If they personally choose not to progress, that's fine." But to not have the opportunity is heart-wrenching. We're the only ones who can make the changes to ensure they stay as healthy as possible, and to help them prosper again. His father watched him carefully. As you were praying, Quinn announced it was time to put it to a vote. Do you have anything else you'd like to say, son? Bodie glanced around the table. Meeting the gaze of each family member in turn, he loved them. They were good people who wanted what was best for Magna and her people. Throughout the years, I haven't heard any solutions besides tourism that will bring prosperity and hope to our people. Some will hate the idea of outsiders coming in, but many will recognize it as a positive thing and will love welcoming new friends to this incredible island. This is the solution to progress toward new technology, success, and new life for our people. He could have talked about it all day, but he stopped himself and nodded to Quinn. Let's vote, Quinn said. All for allowing Miss Julia Adams to book tourists to come to our island and stimulate our economy. Please raise your hand. Bodie, Alaric, Quinn, Constance, Bell, and Darian's hands went up immediately. Bodie needed at least seven for a majority. He clenched his free fist and prayed. His father and mother looked at each other, and something passed between them. Then, as one, they lifted their right hands high into the air. Bodhi loved his parents completely. He hoped some day to have a love story like theirs. Bodhi wanted to punch a fist in the air, but the silence was tense, as were the looks between Uncle Zoltan and the King. Adelaide stared at him. Was his sister violently opposed or more indecisive? He wasn't sure, but Adelaide usually had a strong opinion about everything. If she wasn't supportive, she was opposed. His father nodded, and everyone's hands lowered. Yes, Darian crowed. Tell Miss Adams to fill the first plane with all the single ladies. Kingston shot him an irritated look, but most everyone else laughed. Bodie didn't need or want any single lady besides Julia. How soon could he run to her and tell her the good news? Would she let him hug her, kiss her? The king looked to Bodie. This will be your project, with Miss Adams. But I'll expect reports for Zoltan, Quinn, Kingston, and I. Bodie nodded. 
His father looked around the room. The majority has voted, and I expect all of you to get behind this idea and be supportive. We will put it to the people on Saturday, so there's still a chance it won't happen. But I believe it can and should. If Bodhi asks something of you, please do it promptly. If someone asks you about the outsiders coming, spin it in a positive light, no matter your personal feelings. When the tourists come, we will be friendly and welcoming. We must be united, or this will fail. Bodhi is right in what he has said today. We must progress or continue to wither and regress in medicine and every kind of technology. Eventually, we will be a shell of the proud people we once were, unhealthy and miserable. Those words settled, and Bell and Leia nodded. The king looked to Adelaide. I want you to be Bodhi's assistant on this project. No, Adelaide breathed out. Father, is that the best choice? Bodhi interjected. He'd love to have Bell, Constance, or even Darian help him and Julia. Adelaide was too opinionated. She hadn't supported his idea, so she obviously didn't like it. Adelaide is the best choice. She will help you and Miss Adams. With her work ethic and determination. This project will have even more chance of success. Adelaide looked petulant, but she didn't protest. Bodhi nodded to his father. All right. The meeting adjourned, and everyone stood, talking and milling around. Quinn approached and slapped him on the shoulder. Here we go, eh? Bodhi grinned. They'd done it. Now they needed to win the people to his and Julia's ideas and keep the dissenters from rebelling. There were dangers and drawbacks to welcoming tourism, but they needed the money and they needed to bring new life and new blood to this island. Thank you for your support. Quinn had financed the cost of Julia's travel and wages from his hard-earned money, and he'd also given Bodie his emotional support. His brother was smart and had seen more of the world than any of them besides Kingston and their own father. Of course, I believe in anything you pitch to me. Quinn grinned. They both knew that wasn't true. Quinn had been vying to invite outsiders in since he returned from Cambridge. He was worried about the health and progress of their people as well. Tell Julia hi for me. I will. Bodhi suddenly wanted nothing more than to run to Julia's cottage, tell her the great news, swing her in his arms, and kiss her. Dang, he couldn't kiss her until he broke off his unofficial engagement to Grace. He also needed to talk to two of his siblings. He angled for Alaric first. His younger brother nodded a greeting and said in an undertone. Kingston and I have twenty trusted men waiting, and we'll head out within an hour. We'll get to the bottom of Samson's weapon and his obstinance. We have no choice with the way things are progressing, right? He smiled. He was clearly happy for Bodhi that his plan had passed. Thank you. Bodhi shook his hand, still wishing he could be there to face down Samson. Maybe he should have taken the military position when it was offered to him, but it fit Alaric, and Bodhi loved the business side of things. Alaric clasped his hand, then turned and strode from the room. Bodhi got a hug from his mother before finding his sister, Adelaide. He said quietly, "Thank you for being willing to work with me." Adelaide coolly appraised him. Her dark eyes told a story of frustration, and her pretty brows wrinkled. I don't think I had much choice. He arched his brows. That's true. Several seconds ticked by. He didn't know if he should beg, promise her chocolate, or remind her that their father had said everyone was to get behind his idea. 
Her beautiful smile stole over her face, and Bodhi wondered how she fought the men off. But you know I love you, and your projects aren't always failures. I'll help you make this one a success. Thank you, sis. He enveloped her in a hug. She returned it, and he felt more optimistic than he had when the vote came through eight to four. If Adelaide was on his side, they had every indication of immense success. What could go wrong now? Nothing. It was time to get to Julia. Chapter Eleven. Julia cursed the turtle speed of the internet as she tried to distract herself from daydreaming about Bodhi by working while she waited. She was getting nothing done, and she couldn't stop picturing his smile, his deep brown eyes, and him teasing her about being that friendly. Opening her camera roll, she let herself stare at the pictures of him without his shirt on by the scenic waterfall for far too long. He was much more scenic than the waterfall. She gave up trying to work and closed her laptop. Walking out the rear patio door barefoot, she walked across the grass and slipped through the hedge. She hit the sand and let the squishy wonderfulness ooze between her toes. The sun on her face and the rhythmic rolling waves calmed her, but didn't stop her daydreams or visions of Bodhi. Stopping on the dry sand just out of tide's reach, she faced the ocean and took some long, slow breaths. It would be all right. It would work out the way God wanted it to, and that was what mattered. But she was sick at the thought of Bodhi not winning the vote and her having to leave him. Last night, she'd been ready to run from here, but in the light of day, she couldn't stand the thought of not spending more time with him. She closed her eyes and prayed for enlightenment and understanding to do his will, despite what she so desperately wanted. As she opened her eyes, she could only focus on what she wanted: to stay here, some day soon kiss Bodhi. And on an unselfish note, help his people. The waves lapped on the beach. Julia was amazed by the quiet, scenic beauty. Did the people here not lay on the sand on a warm afternoon or play in the waves? If they had perfect weather all year round, maybe they were bored of frolicking at the beach. Maybe they were working too hard to sustain life to be able to enjoy the sand and the surf. A worrisome question popped into her mind: Would she ruin this place by bringing noisy tourists with beach chairs, coolers of pop and beer, music booming, and boogie boards decorating the ocean? It would change the peaceful spot, but change was often a part of life. She'd been invited here. It wasn't as if she was imposing the change on them. Julia, Bodie's deep voice called to her from the opening in the hedge at the back of the cottage. Julia spun, hearing his voice and seeing him made her body tremble with anticipation. When she saw the broad grin on his face, she squealed and clapped her hands together. They approved. He nodded. And then they were running for each other. The sand was thick and slowed her down, but she gave it her all. Bodhi dodged through the greenery, reached her, and lifted her off the ground, swinging her around. She laughed happily. He gazed up at her. His dark eyes filled with only her, and she didn't know when she'd ever been this happy, excited, and invested. She was invested in Bodhi. In this project and in his people, the spinning slowed, and his smile changed to a serious, smoldering look. He gently lowered her to her feet, his chest brushing hers. She was ninety-eight percent certain she was about to experience the best kiss of her life. Bodhi's deep brown gaze pinned her in place as his strong arms held her against him. He lowered his head, and she arched up. Her heart raced. This was it.
The project was important, but at this moment, Bodhi was all that mattered. Julia could only thank the good Lord that she'd been brought here to meet him. Their lips grew closer. Her breath shortened in anticipation as her stomach did a flip-flop. At the last instant, Bodhi turned his head and her lips brushed the soft hair of his beard. Julia gasped in shock and disappointment. What the crap was that? She demanded, trying to pull free from his arms. Had he really turned his head, rejected her kiss, and ruined their incredible moment? Bodhi chuckled, but there was no mirth in it. He pressed his lips to the sensitive spot right below her ear and murmured, I'm so sorry. There's nothing I'd rather be doing besides kissing you, but... She pulled back enough to meet his gaze, understanding tempering her frustration. You haven't talked to Grace yet? I'm sorry, he said, and he looked it. It's been a little busy. She swallowed and forced her own desires away. He had been busy, and she wouldn't force him to talk to Grace. She could only hope next time the perfect kiss opportunity arose, he'd had the opportunity to break off his sort of engagement. Remembering that he was committed to another woman, even if he didn't want to be, pulled her back to reality. She stepped back and his arms fell away from her. I can't wait to hear all about the meeting, she said stiffly, hating the instant distance between them not just physically, but emotionally. And then let's get to work. He studied her. I will talk to Grace. You know that, right? She didn't know that a big discussion about the topic would change anything. Either she trusted that he would talk to Grace, or she begged him to go find the woman right now, which was silly. It was a Tuesday morning, and Grace was probably working. She felt pity for Grace. To think you were committed to a man like Bodhi and then lose that would be heart-wrenching. Maybe she should be feeling bad for herself. She had no commitment from Bodhi, but the look in those incredible eyes said he was interested in her. Very interested. At the same time, maybe she needed to be the one to step back. No matter how impressive Bodhi was, she wouldn't uproot her life to stay in a hidden kingdom because she'd spent one day with him. There were more obstacles between them than she wanted to think about. She forced a smile. She should be unselfish and tell him not to talk to Grace. Julia was the interloper here. Yet, as she looked into his eyes, she couldn't make herself do it. I'm sure it will work out the way it should, Bodhi. She touched his arm and warmth filled her. Let's focus on the project and not worry about the rest right now. He looked like he wanted to argue, but she turned and started walking toward her cottage. He fell into step beside her. You said you have an internet booster at the castle? I can't work with 2G internet. He laughed, but it was uneasy. There was a funky tension between them that she didn't like. There is a booster at the castle, in the library. We'll be able to work there now that we've got the approval. Oh, good. I was afraid I'd have to go old school and do everything through phone calls. Now tell me about the meeting. He held the back door for her and escorted her to the couch. They sat side by side and he started talking. She pulled out her laptop and took notes while he spoke. Julia was happy to be working on this project, but really, really wishing she could focus on her and Bodhi. There would be a time and a place for that. Someday. Maybe. She hated maybes and somedays. Bodhi didn't like the tension between him and Julia. Was she upset they hadn't kissed, or upset he hadn't talked to Grace? He longed to interrupt their work and go find Grace, 
wherever she was, and formally break off their unofficial engagement. Then he'd come back and kiss Julia long and hard. His neck grew heated at the thought. Julia was all business. They chatted through how the meeting had gone and then turned to a list of tasks they needed to work through. He forced himself to focus on this project and put his personal feelings aside, but every look and accidental touch was sweet torture. They loaded up her laptop and walked to the castle together. As they walked through town, he heard low murmurs of the redhead. He wanted to confront his people about prejudging someone based on nothing besides their hair color but he also noticed many of his people responding to Julia's beautiful and friendly smile. The baker was outside and insisted they each take a fresh blueberry muffin. They thanked him and savored the soft treat, not speaking as they crossed the drawbridge and approached the castle doors. They went straight through the grand doors that were always open during daylight hours. Bodhi appreciated that the doors and the drawbridge were open and the castle was accessible to any of his people. They went to the castle library on the second floor, the best internet connection on the island. Bodhi texted Adelaide to please come to the library while Julia logged on to the internet. She tapped away like crazy on her computer while he fidgeted, stared at her smooth cheek and longed to touch it, and waited for Adelaide. He wished he had a nice laptop of his own. He could be researching things on the internet or responding to emails like she was. He wished he had Julia's attention. The door swung open with a bang, announcing Adelaide's presence. Adelaide did everything big. She flounced in. Bodie and Julia stood to meet her. Julia Adams, my sister. Princess Adelaide Magnum. The two women shook hands and Bodhi didn't sense any animosity on Adelaide's part. He let out a breath of relief. Adelaide had said she'd get on board, and she had. Thank you for coming all this way to help us, Adelaide said. It's my pleasure. This island and everything I've seen is incredible. A shadow passed over Julia's face, as if remembering the decidedly not incredible situation with Samson and his men yesterday. Or maybe she was thinking about Bodhi and how he kept almost kissing her, then bringing up Grace. He hated this awkward spot he was in. Would you like me to get Adelaide up to speed? Julia asked, yanking his thoughts away from kissing her and back to work. Sure. Thank you. Adelaide is smarter than anyone in our family. This will be a successful venture with her involved. Thank you, Adelaide said, not a trace of sarcasm in her voice. She appreciated his compliment. Bodhi watched his sister's face light up like his had when she saw Julia's laptop. She'd been friendly with Julia initially, but as they worked, his sister got even more animated and excited about Julia's ideas, and especially the prices they would be listing to stay in a castle suite. Five to ten thousand dollars per person per night could boost their economy quickly. And that didn't even touch on the tourists' additional wishes and needs that would put money directly in their people's pockets and drive the economy of many other industries. Clearly, his sister grasped the potential of tourism now. It was determined Bodhi would work on roads, the airstrip, and transportation. They also decided it might not be safe or smart to introduce the hiking, mountain biking, or other get-out-in-nature kind of tours without knowing how the dissenters and zealots would respond. For now, they focused on the medieval reenactment and fairs and the novelty of staying in the hidden kingdom and a real castle. They worked until late that night, then Bodhi walked Julia home. He'd been focused on work today, but every brush of their hands distracted him. Every time he looked her way and caught her looking at him, he wanted to get her alone. 
there was a guard waiting outside. She shivered, even though it was a warm 70 degrees, and hugged herself. I almost forgot about the awful interaction in the mountains with how busy today has been. He nodded. Me too. I'm sure Alaric has met with Samson and his men, and it's no longer a problem. If it was no longer a problem, why would Alaric still have a man waiting outside Julia's cottage? I hope so. We have to iron out a lot of details. When your father or brother asks your people for a vote on Saturday, I want to be able to sleep without visions of Samson breaking through my window because I brought evil tourists to his island. Don't worry, he reassured. He didn't stop to think as he gathered her into his arms. With her arms folded against her chest, the hug was more than a little awkward. She stared up at him with those beautiful blue eyes. Everything about her captivated him, but there was still the slight tension between them from him almost kissing her, and then having to admit he needed to talk to Grace. He wished she'd release her clasped arms, but she didn't. Should he tease her about being that friendly or hope tomorrow would be better? Not knowing how to make tonight better, he released her and backed up, clearing his throat. Would you like to run in the morning? She studied him and finally admitted, I would. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done today. After Saturday's announcement, we can start booking the tour packages, and with that money, we can begin updates. She nodded. It's all coming together. But they weren't coming together. Despite his desire to grow closer to her, they seemed further apart than yesterday. Had he truly only known this woman for two days? She'd impressed him with her knowledge, hard work, and wit. Maybe she was growing less impressed with him and that's why she was keeping her distance. No. He couldn't lack confidence. It was definitely because of his connection with Grace. She unlocked the door and stepped inside, lifting a hand. Six in the morning? See you then. The door shut and Bodhi studied it for a few beats before turning and jogging into town. He hurried through the quiet, empty streets lit by antiquated street lamps. In a few minutes, he was standing in front of the medical clinic. It was dark. He hesitated, then rapped on the door. No response. Should he text Grace or give it a break? She was either sleeping or not here. Discouraged, he turned and walked toward the castle. He'd have to work it into his schedule to come back to find Grace. She was incredibly busy running the medical clinic with two nurses for support, the retired doctor filling in when she was gone, and often without the right medicine or specialized equipment. She also had to make the rounds doing home visits to the dissenters, the zealots, and farmers who didn't take the time to come into town for much, besides selling and exchanging their goods on market day. Was she gone on one of those trips? That would be a nightmare for his hopes of moving on to a relationship with Julia. He made it back to the castle, looking forward to resting so he could meet Julia for an early morning run and then work through more details. Surely he'd dream about her tonight. He'd never been so impressed, intrigued, and drawn to a woman. His entire life, he'd been obsessed with learning business, strategy, infrastructure, and finance so he could help his people. This was his big opportunity, and half the time he couldn't even think straight about how to make the logistics of tourism work. He was too busy being intrigued by the way Julia's lips pursed while she thought, or how her blue eyes sparkled when she was excited about a certain idea. He'd barely slipped off his shoes when there was a rap at his door. He strode to it and opened it wide. Alaric. He'd been waiting for news all day. 
His brother looked like he'd had a younger day than Bodhi had. Come in. Thank you. I won't stay long. Alaric shut the door behind him and got right to the point. It took us a while to track Samson down. The dissenters were cordial with us, but each claimed that Samson was off in a different direction in the mountains. We found him near the old mine shafts. Bodhi's brow wrinkled. The mine shafts were dangerous, in disrepair, and some had collapsed completely. Samson was a grown man, so it wasn't like a child playing in a dangerous area, but the dissenters didn't usually travel that direction. The shafts were all closer to the eastern, more exposed side of the island. Why? He just said he was exploring. He was as welcoming as he's been since he... left. He almost pretended like Kingston and I were old friends come to visit. He shrugged. I guess we are, but things didn't end too well with him and Kingston. He waved a hand as usual, not wanting to share details. Anyway, he took us back to the village and handed over the gun as if it were a toy he was done playing with. He apologized, told us he took the gun when he left the military and hoped we'd forgive him, but he'd been in a dark spot at the time. None of this sounds like Samson. Bodhi had been friends with the man and really liked him, but Samson was more confrontational and edgy than anyone he knew. He'd never admit to being in a dark spot like a person who actually had emotions. And why would he be so accommodating and hand over the gun he'd obviously stolen when he left the military? Alaric lifted his hands. Quinn and I discussed it all the way back. Maybe he's found a good woman and it settled him down. Bodhi snorted. I don't know that anyone could settle Samson down. So you didn't even need your manpower, and you didn't find any other guns? No. What did Samson say about them scaring Julia? His gut tightened just thinking about it. He hated seeing that beautiful and with it woman scared. Thank heavens Julia had been too tough to let Samson scare her into leaving Magna for good. Again, he apologized. Said they were all shocked to see you with the redhead and an outsider, so they shadowed you. He apologized for them stepping out of the trees like wraiths and scaring her. He did ask if she was leaving. We told him no and to expect more outsiders in the future and to come to town on noon on Saturday if he wanted to know more. He obviously didn't like that, but he didn't lash out. It was shocking. Bodhi rubbed at his short beard. What do you think? I'm more disturbed than I was when you reported to me last night. Samson being cordial and accommodating? Can he really have turned over a new leaf? Or is he hiding something? He called you naive, correct? Yes. It still stung. And told me to get back to my protected castle. Why would he be so belligerent with me? The royal brother who is actually his friend, but be so accommodating with you and Kingston. The two he always seems to think have done him a wrong turn. Alaric shook his head. I have no idea. Maybe it intimidated him to have Kingston and I show up with so many men? Bodhi laughed at that. Have you ever seen Samson intimidated before? Alaric chuckled without mirth. No. He could be surrounded by fifty armed, well-trained, well-intentioned men, and he'd think they were all in the wrong and he could beat them together, or separately, with his own bare hands. Exactly. Silence stretched. Neither of them had any answers. Is that why you kept the guard outside Julia's cottage? Julia had talked to him in Adelaide about seeing if people wanted to rent their homes or space in their homes as an alternative to the castle. 
it was another opportunity to bring money into the people's hands and a cheaper alternative for visitors. Julia explained she preferred the cottage she was staying in to the castle. Bodhi had initially had her stay there so he didn't step on his family's toes before their approval, but now he wished she was closer. He'd sleep on his couch and give her his bed. He liked that idea far too much. Yes. I think we should keep our patrols on high alert and Miss Adams protected until we know how this tourism venture is going to sit with our people, and especially with the dissenters and zealots. Alaric paused. Kingston wished you or I would have brought up Samson's treatment of Miss Adams in the meeting this morning. It might have changed the vote. Exactly why I didn't bring it up, but maybe I should have. Do you think it would have changed anyone's opinion? I don't know. The vote's been cast, though, and Kingston was as understanding as he ever is. Nothing to do now but move forward. Bodhi thanked him and saw him out. There were obstacles to his, Julia's, and Adelaide's work. He thought through them and any viable solutions as he readied himself for sleep. He lay awake. He should be stewing about how to make this venture work, but he could only ever think about how to convince Julia to fall for him and never leave. He couldn't believe how quickly he was falling for her. Somehow, he had to keep her in Magna for the indefinite future. Chapter 12 The next few days flew by for Julia. She and Bodhi went on runs each morning on the beach, and then she worked with Adelaide and her brother's marketing agency to flesh out details and set everything up, while Bodhi worried and plotted out all the other details, such as the airstrip, internet, medical supplies, additional staff to spoil their guests, etc. Most things they couldn't start crews working on until they got the people's approval but at least they'd be ready. The king sent out a message to the Magnites that a big announcement would be made Saturday at noon when most people were gathered for market day and the tournament. After that, she and Adelaide would start booking night stays and tour packages, and Bodhi could implement his ideas and get crews working. The influx of money would be immediate, and only increase as tourists started arriving with low overhead for Magna. Julia was thrilled. Things were good between her and Bodhi. They talked, teased, flirted, and exchanged looks that heated her up, but there was still a distance because, to her knowledge, he hadn't found or talked to Grace yet. When they took the time on Thursday afternoon to take pictures of the charming town, they stopped by the medical clinic. A nurse and older doctor were there, and Bodhi asked if they had any idea when Grace was returning. They said hopefully by Saturday. Adelaide had shot a glance at Julia as they left. Bodhi's sister obviously sensed that she and Bodhi shared a mutual attraction. It was somewhat comforting that Grace was gone off doctoring somewhere because it explained why Bodhi hadn't talked to her. It wasn't that he was stringing Julia along. Julia had met each member of the royal family at different points throughout the week. They were all cordial, but some were more welcoming than others. Darian was over-the-top friendly until Bodhi threatened to thrash him if he didn't stop flirting with Julia. Adelaide and Darian had thought that was hilarious. Julia bade Darian goodbye and focused on her work, not sure if she loved that Bodhi was obviously jealous. He wasn't free to pursue her, so why couldn't she flirt with his cousin? The computer blurred. The problem was her heart was already tied up with Bodhi's. By Friday afternoon, she... Bodhi and Adelaide were exhausted, but everything was in place for tomorrow's announcement. 
By tomorrow evening, they should be able to get their packages uploaded to travel sites and online for travel agents to book. Grace would also be back tomorrow. Would Bodhi talk to her? Julia glanced up at him. His dark gaze was concentrated on her as it often was. It sent tremors of awareness through her until she felt like her fingertips were zinging. Adelaide stood and stretched. I need to go get dressed for dinner, she said. I'll see you both there. Throughout the week, someone had either delivered meals to them in the library or Julia had eaten at her cottage while Bodhi had dinner with his family. She was still an outsider here. It stung. She wanted to be by Bodhi's side, but she needed to keep reminding herself she wasn't staying on this beautiful island with this beautiful man. But if that was true, why did she ache for him to break things off with Grace and kiss her until neither of them had enough oxygen to think straight? Um, I don't think... Bodhi stopped her with his hand over hers. They'd grown close over the last week, but he had only touched her occasionally, resting his hand on her lower back to escort her somewhere, or touching her arm. Each touch lit a fire in her abdomen, and this one was no different. Was he trying to stay away because he hadn't talked to Grace? Or was he keeping his distance because he'd realized he shouldn't be interested in an outsider who wouldn't stay in Magna indefinitely? Bodhi had never treated her like an outsider. Far from it. He'd been more welcoming and kinder than anyone. My mother is never going to forgive me, he said in a low voice. I was supposed to invite you to the family dinner tonight, but with all we've been doing, it slipped my mind. She studied him. An invite to spend time with his family had just slipped his mind? That must mean he didn't want her there. Goodness, she needed to stop second-guessing everything. It's no worries, she said. I probably should turn in early anyway. Tomorrow will be busy after the announcement. If Grace returned, would it be busy with her and Bodhi kissing? Julia focused on her laptop but couldn't see the suddenly blurry screen. Adelaide shifted and cleared her throat as if she'd been caught in the middle of something awkward. Well, I'd love to see you at dinner if you can make it. Thanks for everything, Julia. With those words, she turned and all but fled the library. Julia closed the laptop and stood, slipping it into her bag. Bodhi stood as well. She loved how tall and broad he was. She tilted her head back to meet his gaze. His dark eyes were serious. Please forgive me for not issuing the invite to dinner. I would love to have you come. She didn't know what to say. It did feel like a slight, and she didn't know why. Julia, will you do me the honor of accompanying me to dinner? He asked in a low, husky, irresistible voice, his eyes pinning her in place. She put a hand to her throat. It was hard to stay upset with a voice and a look like that. I don't know, she murmured. Are we that friendly? He chuckled and leaned closer. I hope so. She waited, wondering how close he'd lean, but that seemed to be the extent of it. When the seconds ticked by and it grew a little awkward, she asked, Is it a formal dinner? Adelaide had to leave pretty early to get ready. He nodded. Everyone will be in their Sunday best. She hadn't experienced a Sunday here. She'd arrived late Sunday night. She had seen him in a suit that first day they met, and she had liked it a lot. Since then, he'd dressed casually, but she'd usually worn her blouses, pencil skirts, and heels. It was what she was used to, and as many times as she'd caught him checking her out, she assumed he liked the way she dressed. 
Please, come, he said. Okay. He smiled, took her pink computer bag, and said, I'll walk you to your cottage. Thank you. They walked through the wide castle halls, her admiring the paintings, tapestries, wide windows with their view of the glorious mountains, town, or the ocean depending on the angle, and the stone and metalwork within the castle. She appreciated the beauty and uniqueness of this place, but she was really avoiding staring at the handsome man by her side, or worse, begging to know if he'd talked to Grace yet. Even if the woman was working out in the mountains with renegades, wouldn't she have a phone? As bad as the service was here, it was probably non-existent in the mountains. Breaking up over the phone wasn't what any woman would prefer, but Julia was running out of time. Apparently, he didn't feel the same urgency, and there was always that sting of guilt as she thought how she wanted this handsome, smart, fun prince to fall for her, yet she was straight up planning on leaving him and returning home to America. Bodhi held the door for her, and they walked out into the bright late afternoon sunshine. Julia savored the tropical sun on her face and asked, Does it not rain here very often? It's so green and lush, but I haven't seen it rain yet. It rained several days last week, which is why our hike was so muddy. She nodded. They hadn't talked much about their hike, but she still had a guard outside her door each night and early morning. Late spring and early summer is our dry season. The most rain comes in the fall and early winter. Julia nodded. She didn't like the stilted conversation between them. Was their teasing, easy friendship disappearing? She hoped not, but it would probably be better if she didn't fall head over heels for the charming, handsome prince. They each greeted people in town as they exited the drawbridge and walked through the charming cobblestone streets. Julia still felt like she was in a storybook. People would go crazy over this town, the castle, the church, the beach, and the mountains if she dared let tourists go to the latter place. Maybe they'd have to have Alaric, Kingston, or their men accompanying tourists on hikes. She smirked to herself, imagining the serious Kingston's response to that, but Bodhi had told her all of the royal family even those not excited about their ideas were committed to supporting them. As soon as they got the people's approval tomorrow, they'd get full committees working on issues and infrastructure. They made it to her cottage. Bodhi nodded to the guard. She wondered if he texted Alaric or the guard every time they left the castle, or if a guard sat around all day waiting for her to return. Still nothing from your friend Samson? Bodhi shook his head. Everything's been quiet, but Kingston, Alaric, and I don't trust him to simply stand down, and we're not going to risk your safety. Thank you, she murmured. After Saturday's announcement, I might need an armed escort. He chuckled. If you do, I'll provide one. His voice deepened or protect you myself. Her stomach pitched happily despite the subject. She liked the thought of him personally protecting her. She'd never told her brother much about the terrifying interaction with Samson and his men, simply saying they'd wait on hiking and biking adventures for outdoor enthusiasts until after they got the medieval and castle experience going strong. I'd better go get ready for the formal dinner. I'll be back to pick you up in an hour. Sounds great. She unlocked the door and let herself in. The now familiar cottage with its view of the sea felt like home to her now. Excitement brewed in her gut as she hurried to shed her blouse and skirt and look over the fancy dresses she'd packed. When she'd packed, she'd been hoping for a formal dinner at a castle. 
she pulled out a dusty blue floor-length formal with a V-neck in the front and back and capped sleeves. Smiling to herself, she hurried to the bathroom and got to work. The hour flew by, but she was ready when there was a soft rap on the front door. She floated to the door and swung it wide. <laughs> Bodie's jaw went slack. He didn't need to say one word. The look in his eyes was more of a compliment than any she'd ever received. His gaze swept over her a couple of times before he managed, Hey, in a soft, odd voice. Hi. She wanted to spin in a circle and tease him about his reaction, but she was feeling a little awestruck herself. In a dark gray suit with a pale blue tie and white shirt, he looked like her version of the world's most perfect man. She knew from being around him the past few days that he was more thoughtful, smart, and kinder than any man she'd ever been around. You look amazing. His eyes widened and he passed a hand over his jaw. I'm sorry I didn't get the compliment out first. You are the most beautiful woman I've ever ever seen in my life. She smiled. It's okay. Your eyes gave the compliment first, even if your mouth and tongue were a little slow to catch up. He grinned and she felt herself relax. This was Bodhi. Smooth and creamy PB. Yes, he was a show-stopping handsome prince, but he was also her friend and temporary co-worker. They could talk and tease like they'd been doing this week. He'd never once made her feel awkward or as if he were above her as royalty. She loved spending time with him. He extended his elbow and she wrapped her hand through it, clinging to the solid muscle of his bicep. They walked slowly across the cobblestone streets and toward the castle gates, saying hello to a few townspeople. But it was quiet this time of evening. Most people had closed their shops and gone home for dinner. Julia savored the cooler evening air, a tangy sea salt breeze, and the scenic town, church, and castle with the glorious mountain backdrops on one side and ocean on the other. But she kept sneaking glances at Bodhi and caught him looking at her as well. She felt almost like an awkward, star-struck girl going to her first prom with a mystical prince. She was all lit up inside. From Bodhi's reaction and the way he always treated her, she knew that she was a mature and desirable woman. Now to act like one. He escorted her over the drawbridge and her nerves started ramping up. She'd met all the royal family, but hadn't been in one room with the entire crew. Would they gang up on her and make her feel like an outsider? As the castle doors swung wide and they were welcomed into the entrance hall by a butler, she glimpsed people she'd never met before walking toward the formal dining room. Is this more than a family dinner? She asked. Extended family as well. He explained, There are numerous magnites that are related to the royal family from generations past, but they live and work amongst the people and don't take part in decisions for governing Magna. Oh, that made sense. If this island had been inhabited for almost a thousand years, most of the people probably had some tie to the royal family. She supposed it was lucky the king only had one brother so the immediate royal family wasn't too massive. Bodhi escorted her to the dining hall as if she were a princess. All eyes seemed to turn to them, but luckily conversation didn't cease, so she didn't feel completely awkward being the new person everybody was staring at. They made the rounds, greeting his siblings and cousins she'd met and meeting many more people. King Kendrick asked everyone to take their seats. Then Bodhi's Aunt Natalia said a beautiful prayer for their country, the family, and the food. Bodhi had been right about his Uncle Zoltan and Aunt Natalia. 
Zoltan was very likable and Natalia was an angel. The scents of fresh bread and zesty clam chowder greeted them as workers brought in the first course. She was seated with Bodhi on her left and his cousin Leia on her right. The table was so wide it was difficult to talk to anyone across from her, so she focused on Bodhi, which she enjoyed doing, and Leia, who surprisingly made her laugh. Leia was a gorgeous girl with blonde hair and blue eyes, and she was very snippy. Did you meet Cousin Sherry? Leia asked under her breath. She's been eyeing your dress since you walked in. I'm surprised she's not green yet, she's so jealous. Which one is Sherry? Julia whispered back, taking a sip of her soup and loving the creamy, succulent clam chowder. The short-haired brunette whose cleavage is a mile long and dress is two sizes too small. I don't know how she moves without splitting it open both directions. She shouldn't have been surprised by the answer, as Leia had proven herself to be a tad catty, but Julia laughed nonetheless, almost choking on her apple cider. Her loud laugh earned her a few looks, but Leia laughed with her. Bodhi smiled at the two of them. Is Leia bagging on the cousins and making you laugh about it? Sorry, Julia apologized. She didn't want to be party to making fun of anybody, but Leia was surprisingly funny. Don't be sorry, Leia shot at her. I finally find another woman I like talking to, and now she's apologizing about laughing at my clever quips. She winked, but then excitement lit her blue eyes. Tell me about America and where you buy beautiful dresses like yours, and ooh, ooh, ooh! She grabbed her hand and squeezed hard. Shopping in New York! Julia smiled and she started sharing details about shopping, college, men she dated, which earned her a sharp glance from Bodhi, and answering Leia's numerous questions about America. The girl was enamored with Julia's home country, and it was fun to talk about the places and people she loved as she ate a delicious meal of roast beef, potatoes, squash, peas, and crusty bread with a strawberry tart for dessert. She felt a pang of missing home as they conversed about America. As dinner finished, the large party headed toward the ballroom where soft music floated out. Bodhi escorted her. Julia's heart skipped a beat as his warm palm wrapped around her waist. A small orchestra played the heavenly music in the corner, and a few couples were already dancing in the middle of the ballroom. Julia felt like she was in the middle of a fairy tale, especially when she gazed up at the handsome prince by her side. His face split in a devastating grin. Leia monopolized enough of your time at dinner. Will you spend the rest of the night dancing with me? She wanted to burst with happiness, but she held herself in check and attempted to say coolly, I don't know. Are we that friendly? He roared at that and took her in his arms. I hope so. I certainly hope so. He spun her around the dance floor, and she laughed and tried to keep up. She'd taken jazz and ballet, but not ballroom dance. Bodhi was a good leader, though, and simply being in his arms, him staring at her as if she were his world, made this dance a piece of heaven. She pushed the constant niggling worry over Dr. Grace away. Did his family think it was odd that he was dancing so intimately with the outsider while he was engaged to Grace? Nobody said anything. There may have been some sly looks, but she was able to ignore them while in Bodhi's arms. The next song was slow and romantic. Her senses tingled as Bodhi's gaze deepened and his arms pulled her in tight, gently waltzing her around the room. She pushed away all the worries about Grace and their venture succeeding and Samson and his men sacrificing her to the volcano and only saw Bodhi. 
His dark eyes twinkled as he stared down at her. Thank you for being here, Julia, he whispered against her forehead, pressing his lips there briefly. Warmth tingled through her at this simple kiss and her stomach flip-flopped. She started to arch up to kiss him full on the mouth when his body tensed. She could sense him looking over his shoulder at someone. Her gaze followed his, and she saw his parents watching them with surprise and possibly concern on their faces. Their moment instantly shattered. Putting a little distance between herself and Bodhi, she cleared her throat and felt the weight of worry return, heavier this time. Did his parents want him with Grace? Or, even worse, did they not want him with the red-headed outsider? Every womanly part of her wanted Bodhi to fall for her, but was that fair to him? She couldn't stay in Magna and he'd never left this island. These were his people and this was his home. She could never ask him to leave. Your parents don't want you with the outsider? She guessed, her voice tight and controlled. He gazed down at her. I think it's more about them having planned on me being with Grace. It was a relief they didn't simply hate Julia because she wasn't from here. Do you still plan on talking to her about it? She hoped that didn't sound accusatory. Should she let him be with Grace? Every cell in her body protested against that. Of course I will. He seemed determined. She looked away struggling with what was right for her to think or feel. They twirled past his brother Quinn dancing with the beautiful young lady. Were they cousins? That was a little odd. No, wait, that was... Zara. The kind woman who had picked her up her first night and brought her to the castle that first morning. She looked gorgeous in an off-the-shoulder white dress. I promise you. As soon as I see Grace, I will break off the engagement, Bodhi said in a deep, meaningful voice, stealing her attention back to him. Bodhi. She stopped dancing and looked deeply into his eyes, forcing herself to say words she didn't want to say. Maybe you shouldn't break things off with Grace. You've planned to marry her, and it's not as if I'm staying in Magna after we get everything up and running. Bodhi's gaze was sharp and penetrating. Julia, the way I feel about you, I can't imagine being with anyone else. Is there any way I can talk you into never leaving? Her breath caught at his sweet honesty. She wanted to tell him she'd never leave his side, but that was crazy. They weren't dating, they were working together. They'd never even kissed because of his sense of honor and his unofficial commitment to Grace. I can't commit to something like that. Florida is my home. My parents, my brother, my friends. I can't just stay here and give up on them all. It would be one thing if travel here was easy, but it wasn't. Who knew how their venture would go? She might be known as the person who brought unreasonable, loud tourists to this peaceful place and ruined it. The islanders might run her into the ocean with pitchforks or toss her in the volcano. His eyes got unfathomably dark. She should have been relieved they were having an honest conversation about this, but she wasn't. This felt horrible and final. She was irresistibly drawn to him, but reality had to come into play at some point. She forced a smile. I'd better get back to the cottage and rest. Tomorrow will be a big day. He nodded. I'll walk you home. They made the rounds, saying goodbye to family and thanking his parents. His mom's gaze was kind but wary. What mom wouldn't want Dr. Grace as her daughter-in-law instead of some imposing red-headed outsider? Julia felt miserable as they walked out of the castle. Was she giving up on growing closer to Bodhi? What choice did she have?
Chapter 13. Bodhi and Julia walked slowly back through town toward her cottage. His body was stiff beside hers, and she felt like she'd messed everything up. He obviously felt deeply for her, but they both knew they wouldn't give up on their home countries. She needed to focus on being professional and getting this job done. Once the tours were booked, she'd planned to stay and enjoy the first few medieval reenactments and fairs and make sure everything went well. But Bodhi and Adelaide would do a great job. They didn't really need her. Bodhi nodded to the guard as they walked up her short walk and stopped by the front door. Julia could hardly look at him. This goodbye felt very final. She was being overly dramatic, and that wasn't like her. She was a professional. She was probably just overwrought and tired. Thank you for a wonderful evening, she murmured. Bodhi gently touched her chin, tilting it up. You and I aren't over. We're just beginning, he said. There's something strong between us. Please say you feel it. Julia's breath caught in her throat. Their gazes got tangled up and she couldn't look away. Who knew how much time passed before she admitted to him and to herself, I feel it. A slow smile crinkled his eyes. He looked like he wanted to say more, commit her to stay in Magna, but he simply trailed his fingers along her jawline and across her neck. Her skin tingled and she leaned into his touch. She wanted to kiss him more than she'd ever wanted to kiss someone. Electrified moments passed as they stared deeply into each other's eyes. Julia felt like the most desired princess in the land. Who cared that she wasn't a princess? Why would she ever want to leave this island? How could she think of a life without this man? Bodhi's face tightened slightly. He pulled his hand from her neck and clasped his hands behind his back. Thank you for all your hard work. Tomorrow will be a great day. Julia felt like she'd been punched in the gut from the loss of his touch. It wasn't smart to let herself fall for him. She was leaving and he needed to talk to Grace, but she was too far gone to care about what was smart. Leaning against the doorframe for support, she murmured, For sure. Will you watch me at the tournament tomorrow? Of course. It's research for the packages. He shook his head. No, that's not what I'm asking. Will you watch me? Cheer for me? Let me choose you for a kiss when I win? Fire raced through her at the thought of kissing him, but anger quickly followed. She wasn't the one choosing not to kiss, that was on him. She loved his sense of loyalty and commitment, but why make her feel so much depth of feeling when a relationship could never happen for them? I don't know if we're that friendly. I hope to be more than friendly soon. With those words, he turned and walked down the walk. See you in the morning. Julia pushed open her cottage door with trembling fingers. Ah, Bodhi. In most ways, he was incredible. Smart, witty, kind. But he was confusing her and maybe toying with her. Was she toying with him too? She wasn't staying here, so why did she want a relationship with him more than she wanted to succeed as a marketing expert? Why did he have to be so great? If he wasn't the most impressive and alluring man she'd ever met, she could simply do her job, enjoy her time in this tropical paradise, and then fly home. She closed and locked the door behind her. The living room was dark. She felt along the wall for the light switch. Before she reached it, she heard movement and a click. The lamp went on behind her. Her stomach clenched and ice prickled her spine. Don't scream. The male voice was soft, but the command was not to be ignored. Julia whirled around, 
choking on the scream that wanted to come out. Samson sat on the couch, a gun pointed loosely at her. Julia panted for air, clinging to the door handle. Could she yank the door open and dodge behind it? Would he shoot and kill her before she could even get the door open? Come sit down. He gestured with the gun to the couch. Let's chat. Julia didn't move. From what she understood, this man was highly trained. He could easily kill her, but she didn't want to sit and wait stupidly for the bullet to penetrate her chest. Get out, she demanded. Her voice betrayed how terrified she was. I've just come to talk. Are you going to sit or stand there shaking and staring at me like I'm some monster? For some reason, that seemed to be an affront to him. He was a monster. What kind of man threatened a woman simply because she was an outsider? How'd you get in? Could she unlock the door without him hearing it? Had he killed the guard out front? No, the guard had nodded to her and Bodhi, and Samson had to have already been in the house. Sliding glass doors are the easiest locks to pick. With trembling fingers, she turned the lock on the door. A loud click revealed her move. Samson smirked at her. Now, before you run screaming for the guard and our friend Bodhi, you and I are going to talk. So talk. She tried to be brave, but he was right. Her entire body trembled and she was sure her face was pinched with fear. He stood and walked toward her with the gun pointed straight at her chest. Julia shrank against the door. At this distance, he couldn't miss. He stopped a foot away and looked her over. You're a very beautiful woman, Julia. I can see why Bodhi's so taken with you. The problem is, nobody but Bodhi wants you here. His words fed into her feelings during the dance when Bodhi's parents had looked at her, like the outsider. All the murmurs of the redhead and suspicious looks from the people in town. She tilted her chin, refusing to be cowed by him. If he shot her, he wouldn't do it with her quivering. Standing straight, she glared at him. You're a bigoted jerk. Leave. I like your spunk. His smile disappeared. The rumor is you, Bodhi, and Adelaide are planning to turn our beautiful island into a tourist trap. Julia's jaw went slack. How did he know that? Only the royal family was supposed to know their plans. Until the announcement tomorrow. His smile came back. Let's assume that I have more information than you at all times, Miss Adams. You are an outsider. I'm going to ask you very nicely to leave and take your ideas with you. Your people need me, my ideas, and tourism. The gold is gone and you have no other financial source. I'd rather starve than allow tourists to ruin my home, he growled at her. They won't ruin it, she immediately shot back. She hoped they wouldn't ruin it. And even if you could manage to scare me away, was he going to kill her tonight or simply warn her away? Her muscles tightened. She wanted to scream and run. Progress is still going to happen. Your country needs to be brought into the 21st century. His dark eyes flashed a warning. Don't tell me what my country needs or doesn't need. He kept his voice controlled, but a vein bulged in his neck, betraying his anger. You know nothing about my country and our people. Julia feared she'd push him over the edge if she said anything else. Bodhi should never have brought you here and should not have assumed he has the support of his people or of his own family. He does have the support of his family. She couldn't help but hurl at him. 
the vote to proceed passed, and tomorrow he'll have the support of the people. You know very little, red-headed outsider," he sneered at her. "Tomorrow is not going to happen. You have a choice: you can stop your plans and figure out a way to cancel the announcement tomorrow, or people will start dying." He pressed the gun against her neck. She flinched away, but hit the door and had nowhere to go. Starting with you, Julia couldn't breathe, couldn't think what to do. Samson gave her a slow smile, nodding, starting to understand. Outsider, this is no marketing ploy. This is no paycheck for you. This is no love story with you and Bodie. You go home. You leave us alone, or many will suffer. He studied her as if waiting for her to answer. She couldn't. Her throat wasn't working, and her heart was racing so fast she couldn't breathe. Giving her one last terrifying smile, he backed away, lifting the gun. For your sake, I hope I won't be seeing you again. Have a nice trip home. He saluted her with the gun, turned, and strode through the living room and into the kitchen without looking back. She heard the sliding glass door open and close. She sagged against the front door. Her mind was scrambled, fried, and overcooked. She had no clue what to do next, but she couldn't stay here for one more instant. Turning, she yanked open the door and saw the guard staring at the house, raising a hand when he saw her. He wasn't dead. Oh, thank heavens! He started toward her as she hurried onto the porch. A shadow rose up behind him. Julia screamed. Samson brought his gun down on the back of the man's neck, and her protection crumpled to the ground. No! Julia cried out. Go home, Miss Adams," Samson commanded, "or many more will be hurt because of you." With that, he turned and disappeared down the path to the beach. Julia should find her phone, call Bodie, scream for help. She ran for the guard instead. "Please don't let him be dead, please, Lord," she begged. If he was dead, it was her fault. She fell to her knees next to the man's body, pushing her fingers against his neck. He had a pulse. Oh, thank you, Lord. Kneeling there, she felt eyes on her. Her gaze darted around. Was Samson in the trees watching her? Had he brought others? What should she do? Should she run for her phone, sprint for the castle or a house nearby with lights on? She prayed desperately for help. The guard stirred, rolled over with a groan, and sat up. His eyes widened. Miss Adams, are you all right? What happened? Are you okay? He nodded. Just a little groggy. What happened? She shook her head. Please call Alaric and let's get to the castle. Yes, ma'am. He struggled to his feet and pulled out his phone, asking for the third time, "What happened?" She glanced around and pressed his arm. "Not here," she whispered. "We're in danger. Let's get to the castle." He pushed a button on his phone and then handed it to her, pulling out his gun. "Start walking," he said quietly. "I'm right behind you." Julia felt all kinds of reassured by his gun and his quick movements. He stepped close behind her, and she started walking forward. Suddenly, she had a terrifying, hopefully irrational thought as the phone started ringing. What if this guard was with Samson, and that was how Samson had gotten into her house without being detected? Would the guard shoot her in the back? Why would Samson have knocked him out then? Looking over her shoulder, she was encouraged by the man walking close behind her, as if to protect her. His gun wasn't pointed at her, but out at the shadows. 
His gaze darted around, looking for whoever had knocked him out and was after Julia. She relaxed. Well, as much as she could relax with the dissenter maniac threatening her, and her and the guard out in the open and exposed like this. Commander Alaric. The crisp greeting from Bodhi's brother made her want to dissolve into tears of relief. There were men who could and would protect her. Samson's insinuation that the members of the royal family were against her and Bodhi and were ratting their plans out to him made her stiffen again. If she couldn't trust Alaric, she was really in trouble and needed to find a boat to get her out of here, pronto. Alaric, it's Julia. She managed to get out. Julia? Where are you? What's wrong? Samson was in my house, she whispered, looking around as if Samson would jump her and knock her out like he had the guard. The guard and I are headed for the castle. I'm on my way. Thank you. She hung up the phone, then realized maybe she should have stayed on the line with him, like calling 911 when there was an intruder. Wasn't that what she was supposed to do? She was too frazzled to know. Clinging to the phone, her heels clicked across the cobblestone streets. The guard stayed right behind her with his gun still out. Both of them checked every shadow and movement. The streets were quiet, but a cat darted out and the guard pointed at it, almost shooting it. Julia let out a shaky laugh. The guard managed half a laugh as well and a little of the tension fizzled. She heard a door open and close down the street and the tension ramped up again. Was Samson close? She could swear someone darted across the street behind them. When she looked, no one was there. They kept moving steadily toward the castle. This adorable, friendly town no longer seemed adorable and friendly. She prayed desperately. Please let Alaric come quick. Please let Samson not be following us. Did Samson think she would just slink back to America and not call Bodhi and Alaric for help? Probably not. He probably expected she would run to them. What if it was an ambush and as soon as Alaric came, Samson and his men would kill them all? Fear clogged her throat. Footsteps pounded down the street from the drawbridge. She peered through the dim light coming from the streetlights and saw Bodhi racing in front of Alaric, several soldiers behind them. A sob rose in her throat at the sight of Bodhi's strong form, still dressed in his suit. When he saw her, a look of relief washed over his face. Julia, he breathed out, and then he was to her. He wrapped her up tight in his strong arms. You're all right? She nodded against his chest, tears leaking out. Bodhi was here. She was safe. I'm okay, she managed. Alaric was issuing commands. Spread out and search for Samson and his men. I'll send reinforcements to help you. His men saluted and took off. Bodhi. Alaric's voice was kind but commanding. Let's get her back to the castle. Kingston will want to know what happened. Bodhi turned and they started walking quickly to the castle. His arm stayed tightly around her. Alaric took up the rear, searching everywhere and obviously planning to protect them both. Thank you, Lord, for good, brave men, she prayed. Julia wanted to sob. She wanted to tell Bodhi everything and she wanted to get him off this infernal island. Could they really bring tourists here with Samson threatening to kill people over it? What kind of insanity was that? Killing people over tourism. They finally reached the drawbridge and she felt like everything was happening at the end of a tunnel. The clack of her heels as they hurried over the bridge and through the courtyard more soldiers approaching, them pausing so Alaric could issue more commands. 
It was like she was watching a movie, not her own life. She was invested in it, but not part of it. Did you see other men or just Samson? Alaric paused in his commanding to ask her. She focused and came back from her disjointed state. Just Samson. Thank you. He went back to speaking with his men, and then they ran off. It all felt surreal. Julia couldn't help but worry. What if there was a mole in the castle, in the royal family? Was she safe going to the castle, or should she just beg Bodhi to call his friend Trek to fly her away from this madness? Yet, Bodhi. She glanced up at him, and he stared down at her. His dark eyes were fierce, protective, and filled with the caring for her she'd never seen from any man. Her dad and brother adored her, but they'd never been called upon to protect her. This look from Bodhi was deep, and she wouldn't ever forget how he made her feel. Safe and loved. That was crazy. She'd only been here a week. He couldn't love her. He ushered her through the castle doors. They walked through the wide hallways and up the stairs. Finally, they were in Bodhi's suite. Julia had come in here once, earlier in the week, when Bodhi needed to pick something up. It was a beautiful suite. He had a sitting area and a small kitchen with a bedroom and large bath beyond that. Bodhi turned to her, wrapping both hands around hers. You're okay? She shrugged, shivering. Okay is a relative term. You're cold. Taking off his suit jacket, he wrapped it around her shoulders. The warmth of the jacket seeped into her. There was no reason to be cold. It wasn't cold outside or in, but just the memory of Samson being there, of his terrifying words and threats, the gun against her neck, and then him appearing again to take out the guard. She shivered again. Alaric was pacing over by the kitchen, talking on his phone very adamantly. Bodhi escorted her to the couch, and they sat side by side. He wrapped his arm around her shoulders, and she leaned against his solid chest. I'm so sorry, he murmured. Samson was there when I left you? Sitting on the couch. She shivered again. Did he threaten you? She couldn't get the words out. She nodded. I'll kill him. Julia felt her body start to shake. While she loved Bodhi's protectiveness, she didn't want him anywhere near that awful Samson. The evil man had taken out that guard so easily. Thank heavens he hadn't killed him. How had she gotten to this moment? She was just a marketing expert. She was supposed to be on a semi-vacation to an exotic hidden island. No wonder they kept it hidden. These people were a mess. Except for Bodhi and Alaric and Adelaide and sweet little Belle and... Okay, they weren't all a mess. Just that Samson jerk. Did his dissenter people back him up? Julia didn't want to be prejudiced against people on this island like some were to her, but it was hard not to get defensive when they hated her simply because she had red hair, was an outsider, and was trying to help them bring tourism to their island. I don't want you near him, she managed to get out. Bodhi cuddled her even closer. Don't worry about me. Worry about Samson. He's terrifying. He won't get near you again, Bodhi promised. Alaric pocketed his phone and started toward them. There was a rap on the door, and then Kingston burst through it. He slammed it behind them and stormed up to Alaric. What's going on? he demanded. Are you starting a war with the dissenters? You know we can't do that. Why couldn't they do that? Alaric arched an eyebrow. I know what our fathers have commanded, but I'm sick of not knowing why. Julia was very confused. 
this family seemed to have a lot of secrets. I'm tempted to start a war, Alaric said, his jaw tight. Samson broke into Julia's house. I have everyone searching the city and close by for him and his men. I haven't ordered anyone into the mountains, yet. If they won't turn over Samson to us, I'll take them all to task. He turned to her. Julia, can you tell us what happened? I didn't know. Kingston's face softened as he looked at her. Are you all right, Miss Adams? Yes, she managed. He didn't hurt you? She shook her head. Just terrified me. And threatened her, Bodhi added. Kingston tilted his head to Alaric and they both sat in the chairs facing Bodhi and Julia. Please tell us exactly what happened, Kingston requested. Julia took a deep breath, appreciating Bodhi's silent support and arm around her. She recounted Samson's words and warnings. Kingston's brow grew more furrowed. Alaric's mouth tighter and Bodhi's arm pulled her ever closer as she talked. When she finished with Samson knocking out the guard and telling her that many more would be hurt if she didn't go home, there was silence for a few beats. She felt drained and terrified from recounting the story. Alaric and Kingston exchanged another look. Had the two of them been trained in telepathy? Alaric nodded. I'll find the mole. I know you will, Kingston said. First light, we'll track down Samson and bring him back here. Thank you for coming, General. Alaric's words were full of respect, and though Julia had sensed how close these cousins were, it was obvious who had the power. Kingston stood. His entire body looked coiled like he was ready to thrash somebody. Julia was glad it wasn't her that was in trouble. Miss Adams, my deepest apologies that this happened while you were visiting our island. Rest assured, Samson Cohen will be arrested and reprimanded for his actions tonight, and whoever has shared inside information with him will also be punished. I hope you feel safe for the remainder of your stay. Thank you, Julia managed. She had the eerie feeling she wasn't in Kansas anymore. Samson had terrified and threatened her, but she almost felt sorry for him. She wouldn't want to be reprimanded by the likes of Kingston. Was the mole in the palace? In the royal family? Could Samson and his buddies have bugged the palace or paid a maid to listen in? And that's how they knew why Julia was here? That was a much better option than it being one of Bodhi's family members. They were the only people who were supposed to know about tomorrow's announcement. Bodhi? Kingston nodded to his cousin and turned to go, but then he paused. I'm assuming this changes nothing about your announcement tomorrow. Bodhi's jaw clenched and she could feel his muscles tighten against her. Absolutely not. I will inform the king, but you know how he will feel about bowing to the dissenters' threats after how patient he has always been with them. Yes, I do. We might have a fight on our hands if the dissenters decide to back Samson's bigoted actions. Kingston smiled for the first time, as if a fight was the best news he'd had in a while. He inclined his head to Bodhi, murmured, Thank you, Commander, to Alaric, and then turned and strode from the room, shutting the door more gently than when he'd come in. The military will be on high alert, Alaric said, and you will be protected, Miss Adams. Please, call me Julia, she managed, and thank you, Julia. He gave her a brief smile and looked to his brother. I'm assuming she's staying with you? Yes, she isn't leaving my side. Bodhi's tone was final, heartwarming, and thrilling. Do I have a say in that? Julia asked, turning to him. I don't believe we are that friendly. 
Bodhi gave her half a smile, obviously still upset. I will take the couch and you can sleep in the bedroom. She stared at him, loving how protective he was and how honorable. I'll have Zara get your clothing and personal items. All right, she conceded. But I feel bad kicking you out of your bed. Don't. I have to know you're safe. The moment stretched between them as they stared into each other's eyes. How could she ever leave this man? Yet how could she stay on this island where she had to be protected from crazy rebels simply because she was an outsider trying to help them? Alaric cleared his throat and stood. I think that's my cue to go. I'll have several of my men escort Zara to your cottage, Julia. Bodhi, I'll let you know as soon as we have Samson in custody. I wish I could go with you, Bodhi muttered. That's the second time he's threatened my girl without me planting a fist in his face. His girl? Julia didn't mind being called that, but she had no clue how a relationship would ever work between her and this perfect, unattainable prince. I understand, bro, but you're needed here. Alaric gave Julia a significant look and then gestured at them, still clasped in each other's arms and not making any move to get off the couch. No, don't get up. I'll see myself out. Julia laughed in surprise. Alaric always seemed so serious. He grinned and winked at her, disappearing out the door. As soon as he was gone, a funky tension rose in the room. There was a lot of junk between them. A lot of strong feelings, but also a lot of questions and unknowns. She wanted to lean in and kiss him, forget about Samson, Grace, the pressure of the announcement tomorrow, and the fear that the rest of Magna would react like Samson had to her and her ideas. Excuse me while I call Zara, Bodhi said. Oh, of course. Bodhi released her, stood, and pulled out his phone. He briefly conversed with Zara, telling her to remove everything of Julia's from the cottage and bring it to his suite. As he talked, he paced, removed his tie, and undid his top button. He seemed agitated and kept glancing at Julia as if to reassure himself she was all right. As soon as he hung up, he walked back to her. He knelt in front of her and her eyes widened as he gently unstrapped her high heels and slid them off. His fingers brushed the bare skin of her ankles and made her tingle. Standing, he sat by her, wrapped his arm around her, and murmured, Do you want to put your feet up? She did. She was so tired and didn't want to deal with any of it any longer. She curled her legs under her. Grateful her formal dress was a soft, silky material that moved easily. Bodhi reclined into the couch, pulled a lever that lifted his legs, and reclined them both farther. With his coat on and his arms around her, she felt warm, safe, and protected. She closed her eyes and rested her head on his chest. I've got you, he murmured against her forehead. You're safe now. I've got you. Blinking up at him, she said, I guess we are that friendly. He gave her a slow, smoldering smile. Julia wanted to kiss him. She studied his nicely formed lips. It probably wasn't the smartest idea. After tonight, she was more certain than ever that she couldn't stay on this island, but she had no idea how to resist him any longer. Julia. His voice was deep and gravelly. I want to be that friendly with you. I want it badly, but... Grace, she supplied. He nodded. Sighing, she gave up on kissing him. Once again. For the tenth, or was it the twentieth time? She hated it. She cuddled into the strength of his chest and his lips grazed her forehead. Soon, he murmured. 
very, very soon. Julia didn't know if she believed him. Maybe Dr. Grace was a figment of all these people's imagination and his excuse to not get too friendly with the red-headed outsider. She rolled her eyes at her petty thoughts and then shut her eyes and let herself relax against him. He felt good. He smelled good. He was good. If only he could be hers. Chapter 14 Bodhi held Julia in his arms and listened as her breathing settled. He felt her body soften against his as she drifted off to sleep. Half an hour later, Zara brought her things. He forced himself to extract himself from holding her and get to the door. He took her things into his room and bathroom and then came back to stare at her cuddled on his couch, wearing that perfect pale blue dress with his dark gray suit coat. She looked so irresistible. She looked like she should be his. He passed a hand over his face. Should he pick her up and move her to his bed, or simply put a pillow under her head and a blanket over her gorgeous, irresistible body? If he lifted her into his arms, he was afraid he wouldn't be able to resist kissing those beautiful lips, especially the way they looked right now, all soft and pouty as she slept. She was the most incredible woman he'd ever known, and she probably wanted to run from this island where she kept being threatened and treated awfully, simply because she was an outsider. He was done with Samson and bigoted people. Tomorrow, things would change. He still believed most of the people were ready for advancement, for change, or at least they knew they had no choice if they wanted medicine and essential items imported. Jerks like Samson would have to accept outsiders, progress and tourism, and the benefits and drawbacks. He grabbed a clean blanket and pillow from the linen closet down the hall, returned to his suite, and gently put the pillow under her head and the blanket softly over her. She smiled and cuddled into the blanket, murmuring, Bodhi. His heart raced. Who would know if he bent down and kissed her? He wasn't truly engaged to Grace. It was more a long-standing plan that had nothing to do with love or his own desires. He'd never fought or questioned it before because he'd never felt for a woman like he did for Julia. He respected and loved Grace as a good friend and impressive smart woman, so he'd assumed that would be enough to make a happy marriage. He had no idea he could feel so much more for a woman. As soon as he saw Grace, he would break it off. Julia was irresistible, and for all he knew, she might leave tomorrow after the announcement. He wouldn't be surprised. It terrified him to think of her leaving. His place was here, with his people. Yet how could he let Julia go? He edged closer. Julia had been close to kissing him several times over the past few days, and he'd been the one to stop it. She wouldn't complain if he woke her with a kiss. He leaned down. Just a little more and the lips he'd been craving would be under his. A tug of conscience stopped him. He'd been trained from birth that being a magnum meant loyalty, honor, and commitment. He couldn't kiss Julia until he'd talked to Grace. He pushed out a heavy breath, strode to the wall, turned off the lights, and hurried into his room. He brushed his teeth and slid out of his clothes, saying a brief prayer of gratitude that Julia had been protected tonight while in Samson's power and that all would go well tomorrow with the announcement and Alaric going after Samson. He also prayed selfishly that Grace would be there tomorrow, so he could talk to her and be free to pursue Julia, and that Julia would stay in Magna and give him a chance. He climbed into bed exhausted and fell asleep quickly despite his worries. His alarm buzzed at 5.30. 
Normally, he'd go on a run and then lift weights. The past week, he'd gone on longer than usual runs every day with Julia, only fitting in a few lifting sessions. Today, everything felt out of sorts, and he was tempted to fall back to sleep. He slipped out of bed instead, took a shower, and got dressed in his other suit, a deep blue. The tailors used to have bolts and bolts of material imported, but they hadn't bought anything superfluous like linen to make high-quality, breathable suits in years. He brushed his teeth, did his hair, and prepared himself for a long but exciting day with a prayer for help. When he walked out into the main area of his suite, Julia was face down on the couch. Her gorgeous red hair covered her face. And his suit coat covered her back and arms, but she kicked the blanket off in the night, and the soft material of her dress had ridden up, showing off beautiful long legs. He looked quickly away. What should he do? He could walk over with his eyes closed and lift the blanket over her again, or clear his throat loudly and pray she wake up. Or, a rap came at the door. He hurried that direction. Could he block the knocker's view from seeing Julia's pretty legs? He didn't want to gawk himself, but the thought of another man seeing them made him even more upset. He'd seen those legs the second morning of her stay when he'd knocked on her door to ask her to run, and she'd been in those short shorts. He tugged at his dress shirt's collar. It was warm in here. Bodhi. Julia stirred and sat up. Hey, he managed to say in a semi-level tone. Let me just get the door. Oh, okay. She tugged her dress back over her legs, and he felt marginally better. Maybe sharing a suite with her wasn't the best option. His heart was pumping faster than when he sprinted. He opened the door. Kingston stood there, shifting from foot to foot. Good morning, Alaric Scott Sampson. Relief filled him. Thank you. I thought he said first light. Kingston half smiled. He never fully smiled. He was there by first light. They found Sampson easily, and nobody fought for him. He and Alaric had a brief brawl. Alaric won. His smile grew slightly. I trained him well. That's wonderful news. Bodhi wouldn't want to fight Alaric or Kingston, though he might have to fight both to win the tournament this afternoon and claim a kiss from Julia. Please let Grace be back so he could talk to her. Please let Julia not leave. Can I thump him in the prison? Kingston actually laughed. No. We don't beat up those who can't fight back. Oh, you can unchain him. I'd like a fair fight. Smiling, his cousin shook his head. He sobered and said, "He claims his inside source was a maid who overheard you, Julia, and Adelaide's planning session one day. He won't tell her name because she needs the job. Do you believe him?" Bodhi couldn't recall any maid listening in. But the library was large, and they hadn't kept their voices down. Kingston shrugged. We'll keep him in prison and an eye on the dissenters. If it's someone other than the maid, the truth will come out. Bodhi knew Kingston and Alaric would figure it out. He was grateful it wasn't one of the royal family. Kingston slapped him on the shoulder. Good luck today with the announcement. I look forward to beating you in the sword fight or the joust. Should be a great way to relieve the tension for you. Maybe I'll beat you this time. He looked over his shoulder. Julia was watching them both. I want to choose who I claim a kiss from. Kingston's brows lifted. Good for you. He lifted a hand to Julia. Good morning, Miss Adams. As you may have overheard, Samson has been captured. You're safe here. Thank you. She gave him a gracious smile. Kingston nodded, turned, and strode away. 
Bodhi shut the door and turned. Julia stood and the blanket fell away. Her blue dress clung perfectly to her smooth curves. His too large jacket made her look even more feminine and irresistible. He passed a hand over his short beard. How'd you sleep? Really well, actually. Her lips tilted in a challenging smile. I thought I was getting the bed, but you relegated me to the couch. Bodhi chuckled. Sorry, I didn't dare move you. Why not? He cleared his throat. I might not have been held accountable for my actions if I picked you up last night. Instead of looking offended, she smiled slightly. Too attracted to me, Prince Bodhi? Heat flamed inside of him. You know I am. Her smile grew. She winked, blew him a kiss, and headed for his bedroom. I'm going to shower and get ready. She shut the door behind her. He hoped she locked it. He paced the sitting area, his pulse skyrocketing when he heard the shower start, pulling out fresh veggies, ham, cheese, and eggs from the fridge, he started an egg scramble. he just covered it with cheese and was pouring orange juice into two glasses when Julia walked out. She looked incredible in a white button-down shirt and one of her tight skirts, this one a blue floral pattern. Her red heels were a sassy addition and made her legs look long and delectable. Thank you. He nodded dumbfounded. Was she thanking him for the food or for staring like a fool? For the compliment and for making breakfast, she said with a teasing grin. Bodhi wanted to forget breakfast and kiss her, but before he could act on that, she sat at his small table and looked up at him. Would you like me to say the prayer? He nodded, sat as well, and listened to her short prayer. She filled her plate and immediately started going over thoughts for the announcement today and getting tours uploaded tonight if all went well. He was surprised that she was so upbeat and unafraid after the scare with Samson last night. Apparently having the man captured was what she needed to go forward. They chatted through breakfast and then went to meet with Adelaide and Quinn. His oldest brother would make the announcement as the crown prince. He wanted to make sure he had all the details straight for questions and concerns. When noon arrived, the royal family congregated in the castle foyer to proceed out to the arena. They were all dressed in suits or flowing dresses of various colors. They looked incredible. Julia stood out with her red hair and more business-like attire. To him, she was the most beautiful woman of all. Bodhi was feeling good. If only he could find Grace, tell her he was in love, and then kiss Julia nonstop. Alaric had told everyone about Samson breaking into Julia's cottage and his capture. Everyone was relieved Julia was okay and that Samson was caught. The family members were supportive about going forward with the plan. We're ready then? Zara asked. The king took the queen's hand and nodded. Zara looked them over, her gaze lingering on Quinn. Pretty cute family in my opinion, she teased. They laughed and she pushed the doors open. People lined the courtyard and cheered when they saw the royal family. Market days, especially tournament days, were always a big deal, a wonderful break from the hard work of everyday life. The people sensed there was something special about today and were excited for the announcement. Bodhi reached for Julia's hand. She smiled up at him and walked confidently by his side. He wanted her by his side, always. The family walked across the drawbridge through the streets filled with people, vendors, and tents to the arena where the tournament would be held this afternoon. The arena was half-filled. More people filed in behind them and soon every seat was taken. People held children on laps and stood in aisles and against railings. 
There were over 5,000 residents on Magna, and it seemed everyone but the dissenters and zealots, and maybe some of the distant farmers, were here today. Did they know what the big announcement was? Had whoever shared the information with Samson spread it around? The faces in the crowd looked expectant, not angry, so it probably wasn't from Samson. The family stopped shy of the announcer stand on the edge of the arena. The jousting list, sword fighting area, and open area for target shooting took up the large arena. Quinn mounted the stand with the Queen, King, Uncle Zoltan, and Aunt Natalia flanking him. Bodhi was probably holding Julia's hand too tightly. He relaxed his hold a fraction and rubbed his thumb along the soft back of her hand. She smiled up at him. He got distracted from everything around them. The crowds of people, his family, the big announcement. Nothing mattered but Julia. Welcome, people of Magna, Quinn called out spreading his hands wide as if he would hug them all. With great effort, Bodhi focused back on what was happening. The crowds cheered happily. Everyone but the dissenters seemed to love the royal family, and Quinn had always been a favorite. Bodhi's parents and aunt and uncle had worked hard not to place themselves above others, and to give their people every opportunity and blessing, it had been harder to do so since the gold ran out. They'd stopped importing anything they couldn't reasonably produce, and the island had to work harder to self-sustain. It's a beautiful day for the fair and tournament, Quinn said. But we also have a very important reason we've brought you together. The stadium quieted, and as one, the people seemed to lean forward. Quinn gave his charismatic smile and Bodhi heard women sigh and titter. Women loved his brother. Bodhi didn't care. He only wanted one woman to love him. He glanced down at Julia again. She grinned. He's quite the charmer, eh? Not for you, he said sternly. She squeezed his hand and leaned against his shoulder. Not for me. Bodhi's heart wanted to burst. Please let Grace come home soon so I can openly pursue Julia and kiss her. He really, really needed to kiss her. As you all know, the source of our prosperity and income, gold, dried up many years ago. People nodded and the mood instantly sobered. We've fallen behind the times in technology and other advancements. Over the past few years, we've stopped importing everything but medicine and a few other essential items. Due to our people's hard work and ingenuity, we've been able to self-sustain. But we feel it is time to stop being stagnant and to progress. Many people clapped at that, an encouraging sign. My brother, Prince Bodhi, and his friend, Miss Julia Adams, Quinn continued, Bodhi and Julia released hands and waved. He was used to eyes on him, but she seemed to squirm. He heard whispered murmurs of, The redhead. It's the beautiful redhead. Have a plan to start infusing our island with opportunity and currency. It won't be all roses and sunshine. We will all have to accept some changes and be open to new ideas and new friends. As always, the royal family will not proceed with this idea unless the majority of you are in agreement. Many people nodded now. Bodhi could see in their faces that they appreciated the fact that Magna had never been run like a dictatorship. The idea involves inviting people to our beautiful island to participate in or watch our medieval tournaments, to purchase and be part of our market days, to shop at your shops, support your farms, possibly stay in your homes if you'd like extra money, and enjoy our beautiful beaches and mountains. Bodhi hoped the mountains would be open and not a hotbed of dissenter activity. 
Quinn paused and looked around. The arena was silent. Bodhi expected there might be some protest or discord immediately, but everyone seemed stunned. Tourists? One man finally shouted. You want tourists and outsiders to come here? That's the proposal, Quinn said. We've tried that before. Somebody close to Bodhi grumbled. Bodhi looked around in shock, but couldn't pinpoint who had said it to ask what the person meant. It will change our way of life, a woman called out. Yes, it will, Quinn agreed. It will change things in wonderful ways by bringing financial stability and untold opportunities. Once the tours start booking, we can improve everything from computers and internet to medical, military, and farm equipment to shipping, so we can sell products over the internet and be able to ship them in a timely manner, as well as start importing more products again. Some of you might even find job opportunities online. No one spoke, but some nodded. Nobody said anything about trying it before again. Had Bodhi heard that wrong? He'd have to ask his father later. Think of it, Quinn said. Those who want to build or create will finally have a market to sell their products. Shopkeepers and farmers will have a demand that can pay in hard currency. Authors, singers, and artisans can sell their talents to the world, not just our little island. We'll never have to worry about a child or anyone who's sick going without the medicine they need. Quinn paused and looked around. I could claim I'm not trying to influence you, but I am. Bodhi has sold me on this plan, and like I said, there will be some setbacks and maybe hard times, but the opportunity and possibility is worth that. It's time Magna joined the 21st century. We need to stop being the hidden kingdom and take our place as a beautiful, generous people who have much to offer the world. We will be blessed with success and advancement because of our generous welcome to outsiders. Bodhi felt a twinge of regret at Quinn's words. It was sad to think they would lose some of the old ways because of progression, but it was time. They couldn't stay hidden and backwards forever. Are there any questions before we take the vote? Quinn asked. Are you just going to let anybody in? We don't want riffraff here, a man shouted out. There was some murmured agreement. Quinn nodded. It's a good question. No, we aren't just going to let anyone in. Miss Adams will book tours for select individuals and we will screen them to make sure they pass background checks. We will also have them sign an agreement about conduct on our island. People smiled and nodded to that. We are in a great position here, Quinn said. Our island is unique and tourists will be vying to come. We will expect them to treat us and our island with respect. General Kingston and Commander Alaric will make certain our people are protected. On the flip side, if the vote passes, we will expect all of you to treat every outsider as you would a friend. No murmurs of the redhead. He gave a few significant looks and Bodhi hid a smile. And anyone who harms an outsider will be subject to the law just as you would if you harmed a magnite. The silence was thick in the stadium. Bodhi wasn't sure if people agreed to that or not, but the looks were open and friendly, so he thought they did. These were good people. Most of them were ready to advance and succeed again. Ready to vote? Quinn's gaze swept around the stadium and stopped on their father. Heads bobbed. King Kendrick stepped forward and asked, All who are willing to accept people being booked on tours to come to our island will treat said people with friendly courtesy and want our country to advance and to have the success and prosperity we once knew, 
please raise your hand. Some hands flung up, others raised slower. Some people looked around before cautiously raising their hand. Bodhi's heart raced as he studied the crowded stadium. Adorable children shot their hands in the air simply because their parents' hands were raised. Most teenagers and young adults had their hands high. They wanted advancement, opportunity, and new friends. Older people were split, some obstinately keeping their hands down, others glaring at their spouse or neighbor and shakily holding their own tired limb up. Julia squeezed his hand and said in a low, excited whisper, Look at that! Bodhi smiled. It was far more than a majority. He would guess over 85%, maybe closer to 90. His father smiled. Thank you. You may put your hands down. I don't think we need an objection count. People laughed at that. He nodded to Quinn. The vote has passed, Crown Prince Quinn. Applause started somewhere, and within seconds, the stadium was shaking with thunderous noise of hands clapping and people hooting. Bodhi had heard loud applause when the tournament champion was crowned, or a particularly good fight was won, but not like this. This was deafening and incredible, and he felt personally responsible for it. His chest puffed out. He looked down at Julia. She grinned up at him. He swept her off her feet and swung her around. The applause seemed to grow louder. She laughed and threw her head back. He set her down. He wanted to kiss her so badly. Other people were kissing and hugging, including his own parents. It wasn't his time with Julia, yet. The look in her blue eyes showed she was disappointed he hadn't kissed her, but still radiantly happy that their project was moving forward. He appreciated how invested she was in his country's success. He prayed she wouldn't leave once the tours were booked. The cheering settled and Quinn raised his hand. Thank you. Our land and our people are unequaled in love and unity. Thank you for your support. We'll let you know as tours are booked and as money comes in. Medical needs will come first, and then Prince Bodhi has been working tirelessly to decide where to allocate the money. If you have any objections or concerns, you're welcome to visit with a member of the family any time. Please enjoy this fair and tournament day. The crowd applauded again, and Bodhi was immediately inundated with siblings, cousins and townspeople hugging, shaking his hand, backslapping, congratulating in all manner of ways. He was separated from Julia. He looked around for her and saw her with Adelaide and Belle talking with Quinn's best friend, Malik. Malik was a great guy. He was part of the military, but not really. When there was a need, he was assigned as personal bodyguard to the royal family but for the most part, he focused on raising beef cattle and fighting Kingston and Alaric every time he came to town. It looked like Adelaide was giving him a hard time. Bodhi smiled. His sister was an expert at giving men a hard time. A soft hand covered his eyes, and a unique smell of gardenia and antiseptic filled his nose. He gently pulled her hand away and turned to face her. Grace. Tall, regal, long dark hair and unique hazel eyes. His sort of fiancé had finally come home. Grace! He was so excited to see her that he picked her up and swung her around. She laughed and kissed him hard on the lips when he set her down. He was shocked by the kiss and glanced around, looking for Julia. He couldn't see her. Congratulations on your new idea, Grace said, and thank you. It means the world to know I'll have the medicine, vaccines, and equipment that I've been praying for. Her eyes misted over. 
The thought of telling little Jameson that I don't have insulin for him has been keeping me up at night. I'm glad it is happening. We need it. She nodded. The dissenters are going to fight you. Probably. That's where you've been the past week? She nodded. With them and the zealots in the outlying areas. Now I'm back and will need to work 24 hours to catch up. Who is this Miss Adams? Her eyes had a glint and it wasn't jealousy. I need to talk to you about her. Bodie, you need to get ready for the tournament, Kingston said from his side. On my way. He looked to Grace. Can you please come with me so we can talk? Of course. She slid her fingers against his. It was like holding a friend's hand. He tugged her toward the open lockers outside the stadium where the equipment was. One of the stable workers would have his horse readied if he placed in the sword fight and made it into the jousting. His heart started to pound, and he tried to summon the words he needed to tell Grace. Grace stared up at him. She was kind, beautiful, and accomplished, but she wasn't the one for him. Will you hate me if I break off our engagement? So much for saying it kindly, eloquently, or sensitively. Her eyes widened but quickly softened. She leaned her head against his shoulder. No, but I'll miss hanging out with my close friend. He wrapped his arm around her waist and she cuddled in closer. They had been close friends their whole lives, but Julia was his future. He and Grace talked and talked as he changed out of his suit and got into his battle gear. He told her all about Julia and their ideas to help Magna. She helped him get ready for his first sword fighting match. He had a better chance with the sword fighting over archery. He'd won the first through third spots in sword fighting several times and made it on to the joust. He felt light and happy now that Grace had been so understanding. He would win this tournament and announce Julia as the most desirable woman in the land. It was an old tradition that might be outdated, but he liked it. Then he would finally kiss her. With most of the kingdom looking on, it didn't matter. That kiss would be incredible no matter where it took place. It was past time for it to take place. He finished putting his gear on and gave Grace another hug. She kissed him tenderly on the cheek. I'm so happy for you, Bodhi, she whispered in his ear. Thank you. He released her from the hug, strapped on his sword, and waved goodbye with a grin. This would be the best day of his life. Chapter 15 Julia's heart was breaking in two. Shock filled her and her body hurt as if she had the flu. Bodhi, Grace, together. Wrapping her arms around her stomach, Julia wished she could run, hide, disappear. She could hardly believe what she'd seen. Bodhi had picked up the beautiful Dr. Grace, spun her around, and kissed her. Then the two had walked off hand in hand. As if to drive the nail into the coffin, Bodhi had put his arm around the woman. Julia stealthily followed them and watched their heads bent together, talking furiously as the gorgeous doctor helped him get ready for the tournament. He'd stripped out of his suit right in front of Grace. True, he had some fitted shorts underneath, but still. He'd taken off his clothes as if they were already together. It made her sick. They looked like the perfect couple, both so tall, beautiful, and dark. It hurt like an axe slammed into her chest seeing them together. Bodhi may have been drawn to her for a moment because of her red hair. She may have distracted him, but it was obvious he loved this woman he'd known his entire life, the woman he was slated to marry. No wonder he hadn't been able to kiss Julia. 
Even when tempted, he loved Grace too much. She hid behind a booth selling fresh flowers and watched them. It felt like somebody was slugging her repeatedly in the gut. Finally, Bodhi bade his long-held love goodbye. They hugged and Grace leaned in to kiss him again. Julia turned her head. She'd never known misery like this existed. She ducked away, sick with the effort to hold her head up, and walked blindly through the fair and street vendors. Luckily, she wasn't sobbing. At least she didn't think it was. Hey, there you are. Adelaide grabbed her arm. Come sit with us for the tournament. Adelaide's face was flushed prettily and she didn't even notice what a mess Julia was. Can you believe how incredible that was? Our ideas were approved and it's going to be amazing. She directed Julia toward the stadium and lowered her voice as they weaved through people. Hey, what did you think of Malik? Julia forced herself out of her own misery and looked at her friend. He was very handsome. Adelaide smiled and looked away. He is handsome, but he's too full of himself. Oh, is he? Overconfident, too attractive men. Who needs them? Julia couldn't think of a response. She needed Bodhi, but he had Grace. The royal family was seated together, right in what would have been the 50-yard line of a football stadium. Their seats were nice, but not extravagant. Julia thought the family, the kingdom, and the island were amazing. If only Bodhi didn't love Grace. If only Julia fit in here. No, this was for the best. Her idea had come to fruition. She would start getting the ball rolling tonight. Sunday, she'd rest. The first of next week, she'd fill as many tours as the family would let her. It would be miserable working with Bodhi knowing he loved someone else, but she would go back to Florida and her normal life soon. It would be good. She'd always known she was going back. It hurt to think of leaving him. It hurt worse to think of not loving him. Adelaide directed her to seats next to Constance and Leia. The girls greeted them and focused on the sword fighting and arrow shooting events that were just beginning. From what Julia understood, the top three sword fighters and top three archers were admitted into the joust. The joust was the last event and whoever won it was crowned tournament champion and got to choose a fair maiden to kiss. Old-fashioned, but the tourists would eat it up. They would be able to watch a real medieval tournament up close and personal with the option to pay more and enter themselves. It was fabulous. Fabulous moneymaker. Fabulous experience. Everything was fabulous. She was miserable. She saw Bodhi across the way, waiting for his turn to sword fight. He lifted his helmet and winked at her. Her heart beat faster and her stomach pitched happily. She looked away and prayed he wouldn't win. She couldn't handle watching him kiss Grace again. Glancing around, she wondered if he'd really winked at her or if Grace was sitting somewhere close by. Was he playing them both? That didn't seem like the Bodhi she knew and loved, but how well did she really know him after one week? As they watched, Malik sank three arrows into the bullseye and the crowd cheered. He gave an obvious glance their direction. Adelaide gave him an imperious look and then blew a kiss to some guy Julia had never seen. Malik's shoulders lowered and he looked away. Adelaide leaned into her and whispered, Do you think if Malik wins tournament champion he'll want to kiss me? Of course, she reassured her friend. She was surprised. Adelaide had struck her as competent, hardworking, and independent. Not a fanciful girl but she was playing all coy and uninterested, yet secretly pining for Malik. 
Maybe a day like today brought the princess fantasy out in all of them. Well, everybody except her. Her guy loved somebody else, and she hated the thought of the handsome prince getting the girl. Julia didn't have a champion in the arena fighting for her. Worse, she didn't have Bodie. I'll refuse to kiss him. Adelaide smiled to herself and then offered Julia a lemonade and a sweet and salty mix of peanuts, raisins, popcorn, and toffee that Aunt Natalia was passing down the line. She thanked her friend and munched on the treat to distract herself. They hadn't had lunch, but her stomach was too tied in knots to care. Studiously avoiding looking at Bodie by the swords, she kept her focus on the archery. No one had bested Malik yet, but Alaric was going next. Alaric would win the sword fighting easily, Adelaide told her. But he does the archery sometimes for a different challenge. He'll beat Malik, but at least Malik will be in the top three. She blushed and looked away. Not that I care. Julia smiled. Of course you don't. She heard shouts of, Prince Bodie, General Kingston. Now, Bodie's strong and a great sword fighter, Adelaide said, but he doesn't stand a chance against Kingston. It should be a short match. Julia couldn't stop herself from leaning forward as Bodie clashed swords with his cousin. They were both obviously accomplished swordsmen. The metal of their swords and the people cheering for either the prince or the leader of their military rang through the stadium. Julia found herself on her feet, clutching her drink and her treat in each hand and feeling like it was a personal blow each time Bodhi got hit. He had armor on and she'd been reassured the swords were blunted, but it must still hurt. He'd probably be bruised tomorrow. If only she could kiss each bruise. Stop, she begged her brain. This is incredible, Adelaide gushed out, rising to her feet next to her. I've never seen anyone but Alaric or Samson beat Kingston, and the three of them are evenly matched. You never know which one will win. Sorry, I shouldn't have said Samson. It's okay. How could she tell Bodhi's sister that her brother's name hurt worse to hear than Samson's at this point? I know what it is. He's fighting for you. That broke Julia's concentration on the fight. She turned to look at her friend. She felt shocked, and then a giddiness rose in her she hadn't felt since teenage years. Fighting for her? And that was why he was fighting so brilliantly? What? No, he's not. Adelaide gave her a sly smile. If he wins the tournament, he can choose to kiss you. I won't give him permission. Julia raised her chin, trying to act sassy but breaking apart inside. Bodhi loved Grace. He was probably fighting so hard to win for his fiancée. Adelaide laughed still oblivious to Julia's pain and probably thinking she was teasing like Adelaide had been about planning to refuse Malik's kiss. I've seen how you two have been falling for each other all week. Julia didn't answer. If only it hadn't all been just a fun pastime for Bodhi until his real love returned. She focused back on the fight. They were still battling ferociously, and she had no way of knowing who was winning. It looked even. Neither of them had knocked the other out, so they just kept pummeling each other. Kingston was the military leader, obviously a brilliant sword fighter, and he probably practiced every day. Bodhi was strong, brave, and fighting for her? She didn't know if she could let herself believe that. It would hurt too much to come back to reality. A whistle blew, and Kingston got in one more vicious blow. Bodhi shoved him away, and then they both stopped fighting, 
letting their swords hang from their hands, breathing heavily. The judges went to confer. Julia stayed on her feet while the others in the stands settled back to await the decision and focused their attention on the archery competitors. It appeared Alaric and Malik were neck and neck there. Does it matter who wins or just if you're in the top three? She asked Adelaide. He's fighting for you. He's fighting for you. Adelaide's words played over and over again in her mind. If only it was true. It's about pride, Adelaide said with a wink. There is an advantage to winning as well. Top place in both events get a bye on the first round of the joust, while second and third battle it out. Then they ride against the victors, sort of a semi-finals, and there's a championship after that round. Oh, Julia was paying attention to the archers, sort of. Bodhi had taken his helmet off and she could have sworn he was focused on her. Why did he have to be so handsome and princely and perfect? First place in the sword fighting event is... The herald paused and then yelled, Prince Bodhi! The crowd went crazy and Julia dropped her treat and clapped as crazy as any of them. Bodhi and Kingston shook hands and thumped each other on the back. Bodhi grinned widely and looked around to the royal family. He caught her eye, but she looked away, staring adamantly at some man she didn't know shooting arrows into the target. When she saw him moving their direction out of the corner of her eye, she said quickly to Adelaide, I'm going to find a bathroom. Wait, Adelaide insisted. Bodhi fought so brilliantly for you, and he's coming. I can't wait, she lied. She had to escape, and now. If he got close to her, she'd beg him to dump Grace and have mercy on Julia's smitten heart. Julia hurried out of the stands and the stadium and ran for the public bathrooms near the church. She thought she heard Bodhi calling her name, but she didn't stop. After she used the bathroom, she hung out in there for a good, long time. She heard them announce that the jousting would begin soon. She would go watch as soon as she was certain Bodhi wouldn't be waiting for her. She snorted in frustration. He wasn't waiting for her. He was probably off with Dr. Grace, kissing the exotic beauty again. Her stomach rolled unpleasantly. She left the bathroom and wandered through the street fair. It was practically abandoned as most people were finding seats for the big event of the joust. Julia bought a sandwich of soft bread stuffed with pulled pork and cheese and an icy, fruity drink of some sort. It was delicious, but her stomach was still churning. She tossed the half-eaten sandwich in a garbage and walked down the quiet street back toward the picturesque church. She sipped her drink, feeling morose and wishing Bodhi loved her. She shouldn't be so selfish as to want to tear him from grace, but she thought she loved him. It hit her that he'd done all of this for grace, to help her meet their country's medical needs. It was so thoughtful of him and would mean so much to Grace and his people. Julia! The sharp, manly command came from behind her. She whirled and dropped her drink. It splattered over her feet, probably ruining her favorite red Kate spades. She didn't care. Bodhi stormed toward her. He dropped his helmet, threw down his gloves, yanked off his body armor and tossed it. She could only stare open-mouthed, heart racing uncontrollably as he crossed the distance between them. He reached her and she backed into the fence surrounding the church's graveyard. His dark eyes flashed, but she instantly realized it wasn't anger driving him. It was passion. He was coming after her, and nothing had ever felt so invigorating and exciting. What are you doing? She managed to ask faintly. 
her hand pressed against her throat. When I win this tournament, I'm going to kiss you in front of everybody in that stadium, and they're all going to love it. His eyes held hers as surely as his fist had held his sword in the arena, with strength, determination, and passion. But I want our first kiss to be just for us, just for you to know what you mean to me. He bent forward and pressed his lips to hers. Julia's body instantly responded to the heat and pressure of his mouth. Tingles exploded through her body, and she was hot and filled with more endorphins and happy feelings than she'd ever known existed in one space. She flung her arms around his neck and pulled herself closer. He wrapped her up tight, lifted her off her feet, and continued to kiss her and kiss her and kiss her. When he finally had to release her so they could both catch a breath, he set her on her feet and murmured, That was every bit as incredible as I thought it would be. She gaped at him, horribly and suddenly remembering he'd kissed Grace, the woman he was engaged to, a couple of hours ago while Julia watched and had her heart broken. She lifted her hand and slapped him across the face. Bodhi straightened in surprise. What was that for? Escaping his strong embrace, she rounded on him. A small crowd had gathered to watch their kiss, and now they all stared in astonishment. Did she just slap him? An older lady asked. After that kiss? Her friend tisked. Outsiders! Julia did not want to do this in front of a crowd. She tilted her head and murmured, Excuse us. Then she stormed to the cemetery gate and hurried through, not stopping until she was behind a large statue. Bodhi followed her. She turned to face him. His dark eyes looked injured and confused. Why did you slap me? Oh, I don't know. She folded her arms across her chest and flung her hair over her shoulder. Maybe because you were kissing Grace before the tournament, and then you thought it was a good idea to come kiss me for craps and giggles. You two-timing jerk! Her voice rose, and she was probably screeching like a harpy. Her dad always said people were doing something for craps and giggles. Bodhi probably had no idea what it meant. She didn't care. Kissed Grace? Oh, Julia. He scrubbed at his beard. Grace kissed me when she saw me, but it was... a kiss of friendship. I told her all about you. She released me from our engagement. Her mind was whirling. She didn't know what to believe. Are you serious? I can't... I don't know if I can believe you. Please believe me. You kissed her hello and goodbye, she insisted. You two looked so together. Perfect together, really. Bodhi grabbed her hands with both of his. I promise we aren't together. It's you I want, Julia. Only you. Julia knew what she'd seen, did she? I want you too. You do? He looked so irresistible, a little vulnerable, very tough and appealing. But you stripped almost naked in front of her, and I know you kissed her. He chuckled. I was just changing my clothes in front of a friend. It didn't mean anything. She kissed me hello, but I didn't return or initiate it. I promise. She studied him. Do you also promise that you broke up with Grace? His dark eyes had never been so serious and full of a pleading that made her heart thump faster. I promise, Julia. You're the only woman I want to be with. Please tell me you feel the same. Julia bit at her lip but she couldn't stop from admitting, I want to be with you too.
Bodhi's eyes lit up. He pulled her in close and tenderly kissed her once, twice. Then the connection and passion overtook them both again, and they were kissing desperately. He pushed her against the statue, and she loved his body so close, overshadowing her. She loved him. Was it too soon to admit that? What if he really was with Grace and was just playing with Julia? No, she couldn't believe that. She lost herself in his kiss and pushed the stupid, insecure thoughts away. Prince Bodhi! Prince Bodhi! Someone was interrupting the kiss to end all kisses. Bodhi pulled back and they both looked around to a teenage boy. They're waiting for you, sir. Commander Alaric beat General Kingston in the joust. He was obviously excited at the unprecedented events of the day. It's time for you to ride against Commander Alaric. Bodhi nodded to the boy, still holding Julia close. I'll be right there. Okay, sir. The kid smiled at her and ran off. Bodhi looked down at her. I have to beat Alaric and then probably Malik. I've never beaten either of them before. He kissed her. I'll crush them both. Then can I kiss you in front of everyone? Heat and happiness filled her at his confidence, knowing he was fighting and winning for her. If I must kiss you, I guess we might as well have a crowd. He kissed her softly. Are we finally that friendly? She giggled. Yes, I think we are. He kissed her more deeply and then groaned. I have to go. You'll come watch? Of course I will. I'll be cheering for you like a Prince Bodhi mega fan. Just between us, PB. I love creamy peanut butter. He laughed, winked, gave her one last hug and kiss, then turned and jogged for the cemetery gate. Julia followed him more sedately. She watched her handsome prince, grinning as he picked up his discarded armor and hurriedly put it back on. He turned to give her one last wave and intimate look with his incredible dark eyes before dashing into the stadium. Some townspeople smiled knowingly at her as they followed him into the stadium. Julia hugged herself and followed the stragglers. She truly felt like a princess in the best modern-day fairy tale she could imagine. She passed the bakery and inhaled deeply loving the sweet, yeasty smells that lingered and the memories of going there with Bodhi. She loved him. She loved this place. Could she stay here? Could she be with Bodhi? Closing her eyes, she leaned against the gate by the bakery and imagined staying in Magna for a few moments. The picture she was forming looked pretty incredible. Her and Bodhi, running on the beach, working on marketing and development plans, marrying in that gorgeous church, settling down in his suite and eventually moving into one of the homes down by the beach. Babies. A hand wrapped around her mouth and another around her waist. Her eyes flew open as she was jerked behind the bakery. She screamed, but no sound escaped past the large palm pressing hard into her lips. She glanced at the man over her shoulder. Her eyes widened and horror made her stomach drop to her knees. Samson? No! How did he escape? He smiled at her. You should have listened to my warning. His smile disappeared. Too late now. Lifting her off her feet, he held her mouth and waist so tightly it ached. She kicked and clawed at him, but he might as well have been made of steel. His hands didn't budge and he didn't slow his pace as he stormed down the narrow side street behind the bakery. He carried her away from the stadium, the castle, any chance of her being rescued, and Bodhi. Oh, Bodhi. 
Would he ever know that she'd fallen in love with him? Samson would kill her. Of that she was sure. She prayed desperately that Bodhi would somehow know how deeply she cared, and that he and her family would be able to go on with their lives if she died in this terrifying man's hands. Chapter 16 Bodhi gripped his lance, seated confidently on his favorite horse, Guy. His anticipation to take on his brother mounted, but his head was still in the clouds with Julia's kisses. She was incredible. He was falling in love with her. After he somehow beat two of the three best jousters in the kingdom, he would kiss her in front of everyone and beg her not to leave their island. She belonged here. She belonged with him. Alaric raised his lance to him in salute, waiting down at the other end of the list. Bodhi returned the motion and prepared himself for battle. He glanced at where Julia had been sitting with Adelaide, Leia, and Constance. She wasn't there. His gaze swiveled around the stadium, searching, searching for her red hair. Where was she? The herald dropped the flag as the signal to start the joust. Bodhi's heart was aching, wondering where Julia was, but he couldn't just sit here and lose a round. He'd miraculously beaten Kingston in the sword fight, which he'd never done before. He had to beat Alaric. Then he could find Julia and kiss her again before he beat Kingston. Then he would kiss her in front of everyone. He spurred Guy and they took off. He gripped the lance with his right hand, the horse with his thighs, and the reins with his left. They pounded down the dirt track, approaching each other at a frightening speed. As he and his brother crossed paths, he jabbed his lance perfectly and felt the satisfaction of it crunching into his brother's chest. Alaric's lance caught him at the same instant and he was flung back. Pain shot through his left shoulder. It took all of his strength, but he kept his seat and jerked back up. This was the one tournament he had to win because Julia would be waiting for him at the end. The scorekeeper gave them each a point. It was better than losing, but a tie wasn't something to celebrate. The people cheered crazily. Bodhi slowed Guy to a stop at the end of the fence line, tossed his broken lance, and was handed a new one. He had a few seconds to recover, and he searched anxiously for Julia. Had she seen him take and give that hit? If she wasn't watching, did that mean she didn't care? Where could she be? A young woman in a beautiful blue dress was racing across the stadium toward him. One of Belle's friends? The herald went to intercept her, but she screamed, No! Prince Bodhi! Prince Bodhi! Bodhi called to the herald. Let her come. The tournament didn't matter if one of their people were in need. He handed off his lance and sprang off his horse, jogging toward the girl. Are you all right? The audience watched with bated breath. Prince Bodhi! The beautiful redhead! Miss Adams! A man took her. A large man with long, dark hair and no shirt. He picked her up and took her. He looked like a dissenter. Bodhi felt the world spin. Which way? Who had her? It sounded like a description of Samson, but that was impossible. He was in custody. Toward the road that heads south, she said. I'd gone home to check on my mother. She's sick. I saw a man carrying the redhead out of town and ran here as fast as I could. Alaric's horse stormed their direction and Kingston raced toward them from the stands. Thank you, Bodhi managed to say to the girl. He jammed his foot in the stirrup and swung back onto his horse, bringing him around as Alaric approached. Julia, he managed then galloped toward the stadium gate. Somebody swung it open and he heard Alaric thundering after him. 
Follow us with the men," Alaric hollered to Kingston. He heard Kingston issuing commands. He'd get the military and vehicles that were smarter for pursuit than a horse, but Bodie couldn't slow down. He had to go. Hopefully, he could save her before whoever had her got her to the dissenters. Would they kill her outright in protest of the island's decision to allow tourism, or would they barter with her life? Bodie didn't know. And terror rode high in his throat at the answer he feared. He and Alaric pounded through the empty cobblestone streets. The horse's shoes clattered loudly, and each step jarred him in the saddle. They finally made it to the wider road out of town, and Guy responded to Bodie's urgency, flying down the road as Bodie bent low over his horse's neck. He spotted a red truck driving south toward the mountains. Wait, that was his truck. Could someone have stolen it? Could they have Julia? He urged Guy faster and prayed even harder. Julia was pressed between Samson and another man in the front of a pickup truck, Bodie's pickup truck. Being in his truck without him made tears leak down her face. She tried to stifle her crying so Samson wouldn't know he was getting to her, but the man kept his distance and didn't look at her. At least he hadn't slit her throat yet. They raced down the road along the beach that led to the turnoff for the mountains. Neither of the men said anything to her, and finally she couldn't take it any longer. What are you going to do with me? Samson stared into the sideway mirror and said, "Don't take it personal, Miss Adams. You're a means to an end." She snorted at that. "You're a bigoted jerk." He smiled slightly but didn't answer. A muscle ticked in his jaw. "How did you get out?" He laughed, but it was cold. "I helped update the prison." He sneered at her. Almost as easy to escape from as a sliding glass door is to open. They're coming, the driver said, his eyes darting nervously to the rearview mirror. I know, Samson replied. We just have to make the turn off. Julia's heart leapt. Bodie, she asked. Samson snorted. Yes, your precious Prince Bodie. At least you ingratiated yourself to him. He'll be willing to stop the ludicrous plans you both instigated in order to save your life. She stared at him. You really hate outsiders this much? His jaw clenched and he snarled. You have no idea. Her eyes widened. They turned onto the road that led to the mountains, and her eyes got even bigger. Almost a hundred men, young to old, stood in the field to their right, many armed with pistols or rifles. Most of them were bare-chested, glistening with muscle and anger. Any hope that Bodie was pursuing her turned into horror. These men could easily kill Bodie. How many men did Alaric and Kingston have in their military? Would they bring more than a couple dozen? If they were even coming, the truck pulled off the road with a puff of dust and ground to a jarring stop. Samson turned to her and said, "Don't fight me, Miss Adams, and you might have a chance at living." He flung open the door and stepped out, gesturing to her. She scrambled out, standing straight and glaring at the men in turn. Most of them simply glared back. But some turned their gazes away. Samson walked around in front of his men and gestured to her, "Come stand by me, Miss Adams. If negotiations go well, maybe today won't be your day to die." She was sick of his threats and sick of him. She never hated a person before, but she found herself loathing this man. What right did he have to hate? Kidnap and try to kill her simply because she was an outsider, a means to an end. She stomped over and stood beside him. 
watching two horses race toward them with a line of 1980s-style military vehicles behind them. Her heart leapt again. There were men coming to fight for her. As they grew closer, she picked out the one man she yearned to see. Bodhi rode in the front with Alaric next to him. He looked incredible in his battle armor as he rode expertly on his large black horse toward her. The horse was magnificent and powerful, but the man on his back was even more so. Bodhi and Alaric stopped about fifty feet away and leapt off their horses. They ripped off their helmets and faced hundreds of men. Neither of them had any weapons, but there was no fear on their faces. Kingston and the military were coming, lining up and down the road, some jumping from their vehicles and running toward them, some driving through the field to get closer. Samson pulled out a pistol and shoved the barrel into her neck. She gasped and tried to shy away, but he grasped her arm tightly with his free hand. The entire scene felt like a war movie where the good guys were going to lose. She prayed desperately, wondering if she had the faith to believe this could turn out for the good. Samson! Bodhi roared. Let her go! His handsome face was a mask of determination and anger. His dark eyes were fierce. Gladly, Samson said smoothly. I do have a few terms. I'm sure you do. Alaric snarled at him. Name them, Bodhi commanded. He looked like he was barely restraining himself from leaping at them and ripping Samson apart. I need a hostage for negotiations. You provide me one and we exchange. I prefer not dealing with an innocent, emotional woman. So Samson thought she was innocent, emotional, and didn't want her around? Fine by her. Relief rushed through her that soon she wouldn't be his prisoner, but she felt awful for whoever was. Bodhi and Alaric exchanged a look. Kingston and a load of military men were stopping in vehicles behind them. Kingston popped out and strode to Alaric's side. Both sides were tense, and she feared that if someone so much as sneezed, a full-scale battle would start. Bodhi stared at her. He was strong and willing to do anything for her. She could tell he was barely holding back from coming after Samson with nothing but his bare hands. Her knight. Her prince. It was strangely romantic, but more terrifying than any movie made it seem. Bodhi couldn't be hurt by this monster. He wants to exchange hostages, Alaric explained. Sure, Kingston responded. He looked behind him as if calculating who to send in Julia's place. I volunteer, Bodhi said, pushing out his chest. No! Julia cried out. Samson was evil and low. He would kill Bodhi. She knew it. She'd rather remain Samson's prisoner and pray he had some honor that prevented him from killing an innocent woman, even if she was a red-headed outsider. Despite his brother and cousin's protests, Bodhi was already striding across the space between them, dropping his helmet as he came. He tossed his gloves and ripped off his chest plate, just as he had before he'd kissed her earlier today. He wasn't coming to kiss her. He was coming to sacrifice himself for her. Her knight in shining armor was taking off his armor. It was like he was symbolically showing everybody that he needed no protection. He was that strong. Or maybe it was that he was making himself vulnerable and proving he would give his life for her. No, she couldn't lose him. Every man seemed like a statue as everyone on both sides of the conflict watched his approach. Bodhi walked right up to them, bent low, and kissed her. I love you, he murmured. It'll be okay. 
He was strong and fearless, yet tender with her. He was the epitome of every dream she'd ever had. Then he shoved between her and Samson so Samson's gun was pointed at him, and he urged her toward Alaric with both hands on her waist. Go. No. She shook her head, tears streaming down her face. She loved him as well. She loved him completely. Kingston, Alaric, Bodie called. The two men ran toward them, picked her up off her feet, and hurried her back to their side before the dissenters responded. No! She screamed, but she didn't fight them. Somehow, she felt like fighting them was hopeless. Everything felt hopeless as they left Bodie behind as Samson's prisoner. When she, Alaric, and Kingston were surrounded by their men, Kingston released her and she found herself leaning against Alaric. His metal armor wasn't comfortable, but he held her up. Bodhi stood proud and straight. He didn't need armor to look strong, fierce, and like her personal knightly prince. Samson's pistol was still against his neck, but there was no fear at all on his face. He gave her an encouraging smile. What other terms? Kingston asked. You cancel this tourism nonsense and Miss Adams goes home immediately. She'll be safe, and our country can remain strong, independent, and untouched by outsiders. No, she whimpered. At the moment, she didn't care if their plans were ruined, but how could she leave Bodie? A few days ago, she'd planned on going home. Now she knew her place was wherever he was. Alaric and Kingston exchanged one of their looks. Would you be willing to meet with King Kendrick, Duke Sultan, Alaric, Bodie, and I? Kingston asked. We're all magnites, Samson, and want what's best for our people. Let's figure this out together. Samson looked to the men standing by him. One of them nodded slightly making Julia wonder for the first time if Samson wasn't actually the one in charge of these rugrats. Get your fathers, and some chairs, Samson smirked. We'll meet right here. Agreed, but Quinn must come also, Alaric inserted. Kingston and Samson nodded their agreement. As long as Miss Adams is removed, Samson asserted. I will talk once she is on her way to the airstrip. I give you my word. Kingston turned to Alaric. Have Trek take her. It's been a pleasure, Miss Adams. Julia's eyes widened. Removed? Where was Trek taking her? Take her away from these men or take her... Where? She wasn't leaving Bodhi. I'm not leaving without Bodhi she insisted. Kingston and Alaric did one of their looks. I'm sorry, Julia, Alaric said. If you don't leave, he'll hurt Bodie. Julia's heart raced and her stomach plummeted. She couldn't be the reason Bodie got hurt. Trek came forward and slid his arm around her, acting like they were old buddies. Hey, Julia, let's get you out of here. Get you somewhere safe. I bet you're exhausted. Bodhi, she insisted, looking over her shoulder as Trek ushered her toward a Humvee. She didn't fight, though she wanted to. If it would protect Bodhi, of course she would go. She'd do anything for him. Bodhi was still next to Samson. The gun wasn't jammed into his neck, but it was pressed firmly to his side. The dozen men closest to him had weapons at the ready. He obviously was still their hostage. He'd given himself in exchange for her safety. It touched her deeply, and she couldn't stand the thought of leaving him. He focused in on her, and those dark eyes made her tremble. How she loved him. Trek lifted her into the passenger seat and then rushed around to the driver's seat. 
Julia could hardly see Bodie and she needed to know he was okay. I can't leave him like this, she insisted. He'll be all right, Trek said, putting the motor in gear and spinning around in the field and back onto the road. Samson wouldn't hurt Bodie. They've been friends too long. She didn't know if she believed him. Samson was a terrifying monster. She squirmed to see over her shoulder, but there were too many vehicles and men. Her heart plunged. Bodhi, you have to go so Samson will talk. Bodhi will be able to work things out with Samson if you're safe, Trek reassured her. That's my job now. Julia stared at him. What does that mean? Trek shook his head, not answering her. The carefree, smiling guy from a week ago had disappeared, replaced with this serious military man. An older sport utility sped toward them from the direction of town. They buzzed past each other and she recognized Quinn, the king, and Bodhi's uncle. Everything was happening so fast. Julia didn't know what to think or do. All she knew was she couldn't leave Bodhi like this. The church spires and looming castle appeared, and minutes later they were driving slowly through the crowds. People craned their necks to see who was in the military vehicle that could barely fit down the narrow streets. They finally made it to the castle, and Trek stopped in the courtyard. He jumped up and ran around opening her door. Can you pack your things quickly? No, she shot back. I am not leaving. He helped her out of the vehicle and she stood on trembling legs, staring up at him. Julia, he said softly, I don't want to force you to go, but it's the best thing for your safety and for our people's peace. I'm so sorry. She swallowed hard and asked, what about Bodhi? Trek's dark eyes were serious. He won't like it, but it's the best thing for Bodhi, too. I'm sorry, he offered again. But the best thing for Magna right now is for you to leave. Maybe someday... He didn't finish, but she knew. Someday, if tensions ever calmed, they might have a chance. Right now, she was putting Bodhi in danger, and maybe the stability of the whole kingdom if she didn't go like Samson had demanded. Julia's chest hurt. Her leaving would be better for Bodhi. She wanted to do what was best for him, but how could she leave him? Chapter 17 Bodhi sat next to Samson. A gun still pointed at him in a small circle on hard chairs in the middle of a farmer's field. His father and Kingston were on his left. Samson had two of his dissenter friends to his right. Bodhi had met Samson's men before. Malcolm seemed like an okay sort, but Kelvin made his blood turn. Years ago, Kelvin had attacked Adelaide and served time for it. Malik had rescued Adelaide. Everyone was uncomfortable having Kelvin here. Uncle Zoltan, Quinn, and Alaric completed the circle. The dissenters watched from the road to the mountain and the Magnite's military lined the road back to town. They were at a crossroads in many ways. He was grateful Samson had been willing to swap him for Julia and let her get somewhere safe. As soon as she and Trek had gone, Samson had eased up the pressure of the gun and said quietly, I'm sorry it came to this, old friend. Bodhi had no idea how to answer. He hoped Samson simply wanted to get their attention and demand what was best for his people. He didn't want to believe his old friend was evil and underhanded. At least Julia was with Trek. Bodhi's true friend. She'd be safe, and that was the most important thing for now. Hopefully somewhere in these negotiations, they could talk Samson out of his demand that she leave the island. 
Bodhi couldn't be without her. What if Trek was already flying with her towards Spain? He couldn't stand the thought of her flying away from him, but he didn't know how to chase after her with the gun pointed at him and the pressing need to help his country. With no pretense, Samson started talking. He held the gun more loosely, but his eyes flashed dangerously. You promised almost thirty years ago you would never bring tourists back, he hurled at the king. Why would you break that promise? Bodhi could only stare in confusion. First of all, that was never the promise. The promise was we would not fight amongst ourselves and we would do what was best for Magna, his father said calmly. That explained why the king and Zoltan had always been so adamant that they couldn't fight the dissenters. But what about tourists coming before? His father hadn't thought that was something he could share with the family? Hold on. Kingston held up a hand. Tourists were here thirty years ago? King Kendrick nodded shortly. You never told us that, Quinn said. Would it have changed anything about what went down today? Samson asked belligerently. I don't know, Quinn shot back. I obviously don't have the full story. Obviously, Samson agreed. He looked to the king. Would you like to share it? King Kendrick pushed out a heavy breath but nodded his acquiescence. Thirty years ago, the mines were still producing, but it was obvious to Zoltan and I that new veins were few and far between, and we needed to start looking for other ways to support the kingdom's financial needs. We didn't feel we had any resources or production that was unique enough to make the slow boat shipping expense feasible, so, as Bodhi concluded not long ago, tourism became the most viable option. Bodhi's chest felt tight. Why hadn't his father told them they'd tried tourism before? What had gone wrong? We didn't ask the people for permission. We thought our plan was good, and we went for it. Zoltan found a reputable travel agency, and they booked tours for us. The money was fabulous. It was the infusion we needed to supplement the mines and upgrade our medical, farming, and military equipment and get exciting things like new computers and 2G internet. He smiled wryly as all of that was sadly outdated now. For the most part, our people liked meeting new friends. New industries started budding to support tourism and the shops, artisans, and farmers were selling like mad more successful than they'd ever been. It seemed to be going well until... He glanced guiltily at Samson. Bodhi's old friend stared at the ground. He wasn't even pointing the gun at Bodhi any longer. He didn't look at all like his proud, overconfident self. Two American men came to the mountains for a hike. They saw Amanda Cohen. Samson's mother. As a teenager, Bodhi saw Mrs. Cohen a few times when she came out of the mountains into town. Some of their schoolmates had teased Samson about his incredibly beautiful mother. They'd ended up flat on their backs with quite a few bruises. Samson's jaw was clenched along with his fists. He looked to be barely keeping his seat. They tried to coerce her. Her husband, Jonathan, Samson's father, found them pinning her down. He spoke so softly now that Bodhi could hardly hear him. Jonathan went ballistic, as we all would, and fought the men. Two on one, and one of the Americans had a knife. Jonathan fought bravely, and the Americans eventually ran off, but Jonathan died a few hours later from blood loss. The Americans were shipped home, tried for their crime, and served prison time. The dissenters rebelled and a brief battle ensued. 
we called a truce and promised not to fight amongst ourselves, and we closed our island to tourism. His father stopped talking, but the circle remained quiet. Bodhi couldn't tear his gaze away from Samson's face. His friend was obviously hurting. How much of Samson's bravado and bluster was only because of the pain inside him? Bodhi had judged him without all the facts. It didn't give Samson an excuse to treat Julia the way he had, but it did give him motivation to hate outsiders and tourists. Of course, his mother probably hated and feared tourists. Samson had a valid reason to feel the same. I'm sorry, he whispered to his friend. I never knew. Samson's face softened a fraction. Why didn't you tell us? Quinn asked their father. The king looked miserable. I should have when Bodhi made his proposal. He looked to Uncle Zoltan. Zoltan felt we should have, but honestly? He stared at his hands and admitted in a rush, We needed the money desperately. This is about money to you? Samson jumped to his feet, anger radiating from every line of his proud face, his dark eyes sparkling with fury. He gripped the gun tightly again, pointing it at the king instead of Bodhi. Alaric instantly stood in front of the king. King Kendrick shook his head sadly and spoke as if his safety wasn't being threatened. I promise this isn't a selfish grab for money. The gold is gone. We used what was left two weeks ago to pay for our final shipments of medicines, vaccines, infant formula, wheelchairs, eyeglasses, hearing aids, and the list could go on. There are many essential things we have no choice but to import, but nobody is going to sell them to us any longer without hard currency. We have three more shipments and then we're done. Insulin only lasts for 28 days. Without it, three children on the island will die. And that is only one of the medicines we must have. Samson stared at Alaric, protecting his father for a few uneasy seconds, and then he sank back down, setting the gun in his lap. Alaric sank back on his chair. I'm sorry it's come to this, King Kendrick said, sounding tired and older than his fifty-five years. He spread his hands. Without some way to make money, our people will suffer. If you have any other solution to help our country, I'd be open to it. I promise you that the money the royal family makes will be used to improve Magna and give our people more opportunity. I also promise you that we will carefully screen the tourists. Alaric and Kingston's men will work night and day to protect both the tourists and the Magnites. The silence was thick as everyone studied Samson. Bodhi didn't know if his former friend would bend. With the story of Samson's mother's attack and his father's death ringing in all their ears, Bodhi didn't know if he'd blame him. Yet could he be so hardened to allow children with diabetes to die without their insulin? Not to mention a hundred other cases where the shipments they could only buy with hard currency were needed? The fate of the kingdom would be decided today, along with fate of Bodhi's heart. Please don't let Julia leave the island, he prayed. Give me time to work this out, and to get to her. Chapter 18 Julia slowly packed her things, savoring each moment in Bodhi's room. She was surrounded by his crisp, clean scent and could almost feel his presence here. Quiet tears ran down her face. Would she see him again? Would he hate her for leaving or be relieved that he didn't have to worry about protecting her from Samson or have her stirring up the dissenters to fight any longer? Was he safe? Had Samson executed him in his anger? Who knew the answers to any of her desperate questions? 
How could she leave without knowing? But she couldn't put her heart above Bodhi's safety and the stability of an entire country. Trek patiently waited outside the sweet door. His dark eyes betrayed how horribly he felt about all of this. They walked quietly down the wide hallway together. She kept hoping one of the royal family would appear and stop her, tell her she should stay, tell her they could see that Bodhi loved her and she should be part of their family. No such luck. They saw no one. The clean, beautiful castle felt cold and empty despite the warm temperatures outside and the large windows open to receive the salty, fresh breeze. She was relieved to walk out the front doors and into the sunshine. Her eyes darted around, hoping for anybody from the family but most of all for Bodhi. Trek probably noticed, but he graciously didn't say anything. He escorted her back to the Humvee. Julia! A female voice shrieked from an upper balcony. Julia turned and shaded her eyes, looking up. It was adorable Belle. She lifted a hand. Hi, sweet girl. I'll... See you later. You stay right there! Belle demanded, and then she disappeared. Julia turned to Trek with raised shoulders, but he was staring longingly at the spot Belle had disappeared from. Julia looked from his enraptured face to the balcony and back again. Trek and Belle? He saw her gaping at him and straightened his shoulders and his face, but he didn't suggest they leave. He simply stood by her side waiting for Belle to appear. Light footsteps pattered through the front hall, and then Belle hurled herself out the door. She gave Trek a warm smile but flung herself against Julia, almost knocking her off her ruined red heels. You're okay! We were all so scared when my friend Allison said she saw Samson take you. I'm okay, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. She pulled back and clasped Julia's hands with both of hers. Did Trek save you? He's amazing! Her cheeks darkened and she looked down at the marble steps. He is, Julia agreed, hiding a smile at their obvious infatuation with each other. But Bodhi saved me. Where are they all? Is Bodhi okay? They're meeting with Samson and his men, Trek interjected. And I need to get Julia to safety. Oh. Belle looked injured by his response. Well, don't let me stand in your way. He gave her a soft smile. It was good to see you, Belle. He hefted Julia's suitcase and put a hand on her back, directing her down the steps. Julia thought she heard a whispered, It's always good to see you, Trek, at their backs. She felt Trek stiffen, but he didn't stop. They loaded up in the Humvee and Julia waved to Belle as they drove away. Does our angelic Belle have a crush on you? She asked Trek, needing to tease and not think about losing Bodhi. Trek's jaw was surprisingly tight. She's far too young for me, my best friend's sister and a princess. It's not worth teasing about. Julia would have teased him more but she felt tired and defeated. She looked through the window, seeing townspeople on the streets, but after the busyness of today, everything felt too quiet. And without Bodhi, everything felt wrong and empty. They made it to the airstrip that wasn't far down the road south of town. Julia kept hoping Bodhi would ride up on his horse and demand she stay with him but she didn't see any vehicles or horses coming from that direction. Hopefully the meeting had turned civil once she left, and Bodhi didn't have that pistol shoved into his neck. She rubbed at her own tender neck, remembering how awful that had felt. She and Trek loaded up in the rattle-trap plane that had brought her to the island. She sighed. Four hours of worrying the plane might go down would have been hard enough, 
but it would be even worse as she ached for Bodhi and what would never be. Before this week, she thought her life was busy and fulfilled. Without Bodhi, nothing would ever be the same. A dreary future stretched in front of her. The plane started and clattered down the runway, gaining speed. Julia's despair grew with each foot they gained. She suddenly saw movement out to the side of the plane, out in the field. A horse raced toward them at an incredible speed. She pressed her face into the glass and cried out, Bodie! Trek cursed. That crazy fool. Bodie and the horse grew closer and her heart lifted happily. He was coming to rescue her. He was truly her knight in shining armor. Except he'd symbolically and literally dumped his armor to protect her. She was ecstatic. But then she realized the plane was gaining speed. Trek! She screamed. Stop! Please! He's here! I've been ordered to take you home, Trek said, clamping his hands so tightly around the handles that the veins in his arms were popping. No! She screamed as the plane lifted off the ground. She squirmed in her seat, trying to see Bodhi. He reined the horse in and stared up at her. She could swear her name was on his lips. Bodhi, no! Please, Trek, please! She grabbed at his shoulder. Please take me back. If Bodhi needs me to go, I'll leave. If it will help Magna, I'll leave, but... Please, at least let me hold him one last time and say goodbye. Please. A few horrible seconds passed. Trek didn't even look like he'd heard her heartfelt pleas. She looked back down at the ground. They were already over the sea and lifting into the air. Bodhi and his horse were receding from sight. The sun caught his horse's armor and glinted sharply as he grew further away. Bodhi! She let out in a sob. Ah, garbage, Trek muttered. The plane banked sharply and they cruised back toward the runway. Yes! Julia cheered, grabbing Trek's arm. Thank you, thank you! Well, don't make us crash, he grumbled. Oh, she laughed, released him, and pressed against the window to see Bodhi better. He had his right fist pumped into the air, clutching the reins with his left and standing up in the stirrups. His handsome face was grinning up at her. Move out of the way, you lovesick fool! Trek hollered at him. Julia's stomach lurched. Would they hit him? Oh no... Bodhi and the horse dashed out of the way and the plane swooped down. It bounced once and then settled. Trek pulled back hard on the brakes. The plane bobbed to a stop, but Julia could hardly stand waiting. Thank you, Trek, she said again, trying to tug the door open but obviously doing something wrong. Can you please open the door? Trek rolled his eyes. I've never disobeyed a command before. Well, breaking my heart would have been worse. You've never felt Kingston's displeasure. The door was yanked open from the outside. Bodhi stood there, looking handsome, tall, irresistible, perfect. His dark eyes swept over her. Julia, he murmured. He had shed his armor when he gave himself up for her. Now he stood in a tunic and pants, looking like a man who had fought battles to reach her. Bodhi! She launched herself out of the plane and into his arms. He easily caught her and held her close for a few blissful seconds before his mouth found hers. The loud plane engine behind them, the horse whinnying not far away, the worries over Samson and Magna's future and a hundred other things disappeared. He kissed her until Trek muttered behind them, I guess you'll take care of her now. Bodhi pulled back and smiled down at her. 
Yes, I'll take care of her, and I'll thump you later for trying to take her away. Julia noticed the plane motor had shut down. When had that happened? Hey, I was just following orders. Trek held up his hands. Which Alaric and Kingston are going to thump me for not following? I don't think they will. We worked everything out with Samson and the dissenters. Everything? Trek and Julia both responded in shock. Well, Bodie held her close, but looked between her and Trek. They weren't happy about it, but they agreed we need the money for Magna. They don't want our people to suffer needlessly. They promised not to kidnap, torture, or torment the tourists, so it's at least a step in the right direction. Even Samson? Julia asked. Bodie nodded, his eyes suddenly serious. He had a past with tourists that my dad and Uncle Zoltan didn't reveal to us. Twenty-nine years ago, while his mom was expecting him. Some tourists attacked her and killed his dad. Julia's jaw dropped, and she felt compassion she never thought she'd feel for Samson. So his mom has raised him alone and nurtured his anger and distrust of outsiders. She guessed, exactly. I had no idea my dad and Zoltan had tried tourism. After how horrifically it ended. I don't think they would have ever approved of our plan if our country didn't need the help so badly. Well, we'd better make sure we do a fabulous job then. She grinned up at him. We will. After you kiss me for another hour or so and promise me you'll never leave me. Julia laughed. Are we that friendly? Definitely. Bodie bent to kiss her. Hey, I'm done watching the romance show," Trek said, but his voice was full of teasing. The fun, happy guy she'd met flying here seemed to be returning. Don't worry about me; I'll get all your bags and meet you back at the castle. He tilted his chin, assuming you can ride a horse in a skirt like that. Don't worry about me," Julia threw back at him. Bodie will hold me, her knight in shining armor, without the armor. Yes, I will. Trek grumbled and carried her suitcase, purse, and pink laptop bag. The purse and pink bag look good on you, Bodie teased. Shut it, Trek growled. He stalked to the Humvee, and within seconds he roared out of there. Bodie gazed down at Julia again. Where were we? She smiled. You were convincing me how friendly we are. That's a great place to be. He lifted her close and kissed her deeply. Julia had never been so friendly before, and she'd never want to be that friendly with anyone but Bodie. Their future wouldn't be easy, but working with Bodie to help his people. And being as friendly as she wanted to be with this incredible prince sounded like a better future than she'd ever imagined for herself. This has been Royal Secrets: The Hidden Kingdom Romances, Book One, written by Cami Checkets, narrated by Andrea Coomer, copyright 2021 by Camille Checkets. Production copyright by Camille Checkets.